we present the BBC Drama Repertory Company in The U-Boat That Lost Its Nerve, a play for radio by James Follett, with Nigel Lambert as Bernard Bant. The U-Boat That Lost Its Nerve. U-boat first officer, Lieutenant Bernard Barrett, you will please stand. <coughs> this Council of Honour has been convened under powers delegated to us by the Naval High Command with the approval of the Fuhrer. We have been instructed to hear all evidence and to recommend sentence should you be found guilty. Have you appointed an officer to conduct your defence? Yes, sir. Major Shulker. Have you agreed to this, Major Shulker? Yes, sir. Lieutenant Bent, the charge against you is that you displayed cowardice in the face of the enemy, and as a consequence of your treacherous behaviour, the submarine U-570, entrusted to you by our Führer and the German people, was allowed to pass intact into the enemy's hands. How do you plead? How do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? The accused wishes to enter I the... want to hear him say it. Not guilty. Should the charges against you be proved, this council will have no alternative but to recommend that you be sentenced to death by hanging. I say this because I want everyone here to realise that our present circumstances in no way detract from the authority of this council or the seriousness of the crimes for which you stand accused. Captain Lehman, will you please proceed? Thank you, Mr. President. On the 27th of August, 1941, the submarine U-570, under the command of the accused... Mr. Was President, it has not been established that Lieutenant Bant was in command of the U-boat at the time of her surrender. He was in command at the time of its capture. It amounts to the same thing. Please continue, Captain Lehman. On the 27th of August, 1941, U-570 was some 200 kilometres south of Iceland and proceeding on the surface to a rendezvous in the North Atlantic where she was to join other boats in her flotilla in night actions against enemy convoys. You will hear how she failed to maintain a proper lookout, but at this point we should consider the attitude of the accused to his responsibilities and to the war in general. Now, this list details certain unauthorised stores which the accused had placed aboard 570 before she sailed. 40 kilos of Dutch Edam cheese, 20 kilos of camembert, several hundred kilos of ham, 100 kilos of Normandy butter, Riesling, brandy, whiskey sherry, and an unspecified quantity of beer. <laughs> Lieutenant Bernard Bernd saw no reason to change his way of life merely because of his responsibilities as an officer. The war for him was going to be one glorious non-stop party. <laughs> Gentlemen, I give a toast the U-570. May this patrol be the most successful of any U-boat. U-570. Bernd has made a stencil of a sinking ship. Oh, yes. As we have 15 torpedoes, let's hope we sail into Lorient with 15 sinking ships painted on our bridge. Here we are, sir. Show them, Bernd. There. <laughs> Only one thing wrong. What's that, Chief? Well, that stencil looks like a 2,000 tonner. If we want to beat Kretschmer's best patrol, every ship we sink will have to be at least 4,000 tonners. Oh. <laughs> it's only meant to be a symbol. Make a bigger one, Ben. We must be precise. Yeah. This one took me two hours, sir. <laughs> oh, maybe for every 4,000 tonner we sink, we could put up two of Lieutenant Burns 2,000 tonners. <laughs> well, that wouldn't be honest. The trouble with you, Ben, is that you take everything too seriously. Someone has to. I aim to sink a hundred thousand tons, Ben. Is that serious enough for you? If you say so, sir. I say we have another drink. Yeah. Back to business. <clears throat> this is superb brandy, you scrounge, Ben. We'll drink to you, to Lieutenant Ben. May he have the strength to bear the Knight's Cross Admiral Durnitz will be hanging around his neck. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Ben. <laughs> hey, where's our torpedo officer? I specifically asked him to be present. Well, oh, Lieutenant Stein is examining the torpedo, sir. He's been at it since we left port. Oh, has he? 
Doesn't he know that messing about with the torpedoes is forbidden? Pass the word for him. Yes, sir. Who do we drink to now? The Fuhrer. Ah, yes. The Fuhrer. The Fuhrer. The Fuhrer. The Fuhrer. What's the matter, Bent? I'm sorry, but uh, I've already had rather a lot to drink. Oh. <laughs> Give him some coffee, someone. <laughs> there you are, Stein, you wretched fella. I hear you've been messing about with our torpedoes. If you can make them go off with a bigger bang, I won't enter it into the log. <laughs> can I have a word with you, please, sir? Have as many as you like, but first a drink. No, I must speak to you first, please, sir, in private. Oh, weren't you warned about those French girls? <laughs> Torpedoing enemy personnel should only be done at sea. <laughs> I won't be any use to you. You need the sick birth attendant. <laughs> You're getting as bad as Bent. No sense of humour. <laughs> oh, all right. We'll go up on the bridge and relieve the cuts. Excuse us, gentlemen. <sighs> Nothing like the sea for clearing one's head. Now, what's all this about? I've been looking at the torpedoes. You've dismantled them? Yep, and I've also dismantled the depth control chambers. You know that's forbidden. How can we sink ships if you've taken the torpedoes to bits? We won't be sinking any ships, not with those torpedoes. Of course we won't if you've taken the things apart. I'll reassemble them, and in any case, I've only looked at eight. Why look at them in the first place? What do you mean about us not sinking ships? Of course we'll sink ships. This first patrol of U-570 is going to make naval history. Well, not after this patrol. All our torpedoes are useless. Don't be absurd. They're all G-7As. There was a whole batch of them which have been sorted out for sending back to the torpedo research establishment at Kiel. Been kicking around some time waiting for shipment, and somehow or other we've ended up with them. You're responsible for striking down torpedoes. You should have supervised their loading. Well, it's no good blaming me. I was only transferred to this boat at the last minute. Yesterday was the first chance I've had to examine. What do you know about torpedoes? All you have to do is load and fire. Now come below and look at them if you don't believe me. You'll have to repair them. They need new firing pistols. I don't want your excuses, Stein. You fix those torpedoes. They have to go back to Kiel. And we might as well return to base. We can't go back. Not My family have moved to Lorient. I've promised them so much. Well, you'll never achieve great successes in this boat. You will go below and repair those torpedoes. After that, you can consider yourself under arrest. Well, why can't you face up to reality? Those torpedoes are useless. Might as well radio base and request permission to return. I'll be damned if I'm going to let a miserable, jumped-up, working-class tyke with a chip on his shoulder dictate to me. Aircraft! It went into that cloud! This far out, it must be a probable 200. Diving stations, aircraft! How dare you give orders! You're under arrest. Ben, cancel that order. It's an FW-200. Oh, for God's sake, dive but into two engines! What the hell am I supposed to do? It's coming in for a bomb run! Get down, get down! Kill us! Stop engines! But we must die! Bent, what damage? Matt, we still got control. I'm sending up a gun. No, no, Bent, no. Look, help me off with my jacket. Come on, hurry! You're mad! Look, before, they, before it turns back, please! Now my shirt. Pull! I'm coming right. up! Stay there, Bent. Pull! That's it. Help me hold it out so I can see it. Oh, you're not going to. You can't! Stop it! Thank God! Thank God. You bastard. You traitorous bastard. What's happening? I thought there was... Ramlo surrender. I had to. I have to think of my crew. Gun crew standing by, sir. Tell them to stand down. You're not taking orders from him, Get are below, you? Stein. Bent. Sir, you have the seats out so they can see it. That's it. They'll destroy us. I think they got your message, sir. I ordered you below. Thank you, sir. I have no wish to be involved. Mario Hudson. The Coastal Command. They nearly killed us. The bomb came within ten metres. What do we do now? It's... Well, it's up to them, isn't it? May I use your glasses, sir? Yeah. It must be a reconnaissance aircraft. It's a machine. No, it's a number of... In the turret. A number of brownies. And bombs. Was it a bomb? Or a depth charge? I don't know. What does it matter? I don't think the RAF have an airborne depth charge yet. They're signalling. It's in English. F. U. Surrender. Tell them yes. Have you considered that you might still have a chance of shooting it down, sir? Our anti aircraft. They could be on top of us with another bomb before we could bring the guns to bear. Uh, What's she saying now? Aircraft to U boat remain on surface or we will bomb you 
Do you understand? Tell them we do, Bent. Control room red. I'm ordering the destruction of all charts, code books, identification books, and the law. Stein, they may not like it. They'll be ejected through a tube. But, but if they see the cats are open... They're we... flooding the forest tanks to put the vibes down slightly. They won't see anything. Bent, go below and place Stein under arrest. He's right about getting rid of the boat's go papers, Go below sir. and arrest him. If anything goes wrong, the whole crew will be lost. I'm resisting arrest, Bernd, and there's nothing you can do about it. The entire company's with me. Also, as first officer, it's your duty to arrest Ramlo and countermand the surrender. I, I can't do that. You have the full support of the crew. But yes, but it would amount to, well, mutiny. So? But I, I don't have the authority. You do, if he's no longer fit to command. Why isn't he? He's only thinking of the crew. There's an aircraft circling, threatening to drop another bomb. Another bomb? Were you in the Narvik campaign? No. I was. Shall I tell you the armament of that Hudson? One anti-submarine bomb. One. And even that's useless unless it scores a direct hit, as we've just seen. Narvik was over a year ago. The RF may have improved the armament since then. But Ramlo may know more than us. He doesn't. But you don't know. You're only going on your experiences of over a year ago. Even if it has got another bomb, we could still shoot it down before it has a chance to drop it. But how? Haven't you got any imagination? We could string up some washing or something and load a belt into the 20 centimetre while the Hudson is unsighted. We could even crowd men around the gun. We could load it, bring it to bear and open fire before the Hudson realised that anything was wrong. If I was in an aircraft, I'd be watching us like hawks, the first sign of anything suspicious. No, you're worse than Ram, though. I don't suppose it's occurred to you that he might be acting in the interests of us all. Our interests are irrelevant. All that matters is that this U-boat must not be cravenly handed over to the enemy without a shot being fired. I shouldn't have thought you'd be worried about honour. I'm not talking about honour. I'm talking about the cowardly behaviour of this submarine in allowing itself to fall into enemy hands who could then use it against our fellow sailors. And if you can't see the difference between that and your blasted sacred honour, then you're as bad as Rob Chief? Yes, sir? Everyone signed? Everyone, sir. Without exception. Here. Thanks. Here's my Luger, then. Take it. Take it. That's it. It's loaded. Now, Chief, read that paper. We, the undersigned crew members of U-570, deplore the action of Lieutenant Commander Ramlow in surrendering our U-boat. And we fully support Lieutenant Bernard Bent in doing whatever is necessary to relieve Lieutenant Commander Ramlow of command. We also swear to obey Lieutenant Bent and pledge him our complete loyalty. And it's followed by the signatures of every member of the company. Thank you. You have a choice, then. You can either go up on the bridge, arrest Ramlo, and take over command, or you can side with Ramlo by placing me under arrest. But if you do, I shall see to it that after the war, you and Ramlo hang. Bent. Sir? Have you arrested Stein? Well? No, sir. I suppose he talked you out of it. Eh? Odd sort of fella. Got a chip on his shoulder about his background. Bit of the red in his makeup. I, I don't know, sir. I'm going to break one of the first rules in dueling. Real dueling, I mean. Not all this modern stuff with face masks. What's that, sir? Never turn your back on an armed man. Wonder how much longer his fuel will hold out. Can't be much left. 200 kilometers south of Iceland, you'll need some to get back. Do you agree with Stein? Do you think I'm a coward? I, I, I don't know. I always I... thought cowardice was something so definite, like murder, that there would be no doubt in my mind when I was actually committing it. And yet when I waved my shirt at that Hudson, it never occurred to me that it was a cowardly act. Wherever we're in harbour and the crew are lined up on deck, it always frightens me to see how many men's lives depend on me. The horrible thing is I, I don't know if I surrendered to save my own skin or the lives of the crew. I suppose if I said I wanted to save their lives, it would sound very grand and noble. But the truth is, I don't know. What would you have done? No, don't answer. You don't know. Nobody knows how they will react to a given situation, but it's always possible to guess how others might behave. People like Stein are predictable. They're the ones who die and get covered in glory. There are a lot of Steins in Germany. They never die alone and always take a lot of poor bastards with them as insurance so they'll be remembered. What are you going to do? 
I, I, I don't know. That's all you've been able to say, I don't know. It's about time you started making a few decisions for yourself instead of letting other people push you around all the time. I was sent up to arrest you, sir. You were sent up here to do your duty according to what you think is right. Stein is not your senior officer. If you think I should be arrested, go ahead, but don't try to cover up your conscience by pretending that you're acting out of duty instilled into you by Stein. I don't even care if you shoot me, but I do care if you shoot me out of a sense of fear. I'd rather die as a victim of your principles than Stein's. Sir, I don't understand. I'll do it myself. Give me the gun. I'll what? shoot myself so you can say you did it. They'll listen to you then. Here, give it to me. No. Come. No. Set up your fool, sir. <laughs> you bloody fool. You could have been killed. <clears throat> oh. Oh. The destroyers are right. Look, look. And... Yes? You've killed him? Say yes. Yes. Good. I'm coming up. Tell him to stay below. Stay where you are, Stein. My dear Bernd, I have a gun crew ready for action. You can come up when I give the order and not before. Good for you, Bernd. Light signals from the destroyer, sir. In English. Uh, stand by to receive armed boarding party. They'll be lucky in this weather. There goes the Hudson. Wonder how they feel having to hand their prize over to the Navy. Sir, now the aircraft has gone. If we were to set our torpedo to run at the shallowest setting, maybe we'd we never could... sink a destroyer, Bent. Not with their shallow draft. You should know that. Well, well, it would be worth a try, sir. Well, what are we going to do now? Wait for the boarding party, I suppose. They won't try that in this sea. Would take us in tow? Not with us on board. Here, here. What are they saying now? Uh... Do you have a dinghy? Captain, to join me immediately, allow no one else on bridge. Do you understand? Why should they risk their necks with a boarding party when they can get me to risk mine? Signal message understood. Why won't they allow anyone else on the bridge? So you won't be tempted to scuttle. Do you want help with the dinghy, sir? No, I'll manage. Bert, I saw the Hudson leave on the sky periscope. I insist you allow me on the bridge. What can you see on the attack periscope? It's jammed. Now we have company, a destroyer, and an armed trawler. Our orders are no one else on the bridge. We have to allow everyone up if we're to scuttle. We are not scuttling, Stein, and that's an order. We are not handing this boat over to the enemy. Chief... Sir? Will you ask that an Stein to stay away from the voice pipe? Sir? Are you managing, sir? Blasted thing. The wind keeps catching it. Here, you'd better have this back. Stein's gun, isn't it? Yes, sir. I'm ready now. Look, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Just be sorry there's a war and thankful you're now out of it. Will you scuttle? I don't see how I can. No. Well, goodbye, Bent. Look after the crew. Goodbye, sir. And good luck. See you in prison. Oh, God. Shulker, Conrad Shulker, Major, Army Reconnaissance. You both? Uh, yes. Oh, never catch me going down in one of those things. Death traps. I'm sorry, just trying to make conversation. You can tell me to shut up if you wish. No, I'm sorry. Lieutenant Bernard Bent. What happened to you? Oh, it's all right. These gun villas don't speak German. Oh, we were bombed by an aircraft. Bad luck. Any casualties? Every member of the crew was saved. How long were you interrogated for? Two days. Oh, I had a week. In London? Yes, Kensington Palace Gardens. 
I used to work in London in the 20s. I didn't tell them, of course, and they soon found out. I didn't even tell them I could speak English. I gave myself away when this officer walked in and said, We've decided to shoot you, Major. <laughs> and he laughed at my expression. <laughs> Where are they taking us? Houston Station? Well, it must be somewhere in the north. And Houston's being moved at night. Why? Plenty of useful information to be picked up just by looking out of the window. The state the crops are in, how many people working on the land. It's all very useful when you're trying to build up an overall picture. Still, of course, you have to escape first. Well, is it worth the risk with the war? It's supposed to last only a few more months. It's always worth the risk. It's your duty to do so. Major Shulker, wake up. It's daylight. Oh. Oh. I'm stiff. I'm still on the move. I'm taking us further north than I thought. The train keep going all through the night. Apart from two stations. How long did we stop for? About 50 minutes at the first one and 10 minutes at the other. What was it called? Bovril, I think. <laughs> What's so funny? You learn that. You learn. <laughs> Beautiful countryside. We keep crossing rivers and streams. Do you suppose we're in Scotland? It's now eight hours. Average speed, what, about 70 kilometres an hour? No, not in Scotland. I'd say we're in Cumberland, somewhere near the Lake District. Ah, now that's either another station coming up, or Journey's End. Uh-oh. Journey's End. Let's hope they feed us soon. I'm starving. Welcome to Grysdale Hall, gentlemen. Right in the heart of the British Lake District, but I'm afraid the British won't allow us to go sailing. My name is Lieutenant Commander Otto Kruger. My job is to make you feel at home. I'm the senior officer. It's a great honour to meet you, sir. It's good to have another U-boat officer. Or perhaps I should say not good. I was beginning to think this camp was being taken over by the Luftwaffe. How is the Admiral? I'm afraid I've never met him. And uh, you're Major Conrad Schulker. Yes, sir. Number one reconnaissance unit, Bremen. I hope you didn't tell the British that. No, sir. They told me. <laughs> I take it the British CO has already interviewed you? Yes, sir. You will find Major Veach firm, but fair. All matters for his attention are channeled through this office. He and I have an understanding. And most difficulties can usually be smoothed out between us. Is there an escape organisation? I was coming to that. As you must have seen from the truck which brought you from the station, the surrounding countryside is wild and desolate. It looks very beautiful now, but in the winter it is deadly. That is why we have an escape committee under my chairmanship, which carefully vets all escape proposals. We don't wish to deter initiative or daring, our job is to prevent officers getting themselves killed because of some harebrained scheme that has no hope in hell of succeeding. Has anyone ever escaped? Several times, but no one has ever got hurt. The first to try was Baron von Vera. The fighter pilot? Yes. He remained free for several days, but only because he knew the district from camping trips before the war and could speak English without a trace of accent. Hmm. This place looks as if it was once a country mansion. It was, but you won't find any suits of armour now. What you will find is plenty of barbed wire around the grounds and watchtowers. Now, that's all for now. I expect it will take you a couple of days to find your feet and get used to the routine. If you report to Paul Falk, third door on the left down the corridor, he'll arrange for you to have a medical and tell you what dormitory you're in. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Lieutenant Ben. Sir? I'd like a word with you before you go. Third door on the left, Shawker. Thank you, sir. Take seat. Thank you, sir. Lieutenant Bernard Bernd, first officer U-570. Bombed by RAF Coastal Command, 27th of August, 90 miles south of Iceland. No casualties. Hmm. The British don't tell us more than they can help. Is that correct? Yes, sir. No casualties? Yes. You were extremely lucky. What became of your commanding officer? Ramlow, wasn't it? He was taken on board a different ship, uh... I don't know what happened to him. I knew him slightly at Lorient. Is he a party member? I, I don't know. Well, he won't come here if he is. This is what the British call a white camp for non-national socialists. Oh, I see. The borderline cases go to the grey camps and the uh, dedicated ones are sent to the black camps. That's why none of our guards oppose. They are all the black camps knocking hell out of the inmates. <laughs> so they're not supposed to know that. I see. I, I read about your capture in the papers... They said you were sunk by overwhelming forces after you'd, you'd fired all your torpedoes. Propaganda. I was rammed at night by a destroyer. 
I've been here since March, five months. The loss of your boat was a sad blow. Do you know the latest tonnage sunk figures? Well, May and June was around 600,000 tonnes. Uh, July was very low, only 100,000 tonnes. What about your boat? Well? Nothing. Nothing? It was our first patrol. <laughs> we'll never win the war at this rate. The papers were saying that the British wouldn't be able to hold out for more than six or seven months at the most. Maybe. Here's your form. You'd better report to Lieutenant Falk. There is one thing, sir. Yes? Is there a Lieutenant Richard Stein here? Stein. Richard. Several Steins, but no Richard. Friend of yours? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, that's all I've been able to pick up from the guards. With luck, they might come with us. Yeah, Otto, over here. Oh, good evening, you two. Good evening. Do you suppose the British are celebrating something? Mm. This stew actually looks and smells edible. <laughs> At least three extra grams of meat. We've decided that your U-boat comrades aren't sinking so many ships these days. <laughs> According to Ben, one of the new arrivals, they're not. Did you give them a medical? Well, Shulker's okay. Ben seems to be suffering from depression. Mm. He's also got a weak heart. You know, it beats me why you let these cripples into the Navy. In the Luffen, <laughs> which this place is crawling with, they have to be A1. Hmm. Anything for tonight's bulletin? Well, it looks as if we'll have to reopen the escape programme. Aren't we going to Canada? Well, it's still only a rumour. But if we are being sent there, it doesn't look as if we'll be able to rely on American neutrality for much longer. An American destroyer has deliberately attacked a U-boat. One incident doesn't necessarily lead to war. It did in 1914. Hmm. Oh, God, if only we could get hold of some British newspapers. When does Parsons come back from leave? Saturday. Was there any mention of U-5-7-0? No. no. So what do we do? Do we reopen the escape program or do we continue squashing every scheme put first? I think we'd better carry on vetoing all plans for the time being and review the situation when we've had a chance to look at the papers. suppose the others will find out about about how you were shot down what are you talking about what others well, kruger falk the whole camp i don't understand i've told them everything no i mean the exact details your position the time that sort of thing do you think they could ever find out well i suppose so does it matter is something wrong Bernard? yes do you want to tell me? No, it's all right. Sorry I woke you. Good night. Good night. Come in. Ah, oh, good morning, Paul. Papers. Ah, excellent. Express time sketch the lot. Even John Bullen picked a post. <laughs> Poor bastard's terrified about that copper wire. Don't put any more pressure on him for a bit. Uh -huh. He's the sort to suddenly decide the confession might be good for his soul. Anything about that Greer business? Uh, yeah. Last night, in a broadcast to the American people, President Roosevelt, referring to U.S. attacks on German U-boats, said, When you see a rattlesnake poised, you don't wait until it strikes before you crush it. Ah, the man's a warmonger of the worst Listen to this. Squadron leader J.H. Thompson of 269 Squadron, the pilot of the Hudson which captured U-570, said the white surrender flag weighing from the Conning Tower was the biggest surprise of his life. What? <clears throat> an admiralty spokesman refused to comment on U-570's future, but said the capture of an intact... Intact? What? U-boat was of major importance, and the possibility of it being commissioned as one of His Majesty's submarines could not be ruled out. Get him in here. What was the exact damage caused by the bomb? I don't know. How close did it fall? Well, I wasn't on the bridge. You don't have to be on the bridge to know how close a bomb was. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. It wasn't me who surrendered, it was Lieutenant Commander Ramlow. Where were you when it fell? In the control room. Look, I didn't surrender. Did you make any water after the explosion? I, I, I 
don't, don't know. Why didn't you die? Well, I... Well, the hy- hydroplane wheels were, were jammed. More of them? No, no, just, just one. Which one? Come on. Look, I don't know. The, the stern, I think. If the bomb exploded forward, how come the stern wheel was jammed? I'm not sure where it exploded. First you say forward, now you're not certain. Well, I wasn't certain at the time. Can you read English? A little. Read that. Go on. Read it. Uh, and Admiralty spokesman refused to comment on you, 570's future, but said the capture of an... Uh, an intact, an intact U-boat. Do you know what the word means? Yes. The telegraph. The Times, the Mirror, they all refer to an intact U-boat. And it's probably in every American newspaper. You, you snivelling little coward, you know what you've done? You've made the German U-boat on the laughing stock of the entire world. It was damaged. There was nothing I could do. We were, we were helpless. Well, I wanted to scuttle. I pleaded with the captain to scuttle. But it wasn't my fault. I, I said we must destroy the boat, but we refused. It was damaged. I know it was damaged. He could be right, Otto. I wouldn't put it past the British to issue a false statement from liberty. <laughs> it's up to you. I'd rather take the word of a German officer than the British press. It was damaged. I know it was damaged. We'll take the word of this. <laughs> oh, so. And so. pull yourself together. Yes, sir. We're giving you the benefit of the doubt. Thank you, sir. We'll tell the camp that the British salvaged your boat. I dare say that'll be nearer the truth than these papers... Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We'll say no more about it. All right, you may go. Just one thing. If these newspaper reports do turn out to be telling the truth, you will most likely be hanged for cowardice. Missing it all. You know, Bern fits my theory about people who have mastered a social musical instrument. What the hell is a social musical instrument? Harmonica, concertinas, flutes, anything portable like that. Have you heard my theory? No, but I have a feeling I'm going to. Is it anything like that theory you advanced three months ago, which explained why the war couldn't last another two months? Bern interests me. He's had a lonely childhood, comes from a well-off family, and was sent to a boarding school from the age of seven. Consequently, he's been starved of affection. He's emotionally insecure, finds it difficult to make friends, and yet he needs friendship. That's why he's mastered the harmonica. It ensures he's always in demand for parties and so forth. That way, his introvert personality is no barrier to his popularity. Is he married? Yes, it was arranged by his parents. Have you been talking to him? Shulka has. The army major arrived with him. Apparently, he's worried about Bernd, says he's been sleeping badly, having nightmares. Maybe you should have a look at him. After what Shulka said, I did. On the pretext it was a routine check after four weeks in prison. He's lost weight. So have we all. Not as much as him. He was 77 kilos when he came. Now he's down to 61. That's a lot to lose in four weeks. Well, whatever his problems are, he's a useful addition to the camp. That's what's so odd about him. He enjoys being popular and yet... People are too complex to fit your simple theories. Ah, here's Paul. Ah. Come on, you're late. We've got a new arrival. Huh? Oh, the British do choose sometimes to wheel them in. Who is it? Not another Luftwaffe type. I don't think I could stand any more. Hey, one of your lot, U-boats. Oh, <laughs> made himself unpopular at his last camp and then he got himself lynched. Huh? Stein. Lieutenant Richard Stein. Right, Paul, let's have him in. There. Yeah. Hello, Bernd. And 
surprised you're not in British uniform. I, I d- 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 didn't expect to see me so soon, of course not. Well, I didn't expect to see you so soon either. I've been busy making a nuisance of myself at every camp so they'd keep transferring me. Third time lucky. You'd better shut the door, Paul. Lieutenant Stein has made some serious allegations, Ben, regarding your part in the loss of U-570. She wasn't lost. She was handed over by this traitorous coward. Oh, we're not interested in personal comments at the moment. We just want to find out if what you say is true. Oh, it's true, all right. Look at him. He's terrified. I... I was not U-570's commanding officer and therefore not responsible for her surrender. According to Lieutenant Stein, you were a party to it. I wasn't even on the bridge when the Hudson dropped its bomb, but Stein was. Is that true? I left the bridge because I wanted to have nothing to do with the surrender. I went below and circulated a petition in which every member of the crew pledged support for Bernd if he were to arrest Ramlo and countermand the surrender. It was a license for mutiny. It was a license to prevent a U-boat falling into enemy hands. It was our opinion that Ramlo was no longer fit to command. Our opinion? My opinion. It's quite clearly stated in battle orders that if a commander... Yes, yes, I know what's in the battle orders. After you shot Ramlo, did you... I never shot Ramlo. He's lying. He paddled across to the destroyer in the inflatable dinghy. Well, you know that. I told you at the time. So Ramlo left you in command? No, sir. No, Ramlo transferred command to the captain of the destroyer, and I carried out the orders the destroyer signaled to me. He's twisting the facts to save his own miserable skin. Bernd was a senior officer. When Ramlo was shot, he would automatically... Ramlo be... was not shot! All right. Bernd, after Ramlo left the U-boat, did Lieutenant Stein request permission to scuttle the boat? Yes, but it was not up to me to grant such permission. You refused? Yes. Because you no longer had the authority? Yes. If you felt that you do not have the authority to allow Stein to scuttle the boat, how is it you felt you had the authority to order him not to? Uh, well, I, I don't know. It, but it wasn't me that surrendered. It wasn't me. All right, you two. You may go. Thank you, sir. I was telling the truth. And the British newspapers. Hmm. It puts me in a difficult position. From what I've seen of Stein, the story will be all over the camp in a matter of hours. If I do nothing, the Luftwaffe and army types will accuse me of favouritism to a fellow U-boat officer. Yeah. They might even take the law into their own hands. Requests Ben's transfer to another camp. And then they'd say I was trying to protect him from justice. Besides, what do you suppose would happen to him if he ended up at a grey or black camp? And the prisoners learned about his part in u 570 surrender. I don't see that they would. Bent's hardly likely to tell them. A U-boat has a crew of 48. After screening, they'd be sufficiently scattered for there to be a good chance of one or two being in any camp that Bent was sent to. Suppose we get rid of him and they do find out. It won't be our problem, will it? You do realise what would happen to him? I've got a pretty good idea. it would be no more than he deserves. He deserves a fair trial. If we were to get rid of Bent, we'd be shirking our responsibilities, just as Bent did on the U-boat. More so, in fact. At least Bant was probably trying to save lives. His own skin, more like. Possibly. But as long as I'm senior officer here, it's up to me to see that civilised standards are maintained. Under these conditions, it's all too easy for men to forget them. Do you think that won't happen? We saw how bitter Stein is. He'll be shooting his mouth off to everyone and urging them on to deal with Bant in their own way. If he were to team up with people like Schumann and Kirk and a few of the others... I know that. We'll have to forestall them until I think of something. Well, how? Why not ask Beach to put Bernd in solitary? Well, what reason do we give? Tell him Bernd's in danger. And admit I can't control the man under me. Anyway, you know what a highly developed sense of justice Beach has. It's one of the more worthwhile British trays. I believe the British may have the answer. Mm-hmm. An old custom of theirs. It's rather nasty, but it might suit our purpose. What's that then? Tell Kurt that before he reads the after-dinner news bulletin, I wish to make a statement to the entire camp. Gentlemen, gentlemen, before Kurt reads the evening news, I have a brief statement to make. Bernd, will you stand up, please? As you know, Lieutenant Bernd is here because his submarine was captured by the RAF after it had been bombed. We have just learned that the newspaper reports about the capture which we disregarded at the time are in fact true. In view of this, it has been decided that from now until further notice, 
No prisoner will speak to, communicate, or attempt to communicate with Lieutenant Bernd in any way whatsoever. A serious view will be taken if anyone breaks this rule. The British have an expression for Bernd's punishment. He is being sent to Coventry. Oh, hello, Paul. Oh, what a, um, you know, Bent seems to have disappeared. Really? I saw him at roll call. Well, he turns up the morning and evening roll call and lights out, but vanishes for the rest of the day. I never did pretend it was anything but an interim solution. The idea was for us to act before anyone else did. Yes, it seems he sent us to Coventry. We'll have to think of something else. I already have. I want to send a message to U-Boat Command. Can you arrange it? But I thought you U-Boat types already had a system. It may have been revealed by Ramlow by now. He handed over a U-boat, so I don't suppose he had any qualms about our letter code. Who is it to be sent to? Dieter Frank. He's a staff officer, cipher expert. Mm -hmm. That's his private address, and that's the message. Okay. Dear Dieter, British press reports about U-570 are correct. First officer is now You're not serious. I'm perfectly serious. But don't you think it's better than what we're doing now? It violates the Geneva Convention. We can't... We just... can if we call it something else. Think you can bury that message in a letter? I think so. I'll try a date code. It may work. It won't have to be anything elaborate to slip past Jenkins. A date code will do. I want it to go today. Right. I'll get to work on a draft letter for you to copy out. <laughs> oh. Someone tell that worm to shut up. I'm going to get some sleep. You say one more word, Stein, and I'll smash your oily face down your throat. Ooh, brave words, Major. Not the sort that Bernd would understand. <laughs> Just leave him alone. You've done enough damage. That is a matter of opinion, Major. Stop, Layman, before we kill him. Look, I'm as worried as you, Major, but what can I do? Kruger won't take any notice of me. Well, you could at least examine Bant. If he is ill, I'd have to say it's because he refuses to eat, not because he's been sent to Coventry. If you do nothing, I'll place the matter in the hands of the British by reporting the whole affair to Major Veach. Where is he? In the attic above the laundry. He spends every day alone there, reading and playing the harmonica. Hmm. I'll tell you what I'll do. Give Bant another two days. If he hasn't come down and had some food by Sunday, then I'll examine him. If his condition is serious, I'll urge Kruger to call off this Coventry business. Hello? Is someone there? No, it was... What do you... What do you want? No, no, please, no. No! 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 Stop! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! No! No! morning that I wait until Evening Sunday. roll calls in five minutes. Now, he's usually down ten minutes before it starts so that he can have his name cleared by the guards and disappear before the others arrive. Well, maybe he's decided to... I want you to come now, please. Very well. Bernard! Roll call in three minutes. Bernard! Bernard! Good God! Help me turn him over. <coughs> What's the matter with... <sighs> Look at his face. No, please, no more. It's all right, Bernard. No more. It's all right, old man. Who did it? Uh, Bernd, can you hear me? Don't hit me anymore. Listen, Bernd, it's only a few minutes to roll call. We've got to get you down to the laundry to clean you up. What the hell does it matter about roll call? I'm going to tell Veach. No. 
No, no, we'll keep the British out of this. If you want to help Bernd, you'll keep quiet. I haven't kept quiet before. This wouldn't have happened. Help me up with him. Uh, that's it. We'll have to hold him between us during roll call. Dear Otto, your recent letter was eagerly read by everyone. Jan has at long last proposed to Alice. Our youngest has seen a great deal of action in our new swimming pool this summer. She has even learned to swim underwater. Paul can't swim yet, but enjoys playing with a toy boat we managed to buy. Only 570 marks. You think goes on about people I've never heard of. Here, you better decode it. Mm. It's so simply hardly deserves to be called a code. First word is your. Three, four, five, six. Propose. Seven, eight, nine. Action. Well, the other word's obvious. Underwater boat, five, seven, oh. Mm. The last sentence doesn't seem to fit. Your old friend in UB-68 sends his regards. UB-68 was the Admiral's boat when he was a commander during the last war. Ah, yes. Well, the complete message reads, Dear Otto, your proposed action of U-570 is approved. You will, hear... you will hear all the evidence while it is still fresh in everyone's mind and recommend suitable sentence to be carried out after war. Preserve transcript if possible, Admiral Donitz. May I see it, please? That's the original letter, and that's the transcribed message. The date and time on the letter indicate... Yes, I know how the date code works. Thank you. Well, I presume there'll also be an inquiry to find out who assaulted Bent. That was a most unfortunate incident which we all deplore. With respect, Lieutenant Commander, that was not the answer to my question. If Bent cares to reveal who it was, then we shall see that whoever it was is punished. You know damn well he's too scared to say anything. It's not our fault if he chooses to remain silent, Major. It could have been any one of several men. We all know who it was. No, we do not know. If you have evidence, then we'll be glad to hear it. Now, on the question of this Council of Honour, Falk, you will be the Council's President. I know nothing about court procedure. Captain Lehman does. He'll brief us. My experience is limited to giving evidence on medical matters for the police. Nevertheless, you know more about it than any of us. I wondered why you were asking me all those questions last week. I've written out four copies of the charges against Bent. One for me... One for you, Paul, as council president. Thanks. Captain Lehman, you will be prosecuting. Thank you. And a copy for you, Shulker. You will be defending. And where shall we hold this charade? We'll use the stage in the main hall and organise a proper lookout system. If the British walk in, we're merely rehearsing a reenactment of a famous German trial for the concert. <laughs> I shall want a large German flag to go on the wall behind the president's chair. And what will you be doing? I shall be an expert witness for the prosecution. Lieutenant Stein, you said that the RAF do not possess an airborne depth charge, that their coastal command aircraft are fitted with one anti-submarine bomb, which, and I quote from your evidence, is useless unless it scores a direct hit. Yes. If Rumlow had died, there would have been little danger. Did you see this bomb fall? No. Really? Why not? I ducked. It's customary when a bomb falls. It helps you live longer. <laughs> Did Ramlow duck? No. So you don't know if the Hudson dropped a small bomb or a more lethal depth charge? I've already told you. The RAF do not have an airborne depth charge. Well, I shall be producing a witness who will testify that they do. A new arrival. His U-boat was depth charged by a Sunderland. So, you ducked while Ramlow bravely watched the Hudson all the time? He did not watch it out of bravery. He was hypnotised with fear. How did he surrender? He waved his shirt. Did he have a jacket on? Yes. Which he had to remove first before he could take his shirt off? Yes. Now, did he wave the shirt after the Hudson released the depth charge? Yes. Immediately after? Uh, before the Hudson had time to turn? Yes. Oh, he was quick. He tore his jacket and shirt off in panic. But just now, you said he was hypnotised with fear. Did you help him off with his jacket? Well? You must answer the question. Yes. Well, he, he asked me to, but I didn't know why he wanted it off at the time. Did you also help him remove his shirt? Yes, but I didn't know why he wanted it off. No, of course not. It was late summer, and I suppose the Hudson was making it rather hot for you. 
Major Shulker is including a great deal of unnecessary comment, Mr. President. No more than we've had from Captain Lehman. That is not true. I have it. no more questions. Thank you. Do you wish to re-examine, Captain Lehman? Sir. When you went below after the surrender, Lieutenant Stein, you said you posted a signalman on the sky periscope to watch the Hudson. Yes. Can you remember the exact wording of the Hudson signals? Yes. The first one said, have you surrendered? And the second one was, remain on surface or we will bomb you. It definitely said bomb, not depth charge. Yes. It was bluffing, of course. It only carried the one bomb. There is no doubt about the action I would have taken. As soon as the aircraft appeared, I would have given the order to dive and continued diving despite the air attack. My chance of escaping would be very good if there were no anti-submarine ships less than 12 hours steaming away. If the bomb had damaged me, I would have surfaced and fought it out with the aircraft. My anti-aircraft gun crews were well trained and there would be a good chance of destroying the Hudson. Were you ever attacked by aircraft when you were in command of a U-boat? Mr. President, I've failed to see what Lieutenant Commander Kruger's experiences have got to do with this case. I merely wish to establish that his experience qualifies him to speak with authority on the correct course of action U-570 should have taken when it was attacked. Would the first officer of a U-boat be justified in assuming command if his commanding officer had surrendered when still capable of fighting and possibly escaping. Yes. Excuse my ignorance of court procedure, but is the prosecution allowed to put leading questions to his own witness? Mm, that is true. Uh, Major Shulker is quite correct, unless the questions deal with a complex matter. I'm sure he would be the first to agree that this is indeed a complex matter. Mm. Continue, Captain Newman. And if the commander is faced with overwhelming odds... Then he must scuttle his boat. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander. <clears throat> Major Shulker. Hey, commander Kruger, before you would scuttle your boat, you would give the order to abandon ship? Of course. Now, supposing you were under the guns of an armed trawler and a destroyer which had ordered you to allow no one from below, would you still scuttle your boat? I would never allow myself to get into such a situation in the first place. You've never been unfortunate enough to find yourself in such a situation. It's not a question of being unfortunate. It's a question of skill and courage. But you've never been in such a situation. No, when I was... Uh, Mr. President, Lieutenant Commander Kruger has been allowed to give evidence for the prosecution because of his experience in U-boat matters. We now learn, on his own admission that he has no experience of the circumstances under examination. Therefore, it is my submission that his evidence is invalid. Are you familiar with Lieutenant Commander Kruger's record? 260,000 tons of enemy shipping sunk. He holds numerous decorations, including the Knight's Cross with oak leaves. I suggest you apologize. Why should I apologize for making what I consider to be a valid point? In that case, the Council will apologize on your behalf. You should remember, Major Shulker, that none of us has experience of surrendering to the enemy without a fight. Only Bernard Bert can speak with authority on that subject. Why didn't you relieve Ramlow of command? Well, it, it would be mutiny. You went to training college? Yes. Weren't you taught the difference between mutiny and the justified relieving of command? Yes. Tell the council those differences. I, I, I don't remember the exact wording. Um, Mutiny is the refusal by an individual or, or group uh, to obey the lawful commands of their senior officers. Um, justified... Justified relieving of command is when the senior officer has demonstrated, either by his action or inaction, that he is no longer mentally or physically capable of issuing lawful orders. Is that right? Yes. Immediately after the attack by the Hudson, you joined Ramlow on the bridge. You said in your statement, and I quote... Ramlow appeared to be in a state of shock. He said, they'll kill us, they'll kill us. Is that correct? Yes. Your own words, a state of shock. Why didn't you take command there and then? I don't know. Didn't Lieutenant Stein suggest you take command? Well, yes, but I, I, I didn't trust him. Didn't he promise you his full support of that of the crew if you did? Yes. Didn't he assure you of his complete loyalty to you? Yes. And still you refused to act. Why didn't you do so after Ramlow abandoned the U-boat? Surely you realised there was no question of mutiny then? Well, I, I, I thought the commanding officer, the British destroyer, was technically in command of the U-boat, 
as we have already surrendered. You worried about legal niceties when there was a danger of your boat falling into enemy hands? Yes. Why didn't you tell the crew to abandon ship so you could follow battle orders? Well, I, I was concerned for their safety. And the destroyer had threatened to open fire if anybody appeared from, from below. Did it occur to you that the British wanted to stop you scuttling? Well, I thought perhaps they were worried in, in case we tried to use the gun. In, in, in the heat of the moment, I felt that the lives of the crew were more important than the, the capture of the boat. Surely you realised that the secrets revealed to the enemy through the capture of your boat could well lead to the deaths of countless sailors in the future? I, I didn't think... You didn't think... You didn't think that the presenting the enemy with a complete U-boat, with its equipment and weapons intact, could endanger the entire U-boat offensive? You valued your life and the lives of your crew above the lives of crews yet to sail? Yes. Speak up! Yes. Oh, Tommy, is quiet, everyone. <clears throat> yes, that's fine, Willie. But I want you to put more pressure on. Remember, this is the bit where you breach the main part of your cross-examination. It must be much harder. Surely you realise. Do you admit? Bernard, you're just right. You're looking frightened because you know you're guilty. We'll just do that bit again. Take it from... All right, Willie, carry on. <coughs> Lieutenant Bent, do you understand what your last reply means? Yes. Would you like to reconsider your answer? I don't care what happens to me. I just want all this finished. Do you admit to being a coward? Yes. Yes. It's always been the same. At school, I was frightened of the wall bars. I can't help myself. Everybody said it, it didn't matter if you were scared. It would all disappear, they said. You'd be too busy to be scared, and, and I believed them. I believed my father. Fight for the fatherland, he said. And, I had nothing to go on. I had no means of judging myself. I was scared the first time I was on a boat when it dived, and I've been scared ever since. I didn't want to die. And now I don't want to live. My own definition of a coward is someone who has the courage to show he's not a hero. <clears throat> Lieutenant Bernard Berndt, you will please stand. You have been found guilty of failing to scuttle your U-boat to prevent its falling into enemy hands and guilty of displaying cowardice in the face of the enemy. Lieutenant Stein, who through no fault of his own, will have to live with the stigma of being associated with the most cowardly act in the history of the German Navy, has expressed a desire to read out the recommended sentence of this council. Lieutenant Stein. Thank you, Mr. President. Bernard Belt, the recommended sentence of the council is that you be executed. Supposing he wants to appeal. That's a matter for the Naval High Command. Our instructions were to hear the evidence and recommend sentence. Do you think we went too far? No. Do you think our sentence will be upheld? I don't see why not. Look, is something worrying you? I can't help thinking that what we did was wrong. I mean, to sit in judgment on a man is bad enough, but to destroy him as well in front of him... Listen, I'm a submariner. Just one of thousands. It's a filthy, dirty job. You're stuck in a tiny, almost defenceless craft for days, weeks, months at a time. You learn to live with the permanent smell of urine and vomit. You sleep in soaking wet clothes, not just when the weather's bad, but all the time, because everything you touch is dripping with condensation. When you're on the surface, you can't allow more than a few men at a time into the fresh air, because you've less than three minutes to dive if an aircraft is spotted. I had nearly 50 submariners under me, and not one of them ever complained. They are the men, and the hundreds of youngsters training in the Baltic, whose lives have been threatened by one cowardly officer who cared so much for his own skin he preferred to hand the British an intact U-boat. Baird may have forgotten them, but I never shall. Yes. We know how you feel, Otto, but what will the British learn from U-570? Its exact length, 
how quickly it can dive, how long it can remain submerged. Will it tell them anything they don't know already? The Type 7C is the most advanced U-boat in the world. It can dive to over 200 metres. Yes, that's what you told the Council, but is it? Yes, of course. I've learnt one or two surprising things about British submarines from some of your fellow U-boat officers here. What is the maximum surface speed of a 7C? 18 knots, but I don't see... In the last war, the British K-class submarines could do 24 knots. Well, they were steam-driven freaks. But nearly all the evidence you gave to the Council was based on the superiority of the German U-boat. Do you think I would list its faults in front of the army and the Luftwaffe? In any case, Schulke could have found out what you found out. He made the mistake of attacking you. Bernd's defence was a shambles. Maybe it was, but that makes no difference to what Bernd did. It might make a difference when the High Command review the evidence. They might decide that Bent's case was mishandled. I think we should reconsider the sentence. Are you siding with Bent? Of course not. I don't want to see him get away with what he did. I'm just saying we should reconsider... Uh, yes? May I? Well, come in, Lehman. Do you believe in Providence? <laughs> not since I've been here. Why? The guard, Parsons, has been boasting again. On his last 24-hour leave, he took his girlfriend to Barrow for the day... They went on a boat trip to view the captured German submarine. U-570? The same. She's just been brought back from Iceland by Lieutenant George Colvin. She's been renamed Graf. Now, I've managed to scrounge a map. Ah. She's lying at the submarine works in this narrow channel here. She's to be refitted. How far is Barrow from here? Less than 30 kilometres. Mm. Now do you see why I asked if you believed in Providence? Gentlemen... I think it's time we reconvened the escape committee. The plan is for someone to break out and sabotage U-570 at her moorings. The exact details have yet to be worked out, but are we all agreed in principle that it should be done? Yes, yes indeed. Good. I've considered the various methods which could be used to destroy a submarine. The easiest would be to open the main vents and sea valves. How much damage would a hand grenade do if it exploded inside a U-boat? One hand grenade wouldn't do much structural harm. How about four exploding simultaneously? If the watertight doors were shut, they could possibly blow it in half. Good. You uh, have an idea? Oh, yes. And I have some hand grenades. Hmm? Five of them. Unfortunately, I don't have an alarm clock. Lemon, what are you talking about? Hand grenades. These things. They're British, of course. No throwing handle, which means they'd make a smaller packet, but just as big a bang. Where on earth did you get these? From the armory. A prisoner the British trust has been stealing from it regularly. Another prisoner they don't trust then returns whatever has been taken in exchange for tobacco. They keep replacing the locks, but he's sawn through the hinge pins. All he has to do is lift the door and it drops off. Doesn't matter how many locks they fit. How long has he been doing this? Some weeks now. He's kept quiet about it because he thought he was onto a good thing. I didn't know about it until he came to me with these. He feels he's bitten off a little too much. He wasn't sure whether to return them or use them as a lever. Well, you're responsible for men in your section. It's up to you to know what they're doing. You must admit it does have its funny side. <laughs> All we need is an alarm clock. Why? As you can see, they're nothing like our stick grenades. They don't have a friction igniter. This lever is spring-loaded and it's held against the grenade body by this pin. Mm -hmm. Now, to use the grenade, the pin is pulled out and the lever is held in place by the hand. Once the grenade is thrown, the lever flies up and starts an eight-second fuse. So, we take four of the grenades, remove the pins and pack them into a small box crammed with plenty of clay to hold the levers in place. Mm -hmm. Now, the fifth grenade is also packed into the box, but with its pin in place which is attached by a piece of string to the alarm key on the back of the clock. When the alarm goes off, the key turns, winds the string around its spindle and pulls the pin out of the fifth grenade. Mm. It explodes, shatters the clay around the other grenades, which all explode together eight seconds later. Well, it seems we have a bomb. All we need is a volunteer to plant it and a method of getting him out. There is one person who ought to be given the chance to volunteer first. You've got to do it. Kruger hasn't made any promises, but I'm certain he'll allow an appeal if you agree. I couldn't do it, Conrad. I'd do something wrong, I know I would. Are you scared? No. Yes. I'd be terrified. Do you want to be hanged for cowardice? No, but supposing something went wrong. Well, supposing I was caught. The British would shoot me anyway. Listen, I'm reaching the point where I don't care what happens to you. 
I've done my best for you, and I'm damned if I'll do any more. I never did think of you as a coward, but I will if you refuse to do this. I'm sorry, Conrad. I, I've caused you a lot of trouble. It's nothing to the trouble I'll cause you if you don't agree to this. Well? Yes. I'll do it. Looks as though Shulker is having trouble with Bent. Mm. Would you consider an appeal if he agrees? We'll have to see if he agrees first. The immediate problem is how we're going to get whoever does it out of here. Hoffman's made some excellent wire cutters out of two leaf springs. Something seems to be interesting, Layman. Hmm? Where? Over there, by that watchtower. Layman! If we do reopen the official escape program, I'm taking Layman's name off the list. He's much too useful to us in here. Mm. That bomb is a brilliant piece of improvisation. I think I have it. Have what? The answer to the escape problem. I'll show you. Let's stroll casually over to the West Tower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, it will only work on a fine afternoon like this. Of course. Now, watch the guards in the East Tower as we near the West Tower. No, no, don't do it too obviously. Watch them out of the corner of your eye. Yes, one of them is shading his eyes with his hand. Now the other one's doing the same. Now, if we stand in the shadow of this tower, like this, you see? I believe you've got something. The men in the tower above can't see us because we're virtually underneath mm. them. And the guards over there can't see us because they're looking straight into the sun. Mm. They know we are here, but only because they saw us walk over. Yes, but you're not suggesting a daylight break, surely. The escaper will be seen long before he reached the trees. Of course not. What's always been against cutting the wire at night? That 30-second interval between each searchlight sweep is too short to cut the wire and make for the trees. But if the wire is already cut... Yes, of course. 30 seconds should be plenty of time. How long will it be before all the papers are ready? Another two weeks. Well, then, if we have choir practice out here every fine afternoon mm -hmm. to get the British used to the idea, we'd be able to cut the wire on the first sunny afternoon when everything is ready and the escaper could make his break that night. Yeah. Yeah. The British are not likely to notice a few cut strands of barbed wire right under the watchtower, especially as there'll only be a few hours of daylight between cutting the wire and the breakout. It's a 30-kilometer walk to Barrow, which you should do easily in six hours. The first few kilometers across country will be the worst, but if you stick to the compass route, you'll reach the road after one hour. Your papers are nearly ready. You're a Dutch seaman returning to Barrow after some shore leave. You'll have a paybook, identity card, travel warrants, used Liverpool bus tickets, and some letters from an English girlfriend. And this is the bomb. We'll be sealing it in a piece of inner tube, but before we do, I want you to go over the priming procedure. Uh, once aboard the U-boat, I cut open the wrapper and remove the box. Uh, I open the lid and wind up the mainspring. Uh, this key here. That's it. The one without the string attached. Mm -hmm. Five turns should be sufficient. The alarm key, which will pull the pin out of the hand grenade, is already wound, but it won't operate until the main spring is wound. Yes. The clock hands are set at three minutes to four, and it will go off at four o'clock. We've removed the bell. If you jump into the water immediately, you've placed the bomb in position, you should be all right. I make sure the clock is ticking, and then I replace the lid and position the box in the forward battery compartment against the pressure hull. Excellent. Um, supposing someone's aboard the boat? Then you place the box under a grating on the outside. It won't do so much damage, so try and place it below if possible. You'd better have this just in case of trouble. It looks quite realistic at a glance. Don't pull the trigger. It's liable to break off. Right. Unfortunately, we know nothing about the security and layout of the submarine works. All we've got is this rough sketch map. The boat is moored in this narrow channel here. We suggest you enter the water at this quay here alongside the road. That means you'll have a 400-metre swim. Think you can manage that? Yes. We're making your kit bag fairly buoyant, so you'll be able to rest now and then. These are the wire cutters. You'll be cutting the wire in daylight, so... In daylight? Don't worry. We've worked everything out. Try a practice cut on this piece of wire. Right. <coughs> Good. Yes. Any questions? Will there be a moon on the night? We're not even certain what night it will be. We hope it will be early next week, in which case there won't. You'll be cutting the wire on the first sunny afternoon and breaking out the same evening. OK, Bent. Now.
It must be Parsons on that searchlight. It always sweeps slower than anyone else. Yeah, rub this boot polish on your face, Bernard. It smells a bit, but you can wipe it off once you're through the wire. Thank you. Last foot patrol just finishing their circuit round the wire. Remember, when you reach the ground, hold onto the sheets until you feel two hard pulls. Yes. You then run behind the searchlight beam, keeping it a few metres in front of you. Don't get too close in case it stops. I understand. You've got everything? Yes. All right, onto the windowsill. <laughs> hold it. Yes. Right. Down you go. Oh, we might as well turn in now. He's had two hours, so he should be well clear of the camp by now. I forgot to wish him good luck. Yes, we all forgot. You know, there's something I wanted to ask, but Bernard stopped me. What happens to him after he blows up the U-boat? He's got 25 pounds and a merchant seaman's paybook. If he can get to Liverpool, he should be able to make it to Ireland. But he'll be missed at morning roll call. Do you really think he stands a chance? No, but he does stand a chance of blowing up the U-boat. And that's all that matters. What the hell's going on? Major Veach is calling one of his snap searches tonight. All night. What are they doing? A bed count? The works. The guards are turning out every dormitory. You'll have to get someone into Ben's room to double up. Not a chance. They're sealing all the corridors. Hmm? What the? Well, it was the best I could do. I ordered the men to fight among themselves if there should be a check. It may delay them a bit. Oh, well, there's nothing we can do. We'd better go to bed. That's all we need. Roll call in this weather, too. I'm not taking orders from him, are you? Help me tie the shirt to the periscope. I would never allow myself to get into such a position in the first place. Why didn't you relieve Ramlow of command? He's twisting the facts to save his own miserable skin. You value the lives of your crew above the lives of crews yet to sail? Yes. No. Do you admit to being a coward? No, no, no. The recommended sentence of the council is that you be executed. <laughs> A minute. Well, what's the matter, lad? Well, look, they're down there in that field, all Jim sheep. Whenever there's bad weather, they always crowd round that old shepherd shelter. Well, look at them. It's as if they're keeping clear of it. Oh, someone's frightened them, I reckon. Under scared them, stupid creatures, sheep. Oh, no, they aren't. There's only people that think them stupid. Um, better take a look, then. Okay. Get in soap just to look at sheep. You best bring that rifle. Hey. Hey, supposing it's the Nazi in there. He wouldn't come this way. He'd head out to Windermere to get the train. Especially on a night like this. It's a tramp, more like. Well, what do we do? I'll go around the back and you go in through the door. Right. I'll catch him if he tries to escape. Oh, but, but Captain... Cover him with a rifle. Well, you, you know about their eyes. My uncle says they, they can hypnotise you. Rubbish. All right, we know you're in there. Come on out with your hands up. Maybe you don't understand English. Well, fire a shot in the air, he'll understand that. It'll frighten the sheep. I'll frighten you in a minute. Do as I say. Ah. 
this girl, Captain? Shall I go and get help? Come out with your hands above your head. Don't try anything. Please, don't shoot. Come on, out you come. Well, well, well. What have we here? He doesn't look like a Nazi. That's near enough. Turn round. Shoot him if he tries anything, Corporal. Uh, I'm, I'm not armed. Oh, well, just making sure. Now, who are you? I, I'm a Dutch seaman. I was on my way to Barrow when the storm started, so I hid in the hut. Hid? I, I hid from the storm. My English is not good. Have you got any papers? Yes. Here, my my, my pay book and, and my identity card. Uh, there. Uh, okay. They look all right. Hey, we can't be too careful. You better put them away before they get soaked. Thank you. I thought you merchant seamen always carried a kit bag. It's in the hut. I did not want to get it wet. <laughs> yeah, it's a filthy night to be out. Would you like a lift? No. No, thank you. You are very kind, but I, I must get to Barrow. Got the ship waiting for you? Yes. You won't make it tonight. The last bus is gone. Why don't you come with us? We've got to report to Grisdale Hall. You could telephone from there. They'd probably fix you up for the night. No, no, thank you. I'll be all right here. I'm used to being out in rough weather. Don't be silly. You come along with us. Nobody's going to say we didn't look after a seaman. Besides, hear those dogs? They're out looking for an escaped prisoner. It could be dangerous. I I'll be all right. Well, our truck's just over here. Hey, come back. It must be that jelly after all. Halt! Oh, Always shoot! Put one over his head, Corporal. He's not stopping, Captain. One in the legs. Wing him. He's dead. It could be someone poaching. No, it was a rifle, not a shotgun. That means home guard. Well, you know what they are. No. No, I don't know what they are. Why don't you tell me, hmm? Perhaps they're like Layman here. Now, he's a medical man. Did you take the oath, Lehman? Did it allow you to sit back and say nothing while a man was being destroyed? And Stein, with all his fine talk of courage and duty, how much courage did he need to burst in on a lonely man and to beat him senseless? And you, they all listen to you because you hold the Knight's Cross and oak leaves. When it comes to defining courage or the authority, you and your comrades in the U-boat service, brave men, all of them, not a bit like Bert. After all, it wasn't Bert who crept up on the Athena and all those children. All right, Shulker, you've said enough. We know how you feel about Bernd, but we don't know if he's come to any harm, and there's nothing any of us can do now. We'll know what's happened in the morning. Where is Otto? He'll be too late for breakfast. It's most inconsiderate of him to disappear like this when the whole camp's buzzing with rumours. All I know is that the Commandant sent for him at seven this morning. Any news of Bernd? Oh, it's no good asking me, I know as much as you. Someone even asked me if it was true that Bernd had blown up the Queen Mary. I don't think he's come to any harm. Bernd's not the type to resist. Well, we'll just have to wait and see. Good morning. Ah, oh, about time. As you must all know by now, one of our comrades escaped last night. What you may not know is that he escaped so that he could destroy our submarine, U-570, which has fallen into enemy hands. I have a statement issued to me this morning by Major Veach. It is with deep regret that I have to inform you that your comrade and fellow officer, Lieutenant Bernard Bernd, was killed last night whilst evading arrest. Mm. Lieutenant Bernd broke away after being detained by a home guard unit. He was ordered to halt several times but took no notice. A shot was fired over his head but he kept running. The home guard were forced to shoot with the intention of wounding him. Unfortunately, the shot went high and hit Bernd between the shoulders. He died before the doctor arrived. The Commandant said the escape was a gallant attempt by a brave officer. He deeply regrets that it should end so tragically, and he has agreed that Bernd should have a funeral with full military honours. He has also agreed that we may provide a guard of honour and pallbearers. The funeral will take place at the village of Hawkshead. <clears throat> Those of you who wish to attend will be placed on parole and issued with British Navy greatcoats. It is most important that the villagers do not suspect that the funeral is that of a German naval officer. For that reason, the coffin will be covered with the British flag, but under that will be the German Navy battle ensign.
Lord God, with whose mercy the souls of the faithful find rest, bless your servant, Bernard Ben, and place this grave under the care of thy holy angel, and loose from the bonds of sin the souls of What are you going to say? I don't know. That united with thy Surely faith, you've prepared something. Look, thee, Beach is pulling the Union Jack off the copy. Shh. Amen. Amen. Of, the, of the captured German submarine made by the BBC during the war. The reconvening of the Council of Honour never in fact took place because British intelligence informed the authorities of what was afoot and all the German officers concerned were transferred to Canada where they were split up until the end of the war. Columbia Broadcasting System presents Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Oriental West, Cargo Bonding Company, San Francisco. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of delayed cargo aboard the SS Shanghai Wayfarer, or the case of the slow boat from China. <laughs> Expense account, item one, $181.52. Plane fare from Hartford to San Francisco in answer to your urgent call. Expense account, item two, $3. Lunch on Fisherman's Wharf in answer to my stomach's urgent call. Item three, $1.20. Cab fare to your office. Dollar, my name is Fundy. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you before. And may I say it's a pleasure meeting you. It's a rough trip. I'm glad it's over. Over? Oh, it's just begun. Here, Dollar. This is your plane ticket to Singapore. Singapore? Hmm? You know, Fundy, I had a choice. Really? To come to San Francisco to see you or to take a case in Boston. A nice old lady on Beacon Hill clubbed her husband with an early American bed warmer. But no, rather than New England broiled lobster, I'd rather have San Francisco cracked crab. Now, all of a sudden, Singapore. May I ask why? Uh, yes. We've bonded against a delay, a $120,000 cargo of raw tin aboard the Shanghai Wayfarer. The ship was due to sail from Singapore three weeks ago. Still out there, tied up in the Tanjong Pagar dock. What's the delay? Mutinous, mechanical, or just plain mysterious? <laughs> I'm afraid it's little of each. We flew an expediter out there ten days ago to see what he could do. All the satisfaction we've had from this man Harrison is a report that since his arrival, the wayfarer's main shaft has burned out, her freshwater pumps have fouled up, and her steering machinery has gone on the fritz. You don't need an insurance investigator. You need a good plumber. <laughs> Well, maybe you're right. But anyhow, you'll find our man Harrison, William Harrison, at the Crown Colony Hotel. He'll fill in the details. Dollar, you have only a matter of hours after you hit Singapore to get the Shanghai Wayfarer started on its way. I, uh, I must impress upon you the fact that any delay after that will cost this company $2,500 a day. Well, all I can promise is the old college try. Times like this, I wish I'd gone to college. Well, anyway, I'm in the right town to make my last night in the States a good one. A few drinks with the right gal at the top of the mark. A few rare steaks at Alfred's. A few dances to Freddie Martin's music at the St. Francis. A few moments alone in the arms... A dollar. Huh? That sounds mighty good. But your plane leaves in two hours. Two hours? Well, I guess I'll have to do without the drinks, the dinner, and the dancing. Expense account item four, 
lost in the course of teaching fellow passenger how to play poker. My mother warned me not to, never to play cards with strangers on trains or steamships. I wish she'd included airplanes. You'd implied, Fundy, that the situation smelled. Well, you should have caught a whiff of the city, especially the native sections, through which I had to pass on my way to the Crown Colony Hotel. I found it on Anson Road. I found myself a room. I also found William Harrison's room. Harrison? Hey, Harrison. But I didn't find Harrison. All I found was a calling card from my old friend, Trouble. Wherever Harrison was, he didn't want to be. And he left a trail of broken furniture and blood to prove it. I searched the dresser. Shirt size, 14. Socks, 9. That meant Harrison was a small man. I went through the bathroom, shaving brush and toothbrush, still wet, indicating that he'd been there not too many hours before I arrived. Then I tried the wastebasket. In addition to one large glob of used chewing gum, an empty cigarette package, and some old Kleenex, I found a swizzle stick with a name on it. The Collier Key Bar. Well, all that meant was that Harrison had a head cold and had been trying to cure it with Singapore slings. But at least I knew where he'd been drinking them. The Collier Key Bar looked out on the harbor. It was dark enough inside to give a man a good excuse for drinking nightcaps at noon. Your pleasure, sir. Say, uh, how are you on mixed drinks? Mixed drinks? Governor, if I don't know how to make them, I look them up in the book. If they ain't in the book, I fake them. Now, what'll it be? <laughs> Straight bourbon. Right, yours, sir. Oh, hey, uh, bartender. Yes, sir. Are you by any chance acquainted with an American named Harrison? Harrison, sir? Yeah. He arrived in Singapore about ten days ago. Small man with a cold in his head. Oh, Harrison. Sure, I know him right mm -hmm. enough. He's been coming in every night with a chief engineer from one of the ships in port. Oh, yeah? What ship is that? Well, the Shanghai Wayfarer, I think. Oh, the Shanghai Wayfarer. What's this engineer's name? Yeah, now, hold on. I, I ain't getting him into any trouble, am I? He's a nice chap, he is. A handsome tipper. This handsome? My governor, 20 American dollars. Why, compared to you, sir, Mr... Frank Moore is downright tight-fisted. Well, now, about that, I, I done it. I let Mr. Frank Moore's name slip right now. My missus is right. For a little man, I've got a ruddy large mouth. Expense account, item five. Rickshaw fare to the Tanjong Pagar docks, ten cents. Tip to Pony Boy, one dollar. The ships moored fore and aft of the Shanghai Wayfarer were busy stuffing the pungent treasures of the East into their deep steel pockets. And the only sign of life aboard the Shanghai Wayfarer was the right hand of the burly gangway watch. It was holding a knife with a six-inch blade and slicing thin slivers off a plug that looked more like tar than tobacco. As a gangway watch, he might have been fine. But as a reception committee, he was no Elsa Maxwell. That's far enough, mate. There's nobody aboard and there's nobody coming aboard. It's all right with me. All I want is a little information. Where can I find your chief engineer, Frank Moore? You come to the wrong place. Try the icebox over at the Singapore police. They fished him out of the harbor this morning, stabbed to death. Oh? Have uh, you any idea who did it? They're holding some dame he's been playing around with. No, I don't know her name. Have they got anything else? Listen, mate, my job is to guard the ship, not answer questions. Okay, okay, have it your way. A watch out for pirates. The British chief inspector, Singapore police, gave me everything except an invitation to tea. But unfortunately, he'd never even heard of Harrison. He took me into the morgue, and a look at Frank Moore's body told me nothing I didn't already know. He'd been stabbed, all right. And whoever had killed him had sunk him with a hole in one. As for his personal effects, his maritime union card confirmed the fact that he was indeed the chief engineer of the Shanghai Wayfarer. A stack of crisp American $20 bills in his wallet made me wonder whether he hadn't been picking up a little extra pin money for delaying the departure of his ship. And finally, a photograph that made me admire the late Mr. Moore's taste in women. Whoever it was that said, never the twain shall meet, should have met her. 
She was half caste and all woman. Her picture was inscribed to Frank Moore. Yours forever, Chandra. From the inspector, I learned two more things. One, the fact that the police had already questioned and released her. And two, her business address, the Wardlow Bar on Melee Street. Hello, Mr. Young. You like a midnight sing song, girl? No. The only girl I want to hear sing songs is Dinah Shaw. Go on, beat it, will you? Oh, hey, wait a minute. Yes, do what? Uh, where's Chandra? Oh, she go across to Penang tonight. You buy me drink, mister? We sit right over... Ramonja! The gunner! Get it! Oh, Ramonja, hello! I push you away home to Shanghai one night huh? in your own coffee. Complete with stab wounds, no doubt. Why you say that? Why you ask for Chandra? I'm a stranger in town. I can't find the local chapter of the Lonely Hearts Club. So, shall we find a quiet table? I don't know you. No, but you knew Frank Moore. That gives us something in common. Over there is one. Okay. <laughs> this doesn't sound like a very quiet table to me. In Singapore, you will learn whispers stand out in the quiet. They disappear in the noise. I'll bow to the wisdom of the native guide. But uh, who said I had any secrets? You talk about Frank Moore, so I know if you do not have secrets to give, there must be secrets you like to learn. But I tell the police everything I know, which is nothing. Oh. No, you are disappointed in me. No, no, not at all. You make good scenery. And I'll bet there's quite a story that goes with you. Oh, you find me interesting. I'm a man. Why do you come to me? Well, there were two places I could go for what I'm after. And you're much prettier than the SS Shanghai Wayfarer. I'm looking for a lead on a man named Harris. Your murdered friend Frank Moore knew him, so figures you know him. You are wrong. I do not know him. I do not even know you. Oh, well, that's soon fixed. My name is Johnny Dollar. Your name is nice. Especially the uh, dollar part, huh? You are very droll, but I see when you make this joke there is no smile on your face. You are worried about your friend, Mr. Harrison? Yeah, that's right. Maybe he was lonely tonight. Maybe he does not want you to find him. Ah, you certainly make me feel much better. How about a drink? I, I never drink before midnight. All right, then I'll wait. We'll have one then. All right, Johnny. But we don't have it here. We go to my house. There it is cool on the river. And there it is quiet. So we do not have to whisper. Midnight must have been invented for Singapore. And her house must have been invented for midnight. Only one thing looked out of place. Up on the wall was a souvenir of Chandra's war effort. A real American baseball bat. A Louisville slugger. And on it was written, Remember the U.S. Marines. Everything else in the place was soft. The lights, cushions, and Chandra. It is nicer to drink here, no? Yeah, may I say it's uh, a might intoxicating without a drink. I wish the boys back in my high school senior class could see me now. What do you mean? In the graduation annual, they predicted I'd be a bookkeeper. Oh, I do not understand you. And neither did the boys in my senior class. Johnny, please say things I can understand. I want to know you better. Maybe if I stop talking altogether, you'll get to know me better. So I stopped talking. But I didn't stop thinking. When I'd mentioned Harrison to Chandra earlier, she said maybe he was lonely tonight. If she didn't know him or anything about him, I wondered how she knew that he was missing tonight and not for a couple of days, or maybe even longer. Besides, the boyfriends of women like her don't keep secrets. I still assume that if Frank Moore had known Harrison, Chandra had known Harrison. I also assumed that she'd spited me into her parlor for purposes other than social... And that notion was seconded soon after I had it. 
when somebody kicked the door open. Hey, thank you, Jenny, darling. The two boys in the door were not from Western Union. And ugly as they were, Chandra left my side to join them, which made me think that maybe my senior class had been right. Looking at that trio six eyes and two guns glaring at me, I wished I was a bookkeeper. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, here it is almost the end of February. All over the country, people are thinking about their new cars. All but one man. And he remains quite content with his old automobile and wearing apparel. An ancient Maxwell and a well-worn toupee. For these reasons, and for several others, named Mary, Dennis, Don, Phil, and Rochester, he now has the number one comedy show in America. All over the country, people think about him, too, every Sunday night. Hear the Jack Benny Show with Claude Rains as Jack's special guest next Sunday on all these same CBS network stations. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The men with the guns, described from left to right, were a fat man with three chins and a bald dome... And with him, a punk with a sneer and arms that were too long for the rest of them. They gun-muzzled me into a chair and started making anything but sense. Hmm. Well, well, Sandra, my dear. (laughs) We are at last face-to-face with the mysterious stranger, Johnny Dollar. Oh, don't kill the suspense and tell me why. He knows why. He came to the Wardlow Bar. He knew about Frank Moore, and he was looking for the other one, Harrison. That is why I phoned you. Well, it would seem, then, that this unfortunate chain of events is... Needing the final link. Yeah, this guy uses his head better than Harrison did. Well, Della? I'm using my head right now. Splendid, splendid. So doing, you may well prevent Harrison's death as well as your own. Oh, well, that's better than nothing. But uh, is that all you can offer? Skip the bargaining, Russ Line. Takes too much time. Quiet, Corgi. There are times when money is cheaper than the results of your kind of blind violence. Well, Della, you do have a price. Take a tip from my last name. Start bidding. I tell you, you're nuts, Rosalind. You aren't sure he knows where it is. He must know. He was looking for Harrison. They both know. You'll be quiet, both of you. 500 pounds English dollar. Where is it? At times like this, I keep my mouth shut and my ears open. 750. Surely, dollar, since you've entered the situation at such a late date, that is profit enough. Oh, well, I'm a man of expensive taste. I've always aspired to such things as $200 cigarette lighters. Go ahead. Keep spitting out that wise talk and you'll be spitting out teeth. Well, how'd you like to go swimming with your hands and feet tied? I could bite my tongue. <clears throat> uh, not, not just yet, Corgi, my boy. <laughs> this man is worthless, dead. Uh, perhaps, Dolly, we can induce you to talk in much the same way as we could prepare a parrot by <clears throat> slitting the tongue. You know, Rosalind, your mother must have been scared by Sidney Greenstreet. Either this guy is nuts or he doesn't know anything. What I know would fill a police blotter. Corgi, you know nothing of psychology, my boy. What this man is attempting to pass off as a show of bravery is based purely on the knowledge that he is, momentarily at least, of some considerable value to us alive. Now, Dollar, be careful. Before you make your final decision, bear in mind you've heard our final offer. No, sir. What should it be? I was a squirrel. A squirrel said to the little girl when she asked him what he wanted for Christmas, nuts. Very well, Nella. Corgi. Thanks. <laughs> I finally came to in the dark, trussed up like a turkey, and lay there trying to figure it out. Obviously, the two rude dudes thought I knew something I didn't know. But what I did know was that finding Harrison had turned into a big, fat headache. Also, that I had accomplished exactly nothing towards speeding the SS Shanghai Wayfarer over the bounding main. While I was comforting myself by repeating over and over that old insurance company soother, never say die, I discovered I wasn't alone. Hello. Huh? You, who are you? Well, you were here first. You tell me. Well, my name is Harrison. Harrison? Yes, who are you? I'm Johnny Dollar. I was sent out here by the Oriental West Cargo Bonding Company. Oriental West? Yes, I was supposed to do what you couldn't get done. 
And look at me now. Getting hit over the head and dumped in here must be par for the course. How long have you been here, and why? Well, I've been driving myself crazy trying to figure that out. Well, this little guest house, wherever we are, must only have one set of proprietors. I can tell you who they are, at least by the names they're using tonight. Rosalind and Corgi. They offered me 750 English pounds to tell them where something called It was. What is it? Well, it's a package. What's in it, I don't know. It belonged to the chief engineer of the Shanghai Wayfarer, Frank Moore. He was helping me try to get the ship on its way, and I, I owed him a favor. He asked me to drop this package at a bar. The, the, the Wardlow bar, yeah, go ahead. That's right. I was supposed to give it to a girl named Chandra. She wasn't there, so I got her address and went out to her place. You mean that package is at Chandra's house? Yes. When I got out there, the Chinese maid let me in. I, I waited as long as I could, and then rather than leave what might be a valuable package just lying around loose, I, I put it into the bottom drawer of a dresser and left. Oh, great. For such things, I go around laying down my life. Well, it's obvious that these men will stop at nothing to get their hands on that package. Well, when they asked you where it was, why didn't you tell them? Then neither one of us would be here. What's more, I'm beginning to think the sooner they get the package, the sooner our ship sails. Frank Moore had been a good friend to me. He wanted Chandra to have it, and I, I couldn't just turn it over to those two. Well, I've got some news for you. And this should make you really unhappy. Those two happen to be in business with Chandra. Huh? They're all on the same team. She's one of them. What an idiot I've been. Uh, well, here we are, all roped up. You know, for a pair of guys who came out here to speed a shipload of raw tin on its way, we're doing just dandy. We're lucky if we get out of this thing alive. Offhand, I'd say our host probably murdered Frank Moore trying to get that package. Maybe we're next. Uh-oh. Maybe right now. <laughs> A beam from a powerful flashlight stabbed us in the eyes. The sudden change from too much dark to too much light kept us blinded. Well, look who's here. At least the voice behind the glare wasn't Rosalind's and it wasn't Corgi's. But it was a familiar voice, one I'd heard and heard lately. He walked in on us, the flash in one hand and in the other, a knife with a six-inch blade. At first I wondered whether it was the one that had been buried in Frank Moore's back. And then I remembered where I'd seen it before... The man bending over us was the burly gangway watch from the Shanghai Wayfarer. And you told me to watch out for pirates. Well, this situation is getting a little overcrowded. I didn't think there was room for any more. What do you want? You know what I want, Dollar. The same thing Rosalind and Corgi are ripping your hotel room apart for right now. Now, don't tell me you're looking for it, too. Two things I know about that package, mister. The name is Rourke. Okay, Rock. One thing I know is that it's dangerous company. The other is I want no part of it. The only thing I'm interested in is getting the Shanghai Wayfarer out of port. That won't be hard once I get that package. Where is it, Dollar? Uh, I'll trade the answer to that question for a little freedom. Okay, hold still. Uh, oh, nice. Harrison's next. I want him with us in case he's lying. All right. Okay, Harrison, roll over. Hey, you! When Rourke bent over Harrison, I drop-kicked the flashlight out of his hand, ran across the darkened room, through the open door, and kept on running. Sometimes the long way around is the shortest way home, so I headed for Chandra's house. I not only had some getting even to do, but I had some curiosity to satisfy. Somehow the Shanghai Wayfarer's failure to sail on schedule was tied up with a mysterious package. But how? Why? I decided I'd earn the right to see what was in that package. Johnny! I didn't want you to be lonely. I heard your playmates are over making themselves at home in my room. So I thought you and I could have a little chat. Maybe I've got a surprise for you. What, Johnny? I think I know where that package is. Johnny! You gave that package. We both don't worry for the rest of our lives. But we must hurry before Rosalind and Corgi come back. We go now. Okay, where's your bedroom? Johnny, what do you mean? Now, oh, come on, where is it? Come, I'll show you. No, it cannot be. It is not the yeah. one, no. It's been oh. here all the time. Oh. And now while I open this thing, you can go and have yourself a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Say, this is more fun than unwrapping Christmas presents. And now to take off the cover. Wow. Now I know how the winner feels on Hit the Jackpot. The 
package was paper all the way through, brown wrapping on the outside and green spending on the inside. Big bundles of fresh, clean American 20s. Thousands of the same kind of bills that the Singapore police had found in the late Frank Moore's wallet. It would have taken half a day to count it, and I'd wasted too much time already. They'll be no good to you without me, Johnny. You have to know how to get rid of them. Oh, counterfeit, huh? Yes. They are made in China. Frank Moore brought them from Shanghai to Roslyn to take to the States, but Roslyn was not here in Singapore. He was late, so Frank had to make some accidents happen to his ship to keep it from sailing. But then he changed his mind. He decided he would give the money himself, but Roslyn caught up with him. Oh, I see. He was sending them to you by way of Harrison, just before he was knifed by Roslyn, huh? Who talked him into that? You, by any chance? You and I could be very rich, Johnny. You never give up, do you? It's $500,000 there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that should buy about 50 years in jail. I'm taking this down to customs and you with it. No, I do not think you do. Uh-huh. Time to play another visiting team. Come on, beautiful. I don't want you in the way. Let go of me, Allison. I grabbed her, lashed her wrist with a cord from the package, and since she liked money so much, I stuffed her mouth with a fistful of those troublesome $20 bills. I locked her and the rest of the loot into a closet and dashed into the other room looking for a weapon. And then I remembered that Louisville slugger from the U.S. Marines. I was glad they'd landed. I grabbed it off the wall, got a toehold in the carpet on the left side of that door, wrapped my fingers around the bat, swung it on the back of my shoulder, and waited. Sandra. Sandra, my dear, we just came to... Oh! Oh. Two outs and one to go. Three outs, and the side is retired. What a ball game. Now, first, I take your guns. And now we sit and wait for you to wake up. I'll take over from here on in, Dollar. Huh? Oh, I don't know about that, Rourke. I happen to be the guy who has the gun. Oh? Well, here. Take a look at this. What's in your wallet that I want to look at? More hot 20s? I'm not taking my eyes off you, Rourke. Okay, I'll turn around with my hands up and then you can look at it. Okay, fair enough. But if you so much as move, I'll start shooting. That's the deal. Oh, it's a fine time to learn this. Are you satisfied? John Joseph Rourke, U.S. Treasury Department. Come on in. I'm sorry I couldn't come out into the open before, Dollar, but I was too close to the payoff of this case to take any chances. Well, you know, I'm beginning to think that just being in this town is taking chances. That counterfeit's been funneling through this port on its way from China for months. We had more staked out for a long time, but this is the first shot we had at the top. That's him lying there on the floor, Rosalind. Now I've got him. Oh, your pal Harrison told me where I can find the only other thing I need, that package of hot money in the dresser drawer. Oh, it's now moved into the bedroom closet along with a package of hot woman. Well, then, Dollar, it looks like my job out here is just about done. Yeah, I guess so. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? You're from the Treasury Department. Yes? Well, then, after you get all these birds into their cages, how about helping me make out my income tax? <laughs> Expense account, item six. Hotel bill, one night in Singapore, $5. Item seven... One new outfit, replacing mine, which was ruined in course of taking midnight dip in Singapore River, $200. Item eight, $20. Bar checks for cheering up one William Harrison, your expediter, whose innocence had him running errands for the man who was holding up the departure of your ship. Item nine, $375. Spent while killing time until the departure of my plane back to the States. After the Shanghai Wayfarer finally sailed. You see, this time, I had four hours on my hands instead of the two you allowed me in San Francisco. Expense account total, $1,407. Signed, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's Johnny Dollar Adventure. But first, for more exciting drama in the mystery and adventure line, remember CBS two thrill-packed Saturday night shows. 
The Adventures of Philip Marlowe and Gangbusters. Be sure to hear Philip Marlowe and Gangbusters tomorrow night on most of these same CBS network stations. Next week, CBS will take you adventuring with Johnny Dollar, hitting the hot spots in Palm Beach and New Orleans with the star of Hades, Diamond, on a trip all points south. Charles Russell plays the role of Johnny. Our music is composed and conducted by Mark Warno. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Did you miss out on that big football game last week? Can't get rid of that head cold? Want to get away from it all? CBS offers you Escape. You are groping your way slowly through the dark hold of a ship at sea, moving carefully step by step, searching intently for something you dread to find because you know that this ship carries a cargo of death. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations presents Escape, produced and directed by William N. Robeson and carefully plotted to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to a harbor front in Venezuela and a grim voyage that started there, as told by Martin Storm in his gripping story, A Shipment of Mute Fate. I stopped on the wharf at LaGuaira and looked up the gangplank toward the liner Chan K, standing quietly there at her moorings. The day was warm under a bright tropic sun, and the harbor beyond the ship lay drowsy and silent. But all at once in the midst of these peaceful surroundings, a cold chill gripped me, and I shivered with sudden dread. Dread of the thing I was doing and was about to do. But too much had happened to turn back now. I'd gone too far to stop. So I set the box down on the edge of the wharf, placed it carefully so as to be in plain sight and within gunshot of the captain's bridge. And then I turned and started up the gangplank. I knew what I was going to do, but I couldn't forget that a certain pair of beady eyes were watching every move I made. Eyes that never blinked and never closed. Just watched and waited. Oh, I beg your pardon. Why, it's Mr. Warner. Hello, Mother Willis. How's the best-looking stewardess on the seven seas? Well, I'm... I'm fine, Mr. Warner. I, I guess better run along now and get on with my show. Now, wait a minute. That's a fine greeting after two months. Well, it's just that I'm so busy. I don't believe a word of it. Sailing day's tomorrow. You're simply avoiding me, that's all. Oh, no, really, I'm not. And on the trip down from New York, you said I was your favorite passenger. But I'm only... Here, wait a minute. What's that you're carrying in your apron there? Oh, it's there? nothing. Uh, just supplies. Supplies? Well, let's have a look, huh? No, please. What do you know? It's a cat. It's... Clara, Mr. Warner. Mm-hmm. Mr. Bowman said I had to leave her ashore, and I just couldn't. Well, who's Mr. Bowman? The new chief steward. No. Clara's been aboard with me for two years, and I just can't leave her here in a foreign country, especially with her condition so delicate and all. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, I hope you get away with it. You, you won't tell anyone? Not a soul. As a matter of fact, if things don't work out right, we may both end up smuggling. <laughs> on the trip down two months ago, Christopher. I'm very glad you're coming along with us on the run back to New York. Thanks, Captain Wood. There is one thing, though. I'm having a little trouble with the customs men here, and I wondered if you might... I sp- can't do it, Christopher. I just cabled your father this morning. Told him I'd done it for you if I possibly could. He sent a request from New York, you know. Yeah, I thought he would. I wired him from upriver last well, week. I hate to refuse, but it's absolutely out of the question. 
Well, Captain Wood, I'm afraid I don't follow you there. Responsibility to the passenger, son. We'll have women and children aboard. On a liner, the safety of the passengers comes ahead of anything. But with proper precautions. Something might happen. I don't know what, but something might. You've carried worse things. There isn't anything worse. And any skipper afloat will bear me out. Now, Christopher, I simply can't take the chance, and that's final. Final? Well, it wasn't final if I could do anything about it. I hadn't come down here to spend two months in that stinking backcountry and then be stopped on the edge of the wharf. Two months of it. Heat, rain, insects, malaria. I'd gone clear in past the headwaters of the Orinoco, traveled through country where every step along the jungle trail might be the last one. Oh, Sanchez. Si, sí, senor Warner. You better start looking for a place to camp. It'll be dark in a little while. Uh, si, sí, senor. Very soon we turn to river. Camp on rocks by water. This very bad country. This very bad country. You've been saying that for ten days now. Very bad country. Well, si, sí, senor Warner. This very bad country. Yeah, we'll skip it. For all the luck we've had so far, it might as well be Central Park. Uh, Central Park? Uh, I don't understand. Well, never mind. If we don't find hey, some... Wait, 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 wait. Hey, hey, what's the matter? Quiet now. Sanchez, what's wrong? They're in the path. See? Bushmaster. Bushmaster. The deadliest snake in the world. Bushmaster. Its Latin name was Lachesis Muta. Mute fate. It lay there in the center of the path, a ten-foot length of silent death, coiled loosely in an undulant loop, ready to strike violently at the least movement. Here was the one snake that would go after any animal that walked, or any man. It lay there and watched us, not moving, not afraid, ready for anything. The splotch of its colors stood out like some horrible, gaudy floor mat lying there on the brown background of the jungle, waiting for someone to step on it. Here was what I'd come 2,000 miles for, a Bushmaster. Sanchez! I didn't want that snake killed! He no kill, senor. He gone. Bushmaster very smart, very quick. Must always see a bullet in time to dodge. Well, anyway, he's gone, and the only one we've seen in five weeks. Oh, we find other. This very bad country. Well, lay off that gun the next time. Don't shoot, you understand. Why you say no shoot? You want Bushmaster. Sure, but I want it alive. Hombre, Sir Cristo. Senor Warner, you tell me you want Bushmaster, but you no say alive. You're getting $200 for it. <laughs> for dead man, what is $200? Tomorrow we go back to Caracas. I'll make it 500, Sanchez. I catch water snake, rattlesnake, any other kind. But I no catch Bushmaster. Sanchez, I'll give you $1,000. We go back to Caracas. Well, it cost me 1500 American dollars. But three days later, Sanchez brought me the snake in a rubber bag. He was shaking so hard, I thought for a moment the thing had struck him. One thing you make sure, Senor Warner. Not turn him loose in Venezuela. Because he know I the one who catch him. And he know where I live. All right, Sanchez, I'll keep an eye on him. También he know you pay me to catch him. All the time he watch and wait. You no forget that, Senor Warner, because he no forget. Not ever. Well, after going through all that trouble and danger and laying out 1,500 bucks... I wasn't going to let a pig-headed ship captain stop me at the last minute. At least not as long as the cables were still in operation between LaGuaira and New York. Morning, Captain Wood. The boy at the hotel said you wanted to see me. That's right, Christopher. Yeah, sit down. Thank you. It seems you weren't willing to let matters stand the way we left them yesterday. I'm well, sorry to go over your head, Captain Wood, but I had to. The museum sent me all the way down here for it. And I'm not going to be stopped by red tape. This will be the only live Bushmaster ever brought to the United States. Mm. Yes, and if I had my way, but... Uh, well, orders are orders. I got a cable from the head office this morning. All right. I suppose we talk about precautions. I'll handle it any way you say. Got to have a stronger box. That crate's too flimsy. Well, it's stronger than it looks. And that wire screen on top would hold a wildcat. But anyway, I bought a heavy sea chest this morning. I will put the crate inside of it. it. Sounds all right. You got a lock on it? Heavy padlock. It's fixed so that the lid can be propped open a crack without unlocking it. The snake's got to have air. But in dirty weather, that lid stays shut. I'll take no chances. Fair enough. I will keep the thing in my inside cabin where I sleep. 
I can't have it in the baggage room. And nobody on board's to know about it. Whatever you say, Captain. But we won't have any trouble. After all, it's only an animal. It doesn't have any magical powers. I saw a bushmaster in the zoo at Krakus once. Had it in a glass cage with double walls. It had never moved. Just lay there. Look at you as long as you were in sight. Gave a man the creeps. I didn't know they had a bushmaster at the Caracas Zoo. They don't. Now. Found the glass broken one morning and the snake gone. Night watchman was dead. They never found out what happened. Well, the watchman must have broken the glass by accident some way. The way they figured it, the glass was broken from the inside. Well, we sail in four hours. We steam north into the Caribbean with perfect weather and a sea as smooth as an inland lake. The barometer dropped a little on the third day but cleared up overnight and left nothing worse than a heavy swell. But in spite of the calm seas and the pleasant weather, I found myself feeling more and more often an ominous foreboding. I was developing an almost unnatural fear of that snake. Well, I stayed clear of the passengers pretty much. Got the habit of dropping into Captain Wood's quarters several times a day. He kept the heavy box underneath his berth. I'd approach it quietly and shine my flashlight through the open crack. Never once could I catch that 12-foot devil asleep or even excited. He'd be lying there half-coiled, his head raised a little, staring out of those beady black eyes, waiting. He'd still be like that when I'd turn away to leave. Maybe that's what bothered me. That horrible and constant watchful waiting. What in the name of heaven was he waiting for? Well, hello there, Mr. Warner. Oh, how are you, Mother Willis? Why, but you and the captain spend an awful lot of time around this cabin. I'm beginning to think the two of you must have some guilty secret. Oh, no, nothing like that, Mother Willis. I don't know about Captain Wood, but I... Well, I certainly don't have any guilty secret. running quite a swell out there, Mr. Bowman. Yeah, it's a little heavy, all right, Mr. Warner. Guess a storm passed through to the west of us yesterday when the glass dropped. Think it missed us then, huh? Yeah, that's that's what the mate figures. Sure stirred up some water, though. <laughs> This'll put half the passengers in their bunks. Makes it great for my department. Two-thirds of them will want a steward to hold their heads. They'll keep Mother Willis so busy she'll have... Wait, look at the size of that wave. Huh? The great Jehoshaphat. We're gonna take it on the port bow. Hang on! Well, that was a freak if there ever was one. Not another wave in sight. You see him like that sometimes, even in a calm sea. Well, I gotta get below, Mr. Warner. That water probably did some damage on the officer's deck. Yeah, I suppose it... What did you say? Uh, the wheel companionway was open on the port side. Bridge cabins must have taken a pretty bad smashing up. They're right below the, uh... Here, uh... Is something wrong, Mr. Warner? No. No, nothing at all, Mr. Bowman. At least I hope not. I looked first for Captain Wood and couldn't find him. Of course, I knew it was only one chance in a thousand, but the chances against that freak wave were one in a thousand, too. Well, I couldn't waste any more time, so I stumbled down the companionway and along the passage to the captain's cabin. Oh, oh, come on in, Mr. Warner. Mother Willis. Why, isn't this cabin a mess? Trying to get some of these things out to dry. Yeah, well, I just wanted to check. Where's that box that was under the captain's bunk? Threw it out on that, Mr. But where? We didn't know. It was nearly dark when we well, met together again in the chart room. I don't get the, I don't get the thing There's at no all. There's no other way around it. We've risked all the time we can. We've got to warn the passengers. Well, how we do it, Captain? Call them all together in the lounge? No, if we did anything like that, we'd be asking for a panic. We'll get one, whether we ask for it or not. Uh, pick a few men and go through the cabin decks. Tell them individually, inside their cabins. Watch for any act that looks as though it might cause trouble. And we'll keep an eye on them. Handle the crew the same way. All right, all right Captain. Okay. We'll take care. Uh, as soon as you've finished, arm all the deck officers and start searching again. Our only chance of preventing a riot is to find that damnable snake. The slow nightmare that followed grew worse by the hour. None of us slept. 
All the ship's officers not on duty kept on with that endless search. Passengers locked themselves in their cabins or huddled together in the lounges, knowing all the time that no spot on board could be called safe. Fear was a heavy fog in the lungs of all of us, and every light on the vessel burned throughout the night. Morning came and brought no relief. Terror and tension mounted by the hour. There now, Mrs. Crane, stop getting yourself all worked up and go back to your cabin. The horrid things probably crawled overboard anyway. You're just saying that. You're paid to say it. You don't know. Nobody does. Now, now, everything's going to be all right. Oh, if you could only do something. If all of us could only get off the ship. They could fumigate it. Yes, that's what we've got to do. We've got to get off the ship. Now, wait. Mr. Bowman. Mr. Bowman, she's going to jump. No, you don't, lady. Let me go. Let me go. (laughs) Not good. Let me go! Nice work, Mr. Bowman. Let me go. Get her down to a cabin. Whatever you do, don't turn her loose. Well, you never know when it might strike you. You can't put on a coat or move a chair without risking your life. Now something's got to be done. Yes, sir, it yes, might sir. be right here in this slough. Yes, right oh, all, right, all right, Mister. You, you better quiet down. Take it easy. Now. Take it easy, huh? Well, you're a great officer. Why don't you do something about it? That thing might be crawling around here right under our feet somewhere. Look, I said shut up. Are you trying to start a panic? I got a right to talk. I don't want to die. Nobody's okay. going to tell me. Oh. The second night passed and morning came around again. A gray and rainy day, just as grim and tense, dragged past. And the night came down again. Third night of the terror. Again, every light burned and the whole ship seethed in the throes of incipient panic. Faced by a horror they'd never met on the sea before, crew and officers alike were on the verge of revolt. Passengers sat huddled in a trance-like stupor, ready to scream at the slightest unknown sound. At seven bells, I made my way forward to the chart room and found Captain Wood bent over a desk. Ah, hello, Christopher. Come on in, sit down. It's got to be somewhere, Captain Wood, it's got to be. I don't know. You could search this ship for six months and never touch all the places aboard. We can only hold out for two more days. We'll be in. What's the home office say? Oh, here's the latest wireless from them. Keep quiet and keep coming. (laughs) What else can we do? How is it on the decks? Pretty bad. Anything could happen. Yeah. That's why I took the guns away from the men. One pistol shot and we'd have a riot on our hands. Oh, the whole thing's my fault, Captain Wood. That's what I can't forget. Oh, take it easy, lad. There was only some way I could pay for it myself, alone. No, I know how you feel, but it's no more your fault than mine or the man who asked you to bring the snake back alive. Nobody planned this. You'd better try and get a little sleep. Sleep? Mr. Bowman made some coffee down the steward's galley a while ago, Better go down and get yourself a cup. And then rest up for a couple of hours. Rest? I can't rest. Christopher, it's no good going. What are you going to do? You, you, you can't help anything if you stumble through a hatch, half asleep and break your neck. Go on and get some coffee. One way or another, we've got to hold out for two more days. <laughs> The light was on in the steward's galley, and the coffee pot was standing on the stove. It was still warm, so I didn't bother to heat it. I poured out a cup, carried it over, and set it on the porcelain tabletop in the center of the room. I started to light a cigarette. The door of the pan cupboard beneath the sink was standing slightly ajar, and I happened to glance down toward it. Out from the dark interior of the cupboard shone two glittering points of light two inches apart. I dropped the cigarette and moved slowly backward. I'd found the Bushmaster. As I moved, the snake slid out of the cupboard in a single sinuous glide and drew back into a loose coil on the galley floor, never taking his eyes off me. I moved slowly back, waiting any moment for that deadly slithering strike. How had he known it was me? He'd stayed quiet when Bowman was here. How did he know to pick the first time in three days when I didn't have a gun? Well, my hands touched the wall behind me and I stopped. Only then I realized in terror what I'd done. The call button and the door were on the far side of the room. I'd backed into a dead end. I stared at the snake in fascination. 
expecting any moment the ripping slash of those poison fangs. The horrid coils tightened a little and then were still again. Ten million years of evolution to produce this moment. Homo sapiens versus Lachesis muta. Man against mute fate. And all the odds were on fate. I knew then that I was going to die. I could feel the sweat run down between the painted wall and the palms of my hands pressed against it. My skin crawled and twitched. And the pit of my stomach was as cold as ice. There was no sound but the rush of blood in my ears. The snake shifted again, drawing into a tighter coil. Always tighter. Why the devil didn't he get it over with? And then, for just an instant, his head veered away. Something moved over by the stove. I didn't dare turn to look at it. Slowly, it moved out into my line of vision. It was a cat. That scrawny cat, Clara, that Mother Willis had sneaked aboard in LaGuira. Its back was arched and every hair stood on end. It moved stiff-legged now, walking in a half circle around the snake. The Bushmaster shifted slowly and kept watching the cat. He tightened. He was going to strike at any second. He struck and missed. The cat was barely out of reach. Now she was walking back and forth again. She was asking to die. Missed again by a fraction of an inch. He was striking now without even going to a full coil. Missed again and again. Always missing by the barest margin. Each time the cat danced barely out of reach and each time she countered with one precise spat of a dainty paw, bracing her skinny frame on three stiff legs. And then suddenly I realized what she was doing. The bushmaster was tiring. And one strike was just an instant slow. But in that split second, sharp claws raked across the evil head and ripped out both of the lidless eyes. That cat had deliberately blinded the snake. Well, he didn't bother to coil now, but slid after in a fury, striking wildly and rapidly, always missing. And every strike was a little slower than the last one. Until finally, as the snake's neck stretched out at the end of a strike, the cat made one leap and sank her razor-sharp teeth just back of the ugly head, sank them in until they crunched bone. With tooth and claw, she clung as the monster snake flailed and lashed on the floor, striving to get those hideous coils around her, trying to break her hold, to shake off the slow and certain paralyzing death that gradually crept over him and at last stilled his struggles forever. I took a deep breath. The first in minutes... The cat lay on her side on the floor, panting, resting from the fight just over. And she had a right to rest. That mangy, brave, beautiful alley cat had just saved my life. And maybe others as well. But as I turned toward the stove, I suddenly became very humble. And I knew all at once what a small thing a human being really is. I and others aboard were still alive only by the merest accident. There were three reasons why that cat had fought and killed the world's deadliest snake. And those three reasons came tottering out from under the stove on shaky little legs. Three kittens with their eyes bright with wonder and their tails stiff as pokers. Up on the decks, hundreds of passengers were waiting for the news that the days and nights of terror were ended. Well, I could wait a little longer. I pulled open the doors of the cabinet, found a can of milk, and then I dropped down on my knees on the floor of the galley. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and tonight brought you A Shipment of Mute Fate by Martin Storm, adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield, with Jack Webb as Chris Warner, Raymond Lawrence as Captain Wood, and D.J. Thompson as Mother Willis. The special musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Fuhr. Next week... At this same time, when you're tired from a hard day at the office or leaning over a hot stove all day. When you want to get away from it all, CBS again offers you escape. Good night, then, until this same time next week when CBS again brings you Escape.
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mystery. Brought to you by the makers of Cardi's Tales. Good evening, friends. I'm Raymond your host. You remember? Won't you uh, come in to our inner sanctum? Hmm? Yeah, it's very gratifying that you have the courage to come back. I was afraid our story last week might have been too much for you. But, since it wasn't, suppose we see what you think of tonight's tale. The story of a strange, weird voyage that makes the ancient mariner look like one of the rover boys. <laughs> In our science of mysteries, tonight bring you the dead ship. Featuring an all-star cast of radio favorites in an original radio drama by Robert Newman. Presented for your entertainment by the makers of Carter's Little Liverpool, the best friend to your sunny disposition. Now, wait. A question before we begin. Do you really know anything about the sea? The sea that covers two-thirds of the Earth's surface. It's a place of storms and sudden death. A place where anything can happen and usually does aboard the death ship. The Caribbean. Vast blue home of the Gulf Stream and the mysterious Agatha Wild. Somewhere near its center, heading north, an open boat. In it, their eyes red rimmed, their faces raw and cracked. Now, five men. One of them glances at stern. There, trailing them, is a menacing, triangular black skin. Captain. Captain Spike. Aye. What is it, Carter? He, he's back. He's following us again. Oh, that shark. The same one that picked us up right after the wreck. How do you know it's that same one? Because I do, and I don't like it. You know what it means. It's man's death. You keep on following this until. I'll hold the door, Captain. If you can't get him. Ah, what's the sense? I tried three times already. Please, Captain. Well, give me your gun and let me try. Okay. Hold it, Dilla. Did you get him? Never even flinched. Maybe he'll go away when George dies. That's what he's waiting for. Yes, he's in crazy, guys. With all his ribs stove in? Okay. He's freezing, he's in Look, the opening is there. Water. Water. You got some for water. I heard him. Uh, are you still going to kiss him, Amy? Don't be a fool, Sam. You know he's dying. Water won't save him. There's hardly enough for the rest of us. He's entitled to his share, sir. He can have my rights in the side. Mine, too. Well, for my money, you're crazy, but... All right, Corky, force him out. All right, I'll look up. Okay, Captain. I think you're not too, Benson. Here you go. Thanks. Hey, you Josh. Uh, hey, you are. Now drink this. Water. Uh, where? Where am I? What happened? Don't you remember, Josh? Uh, the Mary Kay. That storm last night. Uh, we ran into a reef off Skeleton Key. Uh, found it. All hands were lost except us. Some gear fell on you and you got kind of hurt. Jonathan, please. I remember. My ticket and we. Captain Pike told me we were clear of the reef. The strange ass call. I did. And then we. You know, Captain Pike, you wanted to wreck the ship. What? You're crazy. You did. Piled it up for your insurance. And Captain was in it with you. You had the launch. Oh, out. Yeah. Before we even start. Well, if that's true, then what are we doing here in a whaleboat without any food and hardly any water? 
And he don't know what killed the man. He found left to the wheel. Well, no, we don't. Hey, Pike. Just come soon. The lost one. Hey, what does that make you tell us something? Ah, uh, you're right. Finding that treasure, get me the head up and never thought of it. Now, we'll go down and read it right now. Well, uh, sure you don't want Benson to take the wheel, Ben? No, Captain. I'll finish up this trick. You can take over at this stage. Okay. Come on, Benson. All right. Oh, no, look for the law, look in the field. Oh, they think you're crazy, eh? Well, we'll see. Talbot made it. One man can't handle this ship. But 
and a dead man at the helm. Hmm. Pleasant little tale, wasn't it? Did it have enough corpses and sudden death in it to suit you? No, it didn't. Hmm. Some people are never satisfied. It's a good thing they're not, Raymond, or there wouldn't have been any progress. Oh, you mean we'd have to get along without such things as the telephone, the airplane, the electric light, the radio, and Carter's little liver pill. Heaven forbid. Yes, Raymond, scores of people would hate to be without Carter's little liver pill. Because they've learned that a mean, cranky, sour disposition due to irregularity often takes a decided change for the better. Soon after they try these simple little pills made of vegetable brush. Yes, yes. Now, be sure to mention that Carter's little liver pills do this by increasing the flow of a very important digestive juice. That's right, folks. And the name, Carter's little liver pills, tells us where that vital juice comes from. So next time you don't feel good, try Carter's little liver pills. And see if you don't agree that they're the best friends to your sunny disposition. 25 cents at all drugstores. Again, your host, getting ready to close that door to the inner sanctum and say goodnight until next week when our guest will once again be Paul Lucas. I hope you enjoyed our little story and that you got its moral. Hmm? What moral? Oh, it had one all right. All our stories have. Uh-huh. Dead men tell no tales. Except on the inner sanctum. So, next Sunday night, we'll overcome the hot weather and invite your friends in for a chilling evening and listen to Inner Sanctum Mystery. However, if you just can't wait till the coming Sunday for our next one, satisfy your craving for a good murder story by reading this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery novel, I'll Eat You Last, by H.C. Brendan. Good night. <laughs> Featured in tonight's cast were Arthur Vinton as Captain Pike, Byron McCormick as Tom, and Gilbert Mack as Fred. Original music by Lou White. Inner Sanctum Mysteries will be on the air again next Sunday evening, same station, same time, when we will again have the honor of bringing you the popular and gifted star of stage, screen, and radio, Mr. Paul Lucas. Be sure to listen in. This is Ed Hurley here reminding you, when you don't feel good, try Carter's Little Liver Pill. I present Monsignor Sheen. Friends, last Sunday we spoke of the first of the three philosophies of life involved in this war, the totalitarian. Today and next Sunday, we speak of the second, the secularist and materialist culture of the Western world. By the secularist ideology... We mean the attempt to preserve human and democratic values on a non-moral and non-religious foundation. The condemnation of secularism of the Western world is not a condemnation of the Western world. There is the same distinction to be made between the two as between a ship and its barnacles the ship in its passage through the seas, picks up barnacles which impede its free progress through the waters. Every now and then, that ship must be brought into dry dock to have the barnacle scraped away. The ship is good. The barnacles are bad. Now, Western civilization, or what we call democracy, may be likened to a ship America, in particular, is a good ship. It carries the precious cargo of belief in inalienable rights and liberties. This ship of America is good. It carries the burden of the four freedoms of which our president spoke. Freedom of speech. Freedom of religion. Freedom from want and freedom from fear. This ship of America is good, and it is freighted down with the cargo of the right of sanctuary.
For America has been a sanctuary in the past and is a sanctuary now to the oppressed peoples of the world. There's no other land on the face of God's earth has been a sanctuary. This ship of America is good. And it is freighted down with the precious cargo of all those fine and noble things which make you and me proud to call ourselves Americans. But in the course of sailing, this ship has acquired some barnacles. And these barnacles or superstitions, which I shall speak, <coughs> constitute what we call the passive or soft barbarism from within. And they are a danger to Western civilization, not quite as open as totalitarianism, but just as insidious. Today we shall describe three of these barnacles. The superstition of progress, of scientism, and materialism. After we have described them, we hope that we will be able to scrape them off. First, the barnacle or the superstition of progress. It runs some such way as this. Man is naturally good and indefinitely perfectible. But the mere fact that he lives, and thanks to great cosmic floods of evolution, he will be swept onward and onward until he becomes a kind of a god and this earth becomes a paradise. Goodness increases with time, while evil and error decline. Progress is automatic. Such is the superstition of progress. Now, why is it wrong? It is wrong because it confuses mechanical advancement with moral betterment. Progress in things is not necessarily progress in persons. Planes may go faster, but man does not necessarily become happier. Mastery over disease is not necessarily mastery over sin. Conquest of nature does not mean conquest of selfishness. Time does not always operate in favor of betterment. Because a man is sick, time does not make him better. Unless the evil is corrected, time may operate in favor of disease, decay, and death. True progress is morally and not mechanically conditioned. It depends not on vitamins, more playgrounds and better milk and duckless glands, but on the will, the will to goodness. There is, therefore, only one real, true progress in the world, and that consists in the diminution of the traces of original sin. History does not prove that we are making progress. Notice the intervals between wars in modern times. The interval between the Napoleonic Wars and the Franco-Prussian War was 55 years. The interval between the Franco-Prussian War and the First World War was 43. The interval between the First World War and this one, 21. 55. 43. 21. And each war more destructive than the other, and at a time when man had all the material conditions essential for happiness, is this real progress? The sad and tragic fact is that modern man under sufficient stress, and even among comforts, will do deeds of evil as terrible 
as any that have ever been recorded in human history. Barbarism is not behind us. Barbarism is beneath us. And at any moment, it can emerge unless our wills, aided by God's grace, repress it. Our own mechanical ability to move quickly can go hand in hand with the power to do more evil. Let no one deny it. Our scientific progress has outstripped our moral progress. The myth of necessary progress has exploded. But because the evil in the world does not evolve right, does not mean, as they say, that there is no right. What it does mean is that we must put it right. And in order to do this, we may have to learn the lesson of the cross and the agony of Gethsemane. Maybe, maybe, we had all better get back again to God. Then there is the second barnacle or superstition, the superstition of scientism. I do not say science. I say scientism. And by scientism, I mean that particular abuse of science which affirms that the scientific method is the only way of knowing anything. It is this particular superstition which makes people say, science tells us. But they never say, scriptures tell us, or the church tells us, or the commandments tell us. Science is supposed to be the very last word on any subject. Hence, there's no place for values, tradition, metaphysics, revelation, faith, authority, or theology. The only true knowledge is that which comes from counting. Such is the superstition of scientism which has gripped America. Now, science is, of course, a very valid way of knowing. But only of knowing those things which are subject to experimentation and the methods of the laboratory. The great values of life, such as justice and truth and charity, are beyond experimentation. No one has yet ever been able to put a mother's love into a test tube. But who will deny that it exists? We cannot put a man into a cauldron and boil him and stew him until he gives forth the unmistakable green fumes of envy. The great values of life are beyond the laboratory. And scientism of this kind is ruining higher education in the United States. It is doing it by assuming that anyone who has counted something that has never been counted before is a learned man. It makes no difference what you count in higher education. But in the name of heaven, count! A certain Western university awarded a Doctor of Philosophy degree to a student who wrote on the thesis the microbic content of cotton undershirts. A Midwestern university has counted the ways of washing dishes. Eastern universities have counted the infinitives in Augustine, the datives and the ablatives in Ovid, the four ways of cooking ham, and another, to quote their own words, the psychological reactions of the post-rotational eye movement of squabs. <laughs> Go into any Catholic school in the United States tomorrow and take out any child in the first or second grade and say to that child, Why are you here? Where are you going? What is the purpose of life? And the child 
will be able to answer your questions. But ask this Ph.D. student who can't count at the microbes and cotton undershirts why he's here, where he's going, what is his destiny. He would not be able to tell you. He would not have a five-cent gadget in his house five minutes without knowing its goal or its purpose. And yet he will live ten, twenty, sixty years without knowing why he is here or where he is going. It is not true that modern youth is revolutionary because he lacks sufficient economic advantages. Never before has modern youth had so many. The modern youth is revolutionary because he has no purpose in life. And unless, as a nation, we restore purposes and values in education, we will end only by educating for chaos. Oh, we are paying a terrible penalty for divorcing our science from God. Nature which studies science belongs to God. When man turns against God, nature or science turns against man. As Francis Thompson rather beautifully put it, I tempted all his servitors, but to find my own betrayal in their constancy. In faith to him, in fickleness to me, their traitorous trueness and their loyal deceit. That is the true story. Nature will be false to anyone who is untrue to its maker. For years, science has been discovering the wonders of nature, but instead of glorifying God, has forgotten God. And scientists thought themselves the authors of the book of nature instead of only its proofreaders. And tearing nature away from God... Nature now turns against them. And the result, that science which was supposed to be our servant is now our master. Why is it that millions today shrink in terror from a machine in the air? Why does man use his technique to destroy man? Why do children crouch in bed and mothers dig holes in the bowels of the earth as bombs fall from the skies and all hell is let loose? If it is not because science has gotten beyond our control. Maybe, maybe we had all better get back again to God. And the third barnacle or superstition is materialism. And this superstition affirms that man has no soul, there is no future life, <laughs> Man is only an animal. As our modern psychologists tell us, he is a psychoanalytical bag filled with physiological libido. Or he is a stimulus response mechanism. The end of whose life is the acquisition of money, the enjoyment of pleasure. There are no standards outside of the material. Now, it simply is not true that peace follows material prosperity. There is more frustration among the rich than among the poor. Sin and evil do not disappear with the advent of prosperity. Society can become inhuman while preserving all the advantages of a material prosperity. And if there are no standards outside of the material... How shall we judge the new acquisitive society which is arising? Based on the acquisitiveness of power as against the old acquisitiveness of money. As fortunes dwindle, as taxes eat up inheritances, and as bureaucracies begin to administer vast sums of money formerly administered by capitalists and bankers, envious, greedy, and lustful men will seek to become dispensers of that social booty. And who shall say that these new financiers of power are wrong? Given no other standard 
than that of materialism, wherein power is disjoined from conscience, and we lose the right to protest in the name of justice. Our world is sick of materialism. It is pathetic to hear people ask, what can I as an individual do in this crisis? These people who have been told that they are only animals, many of them feel like cogs and machines. They want to get away from it all. Some of them would like to climb back into catacombs. Like Jews in exile, they hang their harps on the trees and ask how they can sing a song in a foreign land without a soul. There will be a change. The millions of boys on the battlefronts of the world who are fighting for their lives and for great moral issues will recover their souls. Midst wounds and death and fire and shell, they will get close to the meaning of life and do that something within them which really makes them human. And then they will look back and they will be angry at those who educated them. They will come to hate not only the enemy in battle, but they will hate still more the intelligentsia at home who told them that they were only animals. They will begin to realize that these so-called educators rob them of their greatest possession, faith. And for a while, they will wander around the battlefields like Mary Magdalene in the garden, saying, They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they laid him. But when they do stumble on him, as Magdalene did when she saw the red livid marks of nails, they will enter once again into the possession of the soul. And when they come marching home, there will be a judgment on those intelligentsia who told them that they had no soul. They will begin to live like new men. There will be a rebirth of freedom under God. For maybe, not only are they right, maybe, we had all better be right and get back again to God. Why do I speak about these barnacles on the ship of democracy? Because they are endangering the American way of life. Because they are outmoded ways of thinking. Because we are called upon in this world war to be the moral leaders of the world. Never before was a greater task thrust into any nation's hands than into our own. We have a great vocation, and we must be worthy of it. And we do not want the ship of America to be held up in its mission by barnacles and false superstitions. And may I therefore ask you, Jews... Protestants and Catholics, to spend an hour a day in prayer that America may be worthy of its calling. Catholics should include daily Mass and communion in this hour. And to anyone who wishes a prayer book for wartime entitled The Shield of Faith, we will send it with our compliments. For how else except by prayer? Realize the pledge of our President when he said, the United Nations seek to work for the restoration of the international order in which Christ guides the hearts of individuals and nations. That is a tremendous responsibility. America, awake! You have a high summons Walk worthy of your vocation. Purge yourself. Repent. Your greatness is in your return to God. God love you. O Lord Jesus Christ, who in thy mercy hearest the prayers of sinners, Pour forth, we beseech thee, all grace and blessing upon our country and its citizens. We pray in particular for the President, 
for our Congress, for all our soldiers, for all who defend us in ships, whether on the seas or in the skies, for all who are suffering the hardships of war. We pray for all who are in peril or in danger. Bring us all after the troubles of this life into the haven of peace and reunite us all together, O oh dear Lord, in thy glorious heavenly kingdom. The address you have just heard was entitled, Some Barnacles on the Sh Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents The Girl on Shipwreck Island, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. When Captain Bart Friday and his sidekick Skip Turner return to Saigon, capital of French Indochina, following their experiences in the Cambodian jungles, they were taken immediately to Government House. They had accomplished such a satisfactory piece of work for the French territorial government, they were immediately asked to take on another mission, en route back across the Pacific to San Francisco and home. This mission had to do with flying a special French-type army plane from Saigon to Australia, where it was to be torn down and shipped by boat to France. Had you ever flown this type plane before, Captain Friday? Well, something pretty similar. It wasn't entirely familiar, but with Skip acting as mechanic and co-pilot, I was pretty confident. Isn't that right, Skip? Why, sure. More than a plane that bothered me. I hated like the deuce to separate from the rest of the car party. <laughs> Business before pleasure. Oh, sure, I know. But I got pretty fond of Professor LeBron and Perry Mills. Hmm. Now, how about Celia? <laughs> <laughs> Doggone right. And here Perry and Patricia went and got married in Saigon, and we hardly had a chance to kiss the bride. Boy, we would go on another harebrained mission. Well, Perry and Patricia and Professor Lebrun and Celia are well out to sea by now on a luxury liner for San Francisco. Yeah, and look at where we are. Where Captain Friday and Skip Turner are is another matter entirely. Yesterday afternoon, they took off from the Saigon Airport. Out over the China Sea and the Indian Ocean they flew. Into the night. Through oriental moonlight and white clouds which stood up on end like mountains and skyscrapers and giant pillars. And when the dawn came, these massive towers of white clouds turned rose and pink and flame color and lit up the sky so that the flyers felt as though they were driving through a sky on fire. And then, as full day came, the vastness of the ocean expanse spread out below them. From horizon to horizon, nothing but the dirty blue of the ocean below and the haze blue of the heat-tinted atmosphere around them. And then it happened. Engine trouble. And when the motors conked out completely, the sound of wind in the struts and against the fuselage, and on the wings was all the sound there was, and the falling craft gathered steam. And it was then the skip turner caught sight of a tiny island, hardly bigger than a pocket handkerchief, looming ahead of them right into the wind. With every ounce of skill, Captain Friday kept the plane under control, heading him for the small place of refuge. further to the good fortune of landing safely, there was a sandy beach, and the first waves took the plane and ran it up on the sand like a toy in a bathtub. Ooh-wee! Man, oh man, did you see what happened to us? Yeah, you can be glad you're not feeding the fishes at this very moment. Whew. Amen, brother, amen. You didn't get hurt in that bouncing around. Huh, not a scratch. You? Nope. Well, Chief, let's get out and see the country. Get this strap unfastened. 
I don't think the plane's been hurt any. Well, go on, man, the engines. What you suppose happened? Uh, there. Will the door open? Oh. Yeah. I ain't jammed a bit. Good, get out, Skip. Yeah. Hey, are you coming? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, listen to that bird. Sounds like San Diego on a bright June night. I don't see any ha- signs of habitation anywhere around. Mm-hmm. Can't tell what's up in that jungle stuff away from the beach. That's a pretty rugged country. Volcanic. Yeah, probably caves and stuff up in there. You know, we was lucky to find a sandy beach. Well, let's have a look. Got your packet of special rations? <laughs> yes, sir. Including six bars of chocolate. There we go, then. Hey, what about the plane, Captain? Shouldn't we ought to give it to once over and see whether we're stuck here for good? Well, that'll have to come later, Skip. The first thing is to see if we're in any danger from the natives. Yeah, if there is any. Looks like a deserted hunk of volcano to me. Yeah, guess we'll have to wade through this grass for a little. Yeah. Hey, where are we aiming for? I thought if we could climb up on that high ground, we might get a survey of the whole place. <laughs> we might at that. Whole place ain't two miles across in any direction, look like from the air. Okay, here's where we start the climb. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to get out of that grass. There's one thing I hate. It's the snakes and bugs and stuff down in this part of the world. Oh, a lot of sharp lava. Edges like a razor. Got to pull yourself up in some of these places. You make it? Yeah. Come on up. Okay. Is that sun boring? If we can skirt the edge of that next pinnacle, it should be easier going to the left here. It looks like the minute we get up on the next level, we're going to be in a tangle of jungle. Don't worry about that when we get up there. Notice how the island seems to be built up in tiers. First the beach level, and this level we're on. Then up above the jungle level. Yeah. They ain't seen nothing that looks like human life yet. For any natives, it would be pretty shy of two white men. Especially coming down out of the sky as we just did. Mm hmm. Uh oh. What do we do now? We run into a blank wall, all right. Oh, it's ten foot if it's an inch and straight up. And no place to go except turn back. Skip, do you think you could boost me up? Maybe if I could get my fingers over the edge, I could scramble up. Sure, but how do I get up? Well, let's figure that when I make it up. Okay. Climb up on my shoulders. Hey, but for God's sakes, keep them hobnails out of my ribs. Here I go. Hey, I'm taking my skin off. Oh, still up. Oh, still, he says. Are you making it? Yeah. There, I got my fingers over the edge. Now you can reach up and push my feet up when I heave. Well, right, I can try. Here you go. You make it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. Okay, now what about me? Wait, just a minute. Be with you in just a minute. And hey, what's up there, anyway? I haven't had much of a chance to look around. Yeah. There. Hey, you got your pants off. That's right. I'll brace myself up here and throw the legs of my pants over the edge. Grab a hold and scramble up. <laughs> and put up a fair leg off. <laughs> For your own good, you better not. <laughs> okay, let's go. Yeah, here I come. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like I'm over smoking. Up with you. Yeah. There. Yeah. 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 Excuse me while I put my trousers back on. Well, will you look around us? Hey, this ain't the kind of a jungle I thought we'd find up here. Yeah, yeah. yeah it looks interesting, though. Hey, that's beautiful. Kind of rolling meadow with green grass and vines and a lot of palm trees. Okay, let's go and investigate. Yeah. That's more like a park. And we'll keep heading for high ground, huh? Yeah. I'd like to get a picture of the whole island if I can. Hey, look, as soon as we get back from the rock ledge, the ground's as black and fertile as a California meadow. Oh, look there. Yeah, they're rabbits. <laughs> Looks like a cross between a rabbit and a kangaroo. It's just the size of a rabbit. Hey, hey, there's some more of them. Hey, this place is alive with them. We won't starve here, that's one thing. Hey, let's cut across to that high spot. Yeah. Hey, this is kind of interesting, you know. I didn't know there was any South Sea Islands right there. You want to stay here and homestead it? <laughs> the heck with that. Too far to the nearest drugstore. Okay, here we are. Yep. Yeah. And there's your whole island laying out before you. Hello. The island seems to be divided into two parts. Look at that ravine down below us. Yeah. Seems to have two humps like the back of a camel. Yeah. 
We're standing on one hump and across the ravine at the other. Well, that water down there in that ravine? I mean, it looks like a creek, all right. If there's a freshwater stream on the island, we're more than in luck. Hey, you talk as if you didn't think we was going to be able to get that airship off the beach. Well, that remains to be seen. Hey, Captain. Captain, look down yonder in the water. Where? Where that palm tree down by the creek. It's a girl. Skip, I think you're right. Why, of course I'm right. A white girl using the old swimming hole as sure as I'm a foot high. She's a white girl, all right. How far away do you imagine she is? A couple hundred yards on a straight line, I reckon. Probably half a mile away we'd have to travel to get out of where she is. Well... What are we waiting for? <laughs> yeah, man. Now, what in the blazes is the white girl doing alone on this desert island? She might be a Polynesian. Oh, but their skins ain't pure white. They're kind of brownish. You could see for yourself, this girl's skin was white as milk. It actually gleamed in the sunshine. Hey, look, you can still see it. <laughs> You're not going poetic on me, are you, Skip? Oh, I know, but something like this don't happen to a man every day. <sighs> yeah. We're going to have to skirt around the brow of the hill for a ways. Oh, but we'll lose sight of her. So we we'll lose sight of her. She can't keep out of our way for very long on an island no bigger than a pocket handkerchief. Uh, just a minute, Chief. Well? Uh, looky, um, maybe you should stay here and uh, kind of keep her in view while I... Hey, 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 what kind of double talk's that? Well, I was just thinking. Well, I know what you're thinking. Come on, we go down together. Well, it was an idea. <laughs> I'll say it was. We get around the brow of this hill and... Hey! Get up there, Skip. Huh? Well, I'll be a son of a gun. Shipwreck. You see, it is a white girl. Shipwrecked and moon on this island. Probably for months and months. Yeah. That craft's been piled up on the beach there for six months anyway, looks like. Yeah, but where's the rest? The captain and crew and the rest. Probably weren't over five or six of the crew. Yeah? Uh-huh. Looks like a small luxury schooner. Millionaire's yacht, huh? Could be. Well, anyway, that explains the girl. Come on, let's get down to it. We don't want to rush in on her. Probably scare her to death. Don't be silly. She'll be so glad to see white folks again. She'll probably throw her arms around our necks and hug us to death. <laughs> Skip the romanticist. Well, why shouldn't she? After all, if I hadn't seen a white girl for six months, I'd know how I'd feel. Do you think she's going to feel any different? Well, as to that, Skip. Hey, that was a rifle. Oh, there, Skip. <clears throat> hey, they were shooting at us. I could hear the bullets just <laughs> Why that little white-skinned female shooting at her rescuer? That wasn't the girl, Skip. The shots came from behind us. Here are Captain Bart Friday and Skip Turner marooned on a desert island in the South Pacific when their army plane in which they were flying between Saigon, French Indochina, and Australia conked out on them. They landed the plane safely with hopes of repairing the motors, but at the moment are exploring their island refuge. At the foot of the hummock on which they have been standing, they see a freshwater stream, and in the stream, a white girl bathing. They are just making their way down to this amazing vision when two rifle bullets sing over their heads. The shots have come from behind them, and just now, the two are wriggling on elbows and stomachs through the long grass for safety in the ravine below. Keep down and keep coming, Skip. Honest to my grandma, I never felt so sorry for a snake in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine having to go around on your belly all your life. Hold it just a minute. Yeah. I need a breather. Hey, you have eluded the guy with the nervous trigger finger or else he's stalking us. Waiting to get a really good beat on us. Well, that's a comforting thought. Well, another ten feet and we can drop down behind those rocks in the ravine. You think that makes me mad? Them shots probably scared heck out of the gal who saw him bathing. Where will she be now? Probably jumped into her clothes and beat it for home. Home? Well, whatever she calls home these days. Yeah, and if she hides out on us, it'll take us maybe days to make contact. It's not the angle that bothers me. Yeah? We now know that there are other people on this island besides the girl. Hey, I hadn't thought of that. What I want to know is why one of them wanted to shoot at us. <laughs> well, maybe he and the gal are here all alone. He wants to keep it that way. On the other hand, if he's been marooned on this island for six months, he'd welcome a rescue party with wide open arms. Even with a beautiful gal all to herself? Even with ten beautiful girls all to himself. I don't believe it. Well, come on. Let's get down to the rocks. Okay. Watch the way I wiggle my hips as I slither through the grass. <clears throat> Uh, 
Okay, hold it. Hey, Captain, you can hear the creek. Listen. Oh, don't that sound cool and refreshing? Yeah. Right over the edge. I'll drop down under the gravel. Then when I see everything is all clear, I'll give you the high sign. Okay. I'll have my gun all set to back you up if there's any trouble. Check. Here I go. There. Hey, Skip. Okay, Chief. All clear. Come on down. Yeah. Oh, man, oh, man, does that water look good. Hey, how about us falling on our faces and having a drink, huh? Undoubtedly spring water. Go ahead. Yeah, man. I never tasted anything so good. Yeah. All right, isn't it? Yeah. Now then, what? Let's follow down this creek to where we saw the girl in bathing. Yeah, maybe we can pick up a trail again, even if she has disappeared. Come on, then. Hard walking on these rocks. Yeah. Like walking on marbles and billiard balls. And you can't be very far from the big swimming hole. I've got it spotted, right? It should be around the next turn in the ravine. Mm-hmm. The water's getting a little deeper along here. Just hold it, Skip. What's the matter? Crouch down along the edge of the bank. Get down low. Hey, what's going on? Somebody's standing on the bank right above us. Oh, oh quiet. Listen. Oh, sorry. Is that you, Gracie? Gracie? Huh? Shh, quiet. It's all right, Gracie. I'm all alone. You don't need to be afraid of me, you know. You know that, Gracie. You know that I... Oh, somebody shot him. Quick, Skip. Let me put him out of the creek before he drowns. Yeah. Stop with him. Easy. Oh, wait. Wait, Skip. Hot gun. Never mind. Drop him back in the water. Hey. Drop him back. He's dead. Look at the back of his head. Oh. Oh, yeah. Now listen. Somebody's coming along the bank. The killer? Come on. Get back under the bank. Half low. <sighs> Hold it. Hold it. I just made it. Yeah. He's looking down at the body. <laughs> My fine young cousin, you have come to a very bad end, a very bad end. Just like I told you, you would. Hey, how about throwing a gun on that guy? Quiet, Skip. Oh, it is too hot to dig for you again this afternoon. But tonight you shall have one. See? The senorita must not see like this, no. But tonight you shall have a grave. But now, oh, I shall have my siesta. Mm. What is this, senor captain? <laughs> Adios. I love you, sir. Well, how do you like him, Apple? Oh, a very cheerful killer. <laughs> Doggone pirate. Pirate? Certainly a pirate. Didn't you see that bandana tied around his head when he peered over the bank? Yeah. I suppose he was a member of that yacht's crew before it went aground. Oh, I'm sure. 20th century pirate if I ever saw one. Hey, what do you suppose he killed a sidekick for? I could give a good guess. Gracie? Oh, looks like it to me. Captain, he sneaked off to hold rendezvous with Gracie, and our pirate friend followed after him. When he made sure Captain was trying to get the inside track on the girlfriend, he up and blew the back of his head off. Well, that's one way of getting rid of rival. So what does that make Gracie? I don't know. Shall we go and find out? Yeah, let's. Okay. Keep him close to the bank, then, in case there are any more jealous Romeos in this place. Some sand to walk on. Yeah. And it's wet, so it won't make a sound. Uh-huh. Uh-uh. There's the pool where Gracie was bathing. Hey, pretty, huh? Nice pool. You could want. You know, we should ought to pull Cotton out of the creek. Seems too bad to let him contaminate a pool like this. I didn't dare. Cotton's body disappears. The pirate's gonna know something's wrong. Well, I just think Gracie buried it or somebody else. Besides, what hurt if it does get uneasy? I ask if there are a couple of things that keep gnawing at my mind. Such as? Those two shots that were fired at us. Oh, were they really meant for us? It was the pirate firing at Cockney. Cockney? 
they were meant for Cockney, but it looks like nobody knows yet that we've landed on the island. Hey, how could they miss the airplane coming down? Well, the engines were dead. They just barely glided up to the beach. Unless somebody happened to be looking up, they'd never known we were even in the sky. Okay, so nobody knows we're on the island. What about it? In that case, nobody wants to kill us. Those shots were meant for Cockney. <laughs> well, I like it that way better. I never did hanker to have somebody itching to bump me. Huh? What you looking for? Look here, Skip. You find something? Yeah. Barefoot prints of a girl's foot in the sand. Yeah, I'm pointing in that direction. Yeah. There's a sort of path away from the pool up through the palm trees. Yes, sir. As neat as though she'd put up a signboard. Well, lead on, Chief. these palm trees for shelter as much as possible. Mm, just in case of the power, huh? Yeah. We're right up ahead. The jungle looks like a thickened up a bit. We're climbing up toward the brow of the second hump, if you notice. Yeah. Currently, Gracie doesn't wear shoes anymore. Lots of tracks of a girl's bare feet. All the same, girl? Seem to be. See, the jungle's beginning to close in around us. Path's still good. She must make a practice of bathing down at the pool. Yeah. Oh, boy, that shade feels good. I never did see such a sun as they have down in this part of the world. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Jungle closed in over the top of us like a tent. Hey, hold it. Hmm? What happened? Listen. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. It's a parrot, Skip. A parrot? Yahoo! 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 Fifteen men are dead men killed. It looks like Gracie's got a parrot to keep her company over on this side of the island. Help! Help! Mayor, please! Go find the I'll say this for him. He's the loudest parrot I ever heard. Well, he's my parrot. Hey. You heard me. He's my parrot, so what about it? I don't see you. No, of course you don't see me. You see her, Captain? I oh, know. She's hidden somewhere off the path in the jungle. There's no use you looking for me. You'll never find me. Here, Gracie! Here, Gracie! Here, Gracie! Polly, shut up that noise. <laughs> um, you must be Gracie. And if I am, so what? Come on out of hiding and let's talk. Oh, no, you don't. Don't what? What do you mean? I don't take no chances with men. Not on this desert island, I don't. But we've just arrived. I know that. I saw your airplane drop out of the sky. Well, then why weren't you down at the beach to meet it? Not me. I'll watch out for myself, I do. Besides, the way you were falling, I thought sure you'd be smashed to bits. Oh, no, not us. Well, it makes no matter. The same rule applies to you two gents, which applies to them that's on the other side of the island. And, um, what rules are those? This off of the island belongs to me. Oh? Yes. When you came to the ravine and waded across the creek, you came on my side of the island. Hey, you mean that hill over yonder belongs to the men, and this hill belongs just to you? That's just what I said, isn't it? I don't get it. I'm a good girl, I am, and I'm a fighter. And when that saving yacht over yonder went on the rocks, I was the only girl left alive. I took things in my own hands. Yeah, and you sound like you were just the gal could do it, too. And so I am. How many were on the yacht before it was wrecked? The master and the missus and a crew of seven. And what about you? I was the missus' ladies' mate. And a very good ladies' mate I am, too. Mm. That makes ten on the yacht. How many landed safely on the beach? Four of us. You and Cockney and the pirate and one other, huh? The pirate? Sure, the Spanish baby with a turban. Oh, that would be Manuel. Hmm, Manuel the pirate. And who was the fourth? He was the captain of the yacht. He was killed two days after we landed. And I'll bet it was uh, Nicola was Manuel the pirate who done it, too. It was him and Cockney together. Why? It was over me. Hey, you must have some. Oh, you have me moments if I do say so myself. <laughs> well, come on. Climb out of the bushes and let's have a look at it. Oh, no, you don't. Is that why you divided the island in two parts and why you keep to yourself over here? It is. When I see the way the men were killing each other with me to go to the winner, I just made up my own rules and got me a gun and a box of cartridges to back me up. Hey, you ain't poking a gun through the bushes at us right now, are you? Make a move in the wrong direction and see what happens. Do you know something, Gracie? So you're getting mighty familiar with the use of a girl's name, if I might say so. Oh, no kidding, Gracie. You're what I'd call a woman with an iron willpower. Sure, Gracie. Sure, Gracie. Sure, Gracie. 
What about that parrot we keep hearing? He's my pal, yes. My pal and my watchdog. Ain't no anybody able to come within a mile of us without Belshazzar letting me know. <laughs> Belshazzar, huh? Oh. So that's how you knew we were coming up the path, huh? That's it. Every time Manuela Cockney tries to come over here... Oh, uh, by the way, you're not going to have to worry about Cockney anymore. What are you talking about? Manuel just shot him. Oh, no. Yeah. We saw him do it. Then none of us is safe on this island. With nobody to stop Manuel, he'll have his old by the heel before morning. <laughs> Desert Island with a Cockney girl and Manuel the Pirate, Captain Friday and Skip Turner face one of the most amazing adventures of their lives in the second episode of The Girl on Shipwreck Island, which is entitled The Pirate is a Fighting Man. Listen next week to another in this fascinating series of Adventures by Morse. Shipwreck Island, featuring Captain Friday. You like high adventure? Come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Six months ago, when the ocean-going yacht Carlotta went ashore on a two-by-four South Sea Island during a typhoon, only four persons got to the beach alive. They included the captain of the craft, two able seamen, Cockney and Manuel, and an English lady's maid named Gracie. My mistress had a neck broken when the master of the ship came down in the storm, and my master was washed overboard trying to save her body from the storm. It was a bloody mess, and how I came through it alive, I'll never know. But there I was, ashore on a desert island, along with three sailors, none of whom I'd ever spoke a word to in my life before. That is, except the captain, to whom I'd said yes, sir, and no, sir. But the captain didn't last long. The second night ashore, Cockney and Manuel set on him and cut him to ribbons in a nice fight. That was enough for me. I took a gun and some cartridges in my poor pair of Belshazzar and set up housekeeping on the far end of the island in a bit of a cave. And for six months, Gracie protected herself against Cockney and Manuel, living off the berries and fruit and small bird and animal life of the island. And then Captain Friday and Skip Turner, earlier this afternoon came fluttering down out of the sky in a French army plane whose engines had conked out. Yeah, we were en route from French Indochina to Australia, flying over the Dutch East Indies and a lot of the China Sea. Well out over the South China Sea, something in the mechanical department went haywire, and we had to make an emergency landing. Fortunately, we were in the vicinity of a minute atoll with a sandy beach. We landed without doing the ship any damage. Before beginning our repair job, we surveyed the tiny island and... That's when we discovered the setup here. Tell them about it, Skip. Yeah. Well, when we arrived, there was three people on the island besides ourselves. Cockney, Manuel the Pirate, and the Babe Gracie. It, oh, yeah, and uh, Belle Shazza the Parrot. But uh, before we'd been here an hour, we saw Manuel the Pirate stalk Cockney to the edge of the swimming hole and shoot him in the back. It was because Cockney was trying to get friendly with Gracie behind the pirate's back. So now there's only Manuel and Gracie on the island. That is, except for Cap Friday and me. And both Gracie and Manuel the Pirate are very skittish specimens of the human species. With the exception of the moment when they saw Manuel kill Cockney, they have not laid eyes on the swarthy pirate-looking figure with the turban about his head. They haven't seen Gracie at all. They've talked to her, but she's kept hidden back in the jungle. She's a girl all alone in this little isolated world, and she doesn't trust anything masculine. And now at 7 o'clock in the afternoon... Captain Friday and Skip are up to their ears in piston rings, spark plugs, and engine oil as they attempt to adjust their motors for the remainder of the trip to Australia. Boy, talk about rebuilding a motor the hard way. Yeah. That sun's smacking me on the back of the neck like a baseball bat. Okay, 
I guess you can screw that head down again. Yeah. You think we found the trouble? Well, we found one of the troubles. <laughs> How a gas line on an airplane can get stopped up, I don't know. Uh, screw down hard? Yeah. Won't get any oil leak there. Well, I'd say we were all set to take off then. Okay. How about trying the motors? I'd like to, but I don't want to take the chance. Well, hey, we can't take off without tuning the motors. We'll have to tune them at the last minute. I don't get it. You heard what Gracie said. Oh, you mean about the pirate being a desperate character? Look, why did he and Cockney kill the captain? Fight over Gracie. Hmm. Then why did he kill Cockney? Over Gracie. Okay. You think for one minute he's going to let you and me fly off with Gracie if he can help us? You, you mean we're taking Gracie with us? We're not leaving her here for that ape. Oh, I get it, and the pirate knows it. So the minute he thinks we got this airplane fixed to fly again, the real slaughter begins. Right. Not only does he want to keep Gracie, but he doesn't want us to get back to civilization and report him. Remember, he's a two-time killer, and he's stuck here until the authorities come and get him. Mm. So what are we going to do? Now, when it gets dark, we're going back in the jungles where we met Gracie before. We're going to talk fast and get her to come down to the plane with us. Once we get her inside, we'll turn over the motors, adjust them if they need it, and get the heck out of here before Manuel the pirate knows what's going on. Uh, does Gracie know she's going on an airplane ride? Not yet. Well, she's awful skittish. I don't think she'll come. She's got to come. We have to hog tire. Yeah, well, remember, she's got a gun, and she's been fighting off Cockney and the pirate for six months. We'll have to sneak up on her if she won't trust us. I don't intend to stay here forever, and I don't intend to leave her behind. <laughs> Kidnap her for her own good, huh? She'll see reason when we explain what we're up to. Well, maybe. Uh, what time is it now? Well, after seven. <laughs> As dark as the inside of your hat band in another three quarters of an hour. So what do we do until dark? Well, first climb up and close the cabin door and lock it. Yeah. You got everything you want out of the cabin? Yeah. Okay, here she goes, Ed. And that's that. Hey, you think we can take off on this beach in the dark? How can I miss? Got a half mile straight beach. Wind's been blowing in the right direction all afternoon. Now, still, it's going to be awful dark. Well, maybe there'll be moon and stars. Well, that'll be your worry, Chief. I'll just shut my eyes and hope you don't run into the China Sea. <laughs> Come on. Hmm? Where are we going? Got to get back up on the plateau before dark. Find the path in the jungle where we talked with Gracie. And supposing a pirate's hiding along the path and lets us have both barrels. We've got to be too smart for him. <laughs> That's what Cockney said. Look at him. Fly bait. Okay, okay. You get killed, I'll see you get buried, won't I? He you know, Chief, sometimes you're an awful comfort to me. And then sometimes you give me goose pimples up and down my spine. Well, it's dark enough to suit anybody's taste now. Yeah, the sun skidded out of the sky like it had stepped on a banana peel. This seems to be the path. Come on. Hey, you think we'll ever be able to find our way back to the plane? Well, we know it's downhill in that direction. Yeah, and plenty of places to break your neck in between. Oh, quit worrying. Hey, you know something that's funny to me? What's that? Why we haven't had trouble with the pilot so far? He's probably laying low, watching to see what we intend to do. After all, we're two to his one. You know? Yeah, but he could have stood up here on the plateau and popped us off while we was working on a plane down on the beach this afternoon. Couldn't have been sure of hitting us at the distance. All he'd done was put us on the warpath. Oh, okay. Skip, where are you? Hey, Captain Flag. I'm in the bottom of the well. Are you hurt? Well, I'm scared. And where do I turn a flashlight down on you? Yeah. Uh, hello. Hey, what kind of a doggone setup is this, anyway? You've fallen into a trap. I'll well, say I have. A man trap. And I've got a couple of skin shins that somebody's going to pay for, too. Apparently, this hole was covered up with grass and leaves and used to trap animals in. Maybe for food. Hey, you mean animals are fool enough to fall down in a hole and break their silly neck? Well, you fell in, didn't you? Okay, okay. You gonna stand there talking or you gonna reach down a hand and haul me out of here? Sure. I'll get down to my knees and reach down. Now then, reach up as far as you can. Yeah. Just reach your hand. Yeah. Okay. Up you come. Yeah. Oh. Uh. Woo. Yeah, there, there. Now, who do you suppose set that trap? And why didn't you fall into it? You was ahead of me. Look, trap's right on the edge of the path. I was walking right down the middle. Apparently, you got too close to the edge. Some of the pirates work. What do you bet? Uh, maybe. Well, come on. 
next time keep in the past. Yeah. Pardon me if I limp. Sure, go ahead. Limp. But keep close behind. We get ourselves in the doggone this mess. Hey, listen. You're home. You're home. You're home. Bell Shazer. <laughs> doggone talking parrot. Gracie said the parrot always warned her when anyone came near. So we must be getting close. Here, Gracie. Here, Gracie. Here, Gracie. <laughs> Makes Gracie sound like a lost puppy dog. Yeah, listen. You're home. You're home. You're home. Fifteen men in a dead man's dish. Uh, fly flew east and fly flew west. Uh, you're home. You're home. You're home. I never heard that version before. Get the fellow to Mike. Shut up. Huh? What's the matter? Somebody's in the jungle alongside the path. Just ahead of us. You sure? Either a person or an animal. Yeah. I'll just easy my gun around where it's handy. Don't do any shooting without knowing what you're shooting at. Yeah. I don't hear anything up ahead. Something's there, lying and waiting. Why don't you say something to it? I have the pirate open up at this range with his rifle. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Listen, kid. Yeah. Get down and lie flat. Keep your gun handy. Go try something? Yeah. Mm. Okay, I'm down. I'm on my stomach right beside you. If anyone fires now, it'll probably be over our head. Okay, shoot. Hello up there. I know you're up there, so there's no use pretending you're not. Then it's you, Captain Friday. Huh. Oh. Oh, Gracie. I thought it was the pirate. Who? Manuel, the pirate. And I thought you were Manuel. You seen anything of him? Yes, he's on the prowl. Off by the bed, Tom, keeping out of his way all afternoon. You know where he is now? No. Now that night has set in, I've lost him. Is the other one with you, too? Are you talking about me? Keep your voice down, Skip. Oh, yeah. Uh, sure, Gracie, I'm here. I had a talk with Manuel once this afternoon. What kind of talk? He don't ask you people being on the island. I don't suppose he does. No. He says he went to the trouble of killing the captain of the yacht. And then this afternoon he killed Cockney. Hey, he come right out and admitted it? He did. He said just when he thought he had me all to himself, I propped you two. Yeah. And so now he has to kill you two. Well, why didn't he try it this afternoon while we were working on the plane? Because I didn't let him. How did you stop him? I kept close to him. I kept making him think he just about had me cornered. I kept his mind away from you two. You must be a pretty tricky babe in the jungle to play hide and seek like that. I can take care of myself. Hey, look, Gracie. How would you like to get out of this? Meaning what? We got the plane so it'll run again. We can take off any time we like. So what? We want you to come with us. Oh, no, you don't. But look, Gracie. No, sir. Gracie, don't put herself in the hands of a couple of strangers like that. Not great. But all we want to do is to get you off this island and away from Manuel. Fly her to Australia so you can get back home. How do I know that? You'll have to take us on faith. When I ever take a man on faith again, there'll be two moons in the sky. And I mean blue moons made of cheese. Hey, keep talking to her, Captain. Skip, come back here. What did you say? I said you're acting like a little fool. We want to help you. Skip, you crazy fool. Come back. You want to get off this island, don't you? When the ship comes along and gets me in. Well, this is off the beaten lanes of ocean traffic, you know. It might be years. Oh, no! Uh, I got her, Bill. Oh, you to me, you flip. Oh, I got her. On the lonely little atoll in the China Sea, Manuel the pirate has killed two men so that he may have the girl Gracie all to himself. And then Captain Friday and Skip drop down in their disabled plane to complicate matters. Now the plane is mended. And Captain Friday wants to take Gracie off the island with them. But not if Manuel can prevent it. Also, not if Gracie can prevent it. Because she doesn't trust any man. In the darkness on the jungle trail, Captain Friday kept Gracie's attention while Skip slipped into the jungle and grabbed the girl from behind. If she won't leave with them of her own free will, then they intend taking her by force. <laughs> Stop it, stop it, do you hear? You're the worst of the lot. We're not going to hurt you. Throwing a girl down the dock and sitting on her. Eh, what are you doing? Tying your hands behind you. You can't do that, please. Hang on to her, Skip. She's as strong as a box full of tiger cats. Uh, there. Shall I let her up? No? 
keep sitting on her until I tie her feet. I've never been treated like this in all my born days. Well, it's what you get for being so skittish. If you trusted us and come out in the open, we wouldn't have had to do this. I suppose you wouldn't show a young lady no mercy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Cedar tied. Expect the worst, do you, Gracie? I know no reason to expect anything better. Hey, Chief, turn your flash on unless he's what we got, huh? Don't want too much light around here. Liable to attack the pirate. I hope he does come too and butchers the both of you. What, would you tie it up and help us where you are? Shame on you, Gracie. So what's the matter? Why don't you turn on a flash? I dropped it. Oh, so, here it is. Okay, click it on. There. Hey. Well, how do you do? If it isn't Miss Dorothy Lamour herself. Just because I'm reduced to wearing a sarong out here in the island, there's no reason for calling me Dorothy Lamour. Well, what's wrong with Dorothy Lamour, for guys? Well, I ain't her, is all I'm saying. You're a very good-looking young woman, Gracie. And supposing I am? It's only a danger and hindrance to me out here away from civilization. Don't put clothes on my back, no food in my mouth. You say you're reduced to wearing a sarong. Well, where are the clothes you were wearing when you came ashore? I was asleep in my nightgown. When the ship struck, all I had in my mind was to get on deck. Once up there, I was washed overboard. When I woke up, I was lying on the beach. And the birds were singing, and it was as nice a day as the body could hope for. So you made your nightgown into a sarong, huh? What else could a lady do? Well, you did yourself proud of the ask me. That also explains why you have no shoes or stockings. Well, that was the worst part of all, learning to walk barefoot. Well, you seem to be doing all right now. Oh, yes. Now my feet are toughened up. I can hop about the jungle with the best of them. Yeah. Hey, why'd you turn off the flashlight? You've seen enough. Besides, we're getting Gracie down the plane and getting out of here. You ain't fooling the poor girl. Is that why you sit on me like a pack of wolves and tie me up just to rescue me? Well, sure. You've got to learn to trust folks, Gracie. I come of age the hard way. All my life, a girl's had to watch out for herself. It was there against the world, and always it's been a man's world. Well, for once in your life, you've got somebody on your side. Well, maybe I have a you do begin to act like a pair of gents. Well, we've stood here talking too much as it is. Skip, you want to scout the trail ahead while I carry Gracie? I do not. I want to carry Gracie while you scout the trail ahead. We've got some pretty rugged terrain to cross getting down to the beach. Well, with Dorothy Lamour and my arms, I'll just float down. But why shouldn't a girl walk on her own two feet? Will you come willingly? What's a girl got to lose? Now that I'm beginning to trust No, I, I don't go for that, Captain Friday. I think I ought to carry Gracie. Cut it out, Skip. Now look, Gracie, if I untie your feet, will you come along with us without any trouble? I will, and gladly. It's a deal. Untie your feet, Skip. <laughs> In moving pictures, the hero always gets a chance to carry the heroine. Skip. And, yeah, okay, okay, I'm untying her, ain't I? Well, hurry up and don't talk so much. Is his name Skip? Uh-huh. Skip Turner. And who are you, please? Bart Friday. Captain Bart Friday. Okay, Captain Bart Friday, then. Okay, Gracie, your feet are untied. But my hands. Your hands stay tied. But if we trust each other... When we get on the plane, we'll untie your hands. For the present, they stay tied behind you. Here, get up on your feet. Uh, oh, yeah. Hey, Captain, even with just the moonlight, she looks like something out of a South Sea moon picture. Hair down her back, just the right amount of sarong. All right, Romeo, let's go. You bring up the rear. Gracie, you walk between us. I'll keep an eye open ahead. Now that the moon has come up, be careful. Huh? Careful of what? You forgot Manuel is stalking this island. Hey, that's right. The pirate does want our scalps at that. All right. Here we go. Don't fall behind, Skip. <laughs> I'm right on Grace's heels. Honest to goodness, don't the sharp stones and briars and stuff hurt your bare feet? Oh, not at all. I don't know whether I'm ever going to be able to put shoes on again. Yeah, and I bet you're going to miss the old swimming hole down in the ravine, too. Oh, uh... You saw me down there? Yeah, that was our first peek at you. Of course, we were so far off, about all we could tell was that she was a white girl. Yes, I will, Mr. Swimming. As a matter of fact, I've got to like my island quite a bit. Except for Manuel, the pirate. Well, after all, it's a nice knowing there was a man on the island. I thought you'd been fighting him off for six months. And so I have. And I would have shot him down like a dog if he bothered me. But still and all, it was comforting, knowing that there was a man about <laughs> You're a queer one, Gracie. Well, after all, when you're living in the wilderness, you just just about forget everything you learned in civilization. Nothing seems to apply, if you know it, Army. I think I do. Okay, now, we're coming out of the jungle. The path gets pretty rugged. You're going to have to keep low so as not to show up against the skyline. 
Skip, you're not going to have to help. You're going to have to help Gracie with her hands tied behind her. Skip, are you paying attention? Hey, Skip. That's queer. Didn't you know he wasn't right behind you? But I thought he was. Well, he's not. That's queer. It's not queer at all. He was bringing up the rear, and like as not, the pirate slipped up behind him and knocked him over the head. Si. That is right, Capitan. What's that? It's my way. Si. I did slip up behind him where he skipped turn and tapped him on the skull. <laughs> it was so simple. If you've killed Skip Turner... Oh, no, 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 no. That I have not done. Yet. What do you mean, yet? But just what he sound like. This friend of yours is not dead because I need him as a hostage. Hostage? Si. You have in your possession something which belongs to me. I, therefore, have in my possession something which belongs to you. I don't get it. Perhaps the senor do not wish to get it. What have I that belongs to you? <laughs> this so beautiful senorita. Hey. See, see, but of course. For six months I have been on this shipwreck island with Gracie. During this time I have killed two men because of her. If that does not give a man false rights to a woman, but, you, but please tell me, I'm, what does? I'm a free girl and I belong to no man. <laughs> But naturally, that is what the senorita is supposed to say. I know you killed the ship's captain, and I know you killed Cockney, but if you think that entitled you to any special favor... Oh, senorita, how many men would you have me kill before I may win your favor? What's killing got to do with love? Uh, it is always that way in nature. The strongest male kills the weaker males, and then he becomes the one whom the female loves. Well, nature can take that sort of business and go jump in the lake with it. You see, Manuel? See what, Capitan? Gracie doesn't agree that she belongs to you. Therefore, I don't have anything of yours. <laughs> so? Yes, so. You'd better turn over Skip to me and be glad we don't nail your skin to a tree before we leave this island. Oh, so you expect to leave this island? Any minute now. <laughs> well, I will tell you this, senor. Unless you turn over to me the senorita whom you have in your possession... Your friend Skip Turner will never leave here alive. And uh, I think that goes for you also, Captain Friday. Look, Manuel, I'll make a deal with you. Uh, deal? Yeah. Why didn't I think of it before? You want to get off this lonely, out-of-the-way island, don't you? Oh, see, si. Naturally, I hope not to spend all my life here. Okay. Come on and join us. No, no. Uh, how do you mean... Join with you. We were going to take Gracie out. We've got room for you, too. You you are speaking of the airship on the beach? That's it. We had engine trouble, but we've got that fixed up. So bring along Skip, and we'll all four be away from here in a half hour. <laughs> Senor, but that is the most handsome offer I have had the pleasure of receiving in my whole life. Can you accept? No. But Manuel... No. Doesn't make sense. Why not? Why not? I am two-time killer. Confess with my own lips. Besides, this Gracie saw me kill the captain. And Gracie told me that you and this kid person, who is my prisoner, saw me kill Cockney. Well, what of it? Well, the minute you arrive in Australia, you tell the, the stories to the authorities. Uh, and what become of poor Manuel? Oh, nonsense. Why should he Hang by the neck until he is dead. That is what happened to poor Manuel. <sighs> Gracie, talk to him. Tell him you'll keep your mouth shut. But I will not. Yeah, see, the senorita is the truthful one. You mean you wouldn't give Manuel a break even to save your own honor? Perhaps your own life? If you take Manuel back to Australia with us, I'll point him out as a murderer to the very first policeman. You haven't got any more sense. So you see, Captain Friday, the, the best thing for you to do is to give the senorita to me. When you have done this, I will return Skip Turner to you. How does that appeal to you, Gracie? You wouldn't do that to a poor girl. Turn her over to a dirty, killing sea pirate. That's just what I ought to do. Now you are talking sense. Give Gracie and you two fly away about your own business. And what about after they fly away, Manuel? And uh, what about it, Senorita? There's something else you haven't thought about. Once they're away, what's to prevent them from reporting to the barbers that you're a killer and you're on this island? See. Si. See, that could happen. Well, they can turn back and get you at their leisure. Because how can you possibly get off? Ah, I see. They must not be allowed to leave. Say, what is this anyway? Whose side are you on, Gracie? They must not be allowed to leave. Uh, they must be kids. See? And their airplane burns. Gracie! Ah, 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 
somebody prying up near my cave. What's that? Impossible, Senorita. Yes, there is. That's the signal the parrot always gives when somebody comes near. It's my warning. But we three and Skip are the only ones on the island. Have you really got Skip there with you, Manuel? See, si, I have him tied to a tree. Besides, he's unconscious. And there's somebody else on this island. Manuel, maybe you didn't kill Cockney after all. <laughs> Can a man walk about with the back of his head blown away? Perhaps it's his ghost walking. Senorita, do not say such a thing. Ah, ah, one, two, three, hold. Ah, ah. Somebody, somebody prowling around the mouth of my cave in the jungle. to be only four living persons and a parrot on Shipwreck Island. Then who is the fifth shadow prowling near Gracie's cave? The third episode of The Girl on Shipwreck Island is entitled, There is More About Gracie Than Meets the Eye, and will come to you next week at the same hour. You are listening to another in the series of Adventures by Morse. Cosmy Morse presents The Girl on Shipwreck Island Featuring Captain Friday If you like high adventure, come with me If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me If you like blood and thunder Come with me Captain Bart Friday and Skip Turner, flying from French Indochina to Australia, made a forced landing on a tiny island in the South China Sea when their engines conked out. They arrived on this tiny atoll just in time to witness murder. They saw a cockney sailor creeping through the undergrowth and softly called out the name of a girl, Gracie. Then they heard a rifle shot and saw a cockney fall, an ugly bullet hole in the back of his head. Then they saw a swaggering Spanish pirate, his head tied up in a bandana, come out of hiding and bend over his victim, quite pleased with himself. All this on an island which was supposedly uninhabited. And what of this girl Gracie, Captain Friday? Gracie was one of four persons washed ashore in a hurricane when a private yacht wrecked itself on the outer reef of the island. She's an English cockney girl and was ladies' maid aboard the yacht. Washed up on the beach with her was the captain and two sailors... Spanish Manuel, alias the Pirate, and Cockney. The captain was murdered two days after the landing, and we saw Cockney finished off this afternoon. And now Manuel had Gracie all to himself, or so he thought. But that was before our engines went bad and we came down on the beach. It didn't take us no time to tune up the engines again once we set out on the sand. Yes, Skip, go ahead. Tell him. Well, matter of fact, if it wasn't that we insisted on getting Gracie out of the pirate's clutches and taking her along with us, we'd have been off Shipwreck Island and on our way to Australia by this time. But Gracie's afraid of men. All men. So she wouldn't trust us? <laughs> yeah. So we had to wait till it was dark and catch her unawares and tie her up. <laughs> Man, did she ever put up a fight. Yes, Gracie put up a fight. And then things got complicated all of a sudden. Captain Friday and Skip... We're taking Gracie from the plateau down to the plain where it rested on the sand. Captain Friday in front, Skip bringing up the rear. Then suddenly, Skip wasn't there anymore. Instead of Skip, there was Manuel, the pirate, lurking just out of range in the darkness. And he had Skip prisoner. He offered to make a deal. You will turn over to me the girl Gracie, and I will turn over to you your friend Skip Turner. No. But this is fair thing to ask. <laughs> You better do it, because if you do not, I will cut your friend Skip Turner's throat from ear to ear. And that will not be happy time for your friend Skip Turner. And it was while Captain Friday stood in the midst of this quandary, trying to make up his mind whether to sacrifice the girl Gracie or his sidekick Skip, or whether maybe there wasn't another way out, that Belshazzar, the parrot, 
began to squawk in the distance. Uh, uh, advance to be recognized. Uh, one, two, three, hold. Uh, uh, here, Gracie. Here, Gracie. You hear that? Gracie. You hear that? Bill Jars are warning me. What do you mean, warning you? Someone's prowling in the dark about my cave up there in the jungle. Here, Gracie. Here, Gracie. Here, Gracie. You hear that? Uh, uh, Somebody's up there. Manuel. See, I am here. You still got Skip Turner? Oh, see, he is tied to a tree. I bang him on the head and he is unconscious. Uh, what is the matter with the parrot? Gracie says somebody's prowling in the dark near her cave. Oh, but that cannot be. We are all here. I don't care if we are all here. But Bill Shaw's a close to me like that. It means somebody's prowling. Yo-ho! Yo-ho! Fifteen men of a dead man's chest. Here, Gracie! Here, Gracie! Here, Gracie. You hear that? He's gone back into the cave to hide. He always hides when strangers come near. Doesn't make sense, Gracie. You and I and Skip and Manuel are the only living people on the island. I don't care nothing about that. I know what I know, and when Bill Charles warns me, it means something. It's crazy. Unless Manuel is lying to me about having Skip a prisoner. Hey, Manuel, are you lying to me? But why should I lie to you? What I want to know is, if you have Skip Turner tied up, then who's up prowling around Gracie's cave? Mm, that is what I wonder also, senor. Well, there's somebody up there. If there is anyone prowling this night, then it must be the ghost of the captain or the sailor Cockney. Your conscience bothering you? <laughs> Senor, that is something I pride myself on. I have no conscience. And there's something I pride myself on. I don't believe in ghosts. Senor, you do not know what you are saying. Well, ghosts or no ghosts, I'm in favor of getting off this island as fast as possible. And I'm making you a proposition, Manuel. See, si, I am listening. There's room in the plane for four of us. You throw in with Skip and Gracie and me. We'll take you off the island and get you out of this place. <laughs> Oh, no, senor. And turn me over to the police for murder. I guarantee we won't. You release Skip and come along, and we'll make a special landing any place you say. On some other island or on the mainland, just as you choose. You you guarantee this thing, Captain Friday? Word of honor. We'll give you every break. Mm -hmm. That is good enough for Manuel, senor. You better be careful. What do you mean? If you trust Manuel one inch, you're a bigger fool than I thought you were. Senor, I am waiting. I have got... Skip Turner loose from the tree where I have tied him. If he tried the double cross, that's his hard luck. Come on. Ah, here you come. I thought perhaps you had thought better of your bargain. I don't make a deal I'm not prepared to keep. Oh, the senorita. Turn that flashlight out of my face. And I warn you, Manuel, one move out of you and I'll shoot you without blinking a blooming eyelash. Captain Friday let you carry a gun? I thought you was his prisoner. I am not his prisoner. As you can very well see, my hands are released and he has returned my gun. Ah, I see. I but, can't see that. Well, turn that blinking torch out of my face. Turn the flashlight over this way, Manuel, so I can get a better look at Skip. See? But I did not hit him too hard. He should not be unconscious all this time. Well, he still is. You're going to have to help me carry him down to the beach. Captain Friday, I don't trust Manuel. Oh. What was that? Did you hit Gracie in the dark? Do not move, Captain Friday. Do not move a muscle because you are outlined in the moonlight. And I will kill you if you do. Me, you cannot see. <laughs> I am in the shadow. Then you did strike down Gracie. See, si. You should not have given back her gun. A senorita is a dangerous animal with a gun. What's the idea? What's this all about? <laughs> Senor, you did not think for one minute I would trust myself in your hands. If you don't know the truth when you hear it... No, no, I trust no man. There is no such thing as truth. Well, the worse for you, then. No, Senor. The was for you and for your friends, Skip Turner. Maybe. See, si. For now I have you where I want you. It is so simple to do what is necessary. We offer you rescue and freedom... In return, you offer us death. <laughs> See, it is so. Why? You take such pleasure in killing your fellow men? No, no, it is not that. Well, for the love of Pete, what is it? With you and Skip Turner gone, then Gracie and I will have this island all to ourselves. Yeah? See. What about that somebody or something that's prowling up around Gracie's cave? Mm, that I do not believe. But you said yourself... See? When I am making big deal with you, I say one thing. When you are in my power, <laughs> I say something else. That's great. No, no. I do not think there is anyone on this island except the four of us. 
And in ten minutes, there will be only two of us. <laughs> the senorita and I. Okay, Manuel. But Gracie swears the parrot always acts the way it did when there's prowlers. Oh, senor, a parrot can make a mistake. Human beings make the mistake. Why should not a parrot be allowed a mistake also? I think you're crazy. Eh, what difference does it make? Crazy or not crazy, you will be just as dead. Okay. Shoot and get it over with. Uh, senor, you prefer to be shot in the front or in the back? What difference does it make? Um, I, I do not know. Some people have... Fear. Oh, shoot it and get it over with. Si, sí, senor. I do not wish to keep the senor in suspense. But don't worry. It will be over quickly. Right in the heart, senor. It will be over quickly. One. Two. Manuel. Manuel. Where's that flashlight? Here it is, Captain. Skip. You're conscious? Well, I think so. Here's the flashlight you was looking for. Huh. Dead as a mackerel. <sighs> that was a good shot from where you were lying, Skip. Hey, I didn't kill him. You didn't? Heck, fine, no. I thought you pulled a fast one. He was right on me. I couldn't move a muscle. Hey, where's Gracie? Hey, maybe she'd come too and crawl around. No. Oh, no, here she is. Still knocked out. Well, you didn't kill him. Gracie didn't kill him, and I didn't kill him. And who the heck did? Looks like Gracie was right. Huh? About what? There's somebody else on the island. Hey, she knew it all the time? Well, you were knocked out. The parrot bell shizer began acting up. Gracie said he always did it when somebody was prowling around her cave. Yeah, but I thought there was only you and Gracie and the pirate and me. Well, looks like reinforcements have landed. Reinforcements for who? Looks like our side. Hey, it does at that. Mowing down Banwell here just as he was about to make cat meat out of you. What do you think we ought to do now? Well, we can either pick up Gracie and hit for the beach, get the plane in the air... Or we can go back up to Gracie's cave and try to thank our rescuer. It'd be kind of a dirty trick to just run off and leave a guy behind who saved your life. You feel that way, do you? Why, sure. How about you? The same. Well, then, we're heading back up through the jungle to Gracie's cave, huh? We are. You want to carry Gracie, or... Of course I want to carry Gracie. I ain't had a gal's head resting on my shoulder. And you ain't going to begin now. Hey, Gracie, are you all right? Ooh. I've got a headache big enough for everybody. Well, then, naturally, I'll carry you. You'll do no such thing. i got my two feet. As long as I have, I'll walk on them. Yeah, let me help you up. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, Ooh what hit me? Manuel, the pirate did. Why, oh, that double crossing over. Here, pick her up, Skip. She's not able to walk. You bet you. Up you come. Here now. Now, just take it easy, Gracie. You don't feel like wrestling. Oh, I doubt it, Dad. Come on. I'm as dizzy as a bumblebee. I told you not to trust Manuel. What did you escape? Escape my eye. He's dead. Dead? Manuel's dead? As a stinking fish. Yeah, where are you taking me? Back to your cave in the jungles. But I thought you were taking me on the airplane. That'll come later, when we discover who killed Manuel. Who killed... But didn't you do it? Nope. It skipped, didn't it? Not me, Hey, your hair smells good. Never mind my hair. What I want to know is who killed Manuel. Well, however, it was prowling around your cave earlier. That's Shaza. The parrot warned me. Didn't I tell you? Yeah, but who is he? I don't know. Well, whoever he is, is a good shot. Got Manuel right through the heart. But why are you going back to my cave? To say thank you to the mystery man. And get a bullet through your own heart? Yeah? That's what you two are heading for. A bullet through your heart. <laughs> This tiny, isolated atoll in the midst of the South China Sea should be called Dead Men's Island instead of Shipwreck Island. The captain of the yacht is dead, Cockney is dead, and now Manuel the pirate is dead. And somewhere abroad on this two-by-four coral strand is a phantom figure moving in stealth and in darkness. Who is it? That's why Captain Friday and Skip insist on returning to Gracie's cave. They want to know... And they're returning against Gracie's vehement protests. You're doing yourself an arm coming back like this. You're doing yourself an arm and you'll get no thanks for it. Oh, don't you get it, Gracie? Somebody done us a good deed. Shot the pirate and saved our lives. Well, you can't just up and fly away from a deserted island and leave a friend behind. He ain't no friend of yours. What did you say, Gracie? I said he ain't no friend of yours and you'll save yourself a heap of trouble if you go away from this island. Now, just a minute. 
Now, let's get to the bottom of this. Bottom of what? Who isn't a friend of ours? Whoever shot Manuel. He'll do the same by you. You say that as though you know what you're talking about. Of course I know what I'm talking about. Of course I know. And this phantom person isn't a phantom at all. I mean, as far as you're concerned. I never said that. You the same, Miss Serta. I never did. Why, sure you Hold did. it, Skip. Excuse me. Now, look, Gracie. There is somebody on this island you know about, isn't there? There's been somebody on the island all the time. Somebody from the wreck yacht. That's a lie. Is it? You heard me say so. But I don't believe you. I was washed ashore in the storm. The captain was washed ashore and so was Cockney and Manuel. And that's all? And that's all. Well, except for Belshazzar, my friend the parrot. Okay, come on. Yeah. Now, just a minute. Take her arm, Skip. Yeah, come on, Grace. Don't take hold of me. Don't drop me up. Hey, what you scared about? Do you know what's good for you? Don't lay an hand on me. I don't get this. Do you, Cap? No, but I'm beginning to get ideas. Look, I'm telling you for your own good. You treated me like a pair of gents, and I don't want to see you get hurt. What's that mean? The cave where I've been living for the last six months is just up ahead. I can't keep you from going there, but if you do, you won't leave this island alive. Hey, now you got my appetite all whetted up. Don't be a fool. Go away while you can. Go down to the beach and get in your plane before it's too late. Will you come with us? I can't. I can't. Don't you understand? Even if I wanted to, I wouldn't be allowed. What's to prevent you? How can you stand there arguing with a girl when your very lives are in danger? Look, well, Gracie, you don't think we'd go off and leave a pretty gal in trouble? I'm in no trouble. I agree with you. No use arguing. Come on. Oh, you fools. You're a pair of fools. That's the mouth of the cave right up ahead, isn't it? Yes, that's it. You don't need to be so unhappy, Gracie. Captain Friday and I can take care of ourselves. Hey! Run for it. The mouth of the cave. <laughs> Inside. That's it. Made it. Made it all right. Hey, that rifle bullet went by my ear like a bumblebee in a fruit jar. Well, now, maybe you believe me. About what? That you're dead men. Hey, I don't feel dead. There you are. Dead men. Both of you. Gracie. Well? Where's Belshazzar? With the parrot? Yes, the parrot. Where is he? Well, how should I know? About somewhere, I suppose. You said he always squawked when strangers came near the cave. We're strangers. Why didn't he squawk? He's a temperamental parrot. And you also said he hid himself at the back of the cave here when strangers got too near. And so he does. Well, let's get him. I'd like to look at him. Well, maybe he ain't there. Maybe he's out in the jungle. Why would he be out there? Well, Beth Charles has been making eyes at a cop or two out in the jungle lately. He's probably out there sitting with her in the moonlight. In other words, Gracie, there is no parrot. Hey, Chief. You heard him with your own ears, didn't you? I heard something you say was a parrot. Sounded like a parrot to me, Cap. Maybe. Maybe it sounded like a human being trying to sound like a parrot. That's a lie. Okay. Get Belshazzar the parrot and prove it to me. If Manuel or Cockney or the captain was alive, they'd tell you there was two a parrot. Belshazzar belonged to the galley cook on the yacht. Everybody on the yacht knew about Belshazzar. He was the life of the party he was before the shipwreck. How did you happen to get him after the wreck? I found him washed ashore. His feather was wet and he was shivering like a leaf. I picked him up in my arms and dried him and brought him to my cave here. He was that grateful he wouldn't leave me afterwards. Why don't we go to the back of the cave and have a look? He might be there. Why is there all fired interested in a parrot? Do you mind coming back with me? It's the only thing that'll make you happy. Skip, you stay here. Watch the entrance. While you and Gracie look for Bell Shares, huh? Yeah. Keep an eye open. I don't want anyone sneaking in behind us while we're back there. Sure. Shall we go, Gracie? I've given you all the warning I'm going to. From now on, you'll just have to do the best that you can. <laughs> just listen at her. As though me and Captain Friday could... Hey. Hey, out there, outside the cave. No use giving me that silent treatment. I've seen your shadow when you moved behind that tree yonder. Then you have seen the shadow of your own doom, which is close upon you. Hey, a doggone oriental. Oriental is a general term which covers... Many races and creeds and facial and mental characteristics. You sound like a dad brain professor. I am a student by avocation. My profession is a culinary art practice aboard seagoing vessels. In other words, you're a sea cook by trade. If you wish. Hey, then you must be the cook aboard the yacht that Gracie was telling us about. The girl tells you about me? Yeah, that she was the owner of the parrot, Belshazzar, on the yacht. Oh, what else? Did he say? Well, that's all. 
Hey, look at what you hiding out on us for. We owe you a lot for shooting the parrot at a kind of a critical time in our lives. Come on out and shake hands with a man that wants to thank you. Do not be a fool. Huh? What's that mean? I did not kill Manuel to save you. I killed him because he struck the girl. Oh, oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Oh, so that's what Gracie meant when she warned us not to grab a hold of her or rough her up. You was watching us, huh? I was watching. Well, what the heck you want to kill us for? If you've been watching, you know doggone well we don't mean Gracie no harm. You are trying to take her from this island. Well, sure, but we'll take you, too. We'll be glad to take you. No. What you mean, no? You don't want to stay here forever, do you? With the girl? Yes. Hey, look, you mean you'd be willing to spend the rest of your life out here, isolated from the rest of the world, if we'll just go away and leave you and Gracie alone? It would be a pleasure. It would be something beyond words to express. <laughs> I'm afraid I'd get kind of tired of even Salome and the Queen of Sheba rolled into one after six months or a year. That is the Western mind. The poetic mind of the East knows how to make happiness last forever. And so you're going to kill Captain Friday and me so you and Gracie can have everlasting happiness, huh? It is so written. Well, somebody wrote wrong, brother, and he better dig himself up an eraser and rub it out. That is foolish, childish talk. And besides, what about Gracie? What does she say about all this? Woman is musical instrument ready to respond to those who know how to play upon her. A woman is happy anywhere if placed in the hands of one who is a master of such matters. Just as the violin plays as sweetly in a drawing room or in the darkness of a cold cellar, if it is in a master's hands. Well, that's quite a speech, Professor. But I'd still like to know what Gracie would say with her own lips. Where is she? She and Captain Friday are at the back of the cave looking for the parrot. Parrot? Oh, there is no parrot. Huh? But Gracie said you had one on the ship. On the yacht, yes. But Belgezard was drowned. It was I who imitated the parrot. But what for? To protect Gracie from the Cockney and Manuel. I watched him in the jungle, and whenever they decided to try to catch Gracie, I would cry out like the parrot used to do on the yacht. Thus, she was able to hide in the jungle. Well, just the same. Captain Friday and Gracie are in the back of the cave looking for the parrot Belshazzar. And I wish they'd get back here. It's just as I told you, Bill Charles is out in the moonlight with the cockatoo. Gracie, did anyone ever tell you you couldn't lie worth a plug nickel? Is that any way to talk to a girl? Look here, in the back of the cave. Where did these sea chests come from? Sea chests? Yes, you know what a sea chest is, don't you? Look, three, four, five of them. They came off the wrecked yacht. They were washed up on the beach at night. Hmm. I suppose you put them on your back and lugged them up here to the cave. And supposing I did... I'm a strong girl. Baloney. What's in them? Food supplies. A hundred, hundred and fifty pounds apiece. I know that. And you know as well as I do that the phantom who killed Manuel carried these up here. You and whoever he is have been working some kind of deal together. That's and... not true. Not a blinking word of it is true. Ah! Oh, what was that? Gun battle. Skip's in trouble. Come on. I heard someone scream. I'll say you did. Skip! Skip, are you all right? Hi, Jeff. Come see what I got. You hear that? What has he done? What has he done? Yeah, I am. Hey, did you hear that gun battle? Boy, it was hot and heavy for a minute. What have you done? What have you done? Well, come on out here and I'll show you. Here's your bell, Shaz of the parrot. Oh. Dead on a mackerel. Chad. Chad, what have they done? What happened, Skip? Who is he? This guy was a crook on the yard. He's the one who's been imitating the parrot. Oh. He told you that? Sure, told me all about it. And then he sneaked in and tried to kill me. Almost did, too, but I got a couple of shots in where they did a job. Come on, Gracie, get up on your feet. It's cruel. Cruel, that's what it is. Up you come. Were you in love with him? No. But he was the best friend a girl ever had. I found him washed up on the beach after the storm. I took care of him. He was in love with you? I don't believe it. He was just grateful for the way I saved him. Uh-uh, he was in love. He wanted to keep just you and him on this island forever. He was devoted. He protected me from the other men. He never tried to take advantage of me because I was a girl. Sounds like a decent gent. And all because I nursed him back when he nearly drowned on the beach. Well, he was out to get Captain Friday and me. He said so. I told you that. That's why I wanted you to go away without me. Hey, you wanted to stay here forever with him? No, but I didn't want him killed either. And I didn't want either of you killed. Well, 
Any way we can give him a decent burial. Yeah. Dig a grave, and then let's get off this crazy place. You got your belt fastened, Gracie? It's fastened. Shut the door and lock it, Skip. Door secure. Turn him over, Captain. Okay, here goes. How they acting, Chief? Purring like a tiger cat. Well then, let's go. Hang on, Gracie. I oh, am yeah, with every bit of me. All aboard for Australia, Honolulu, and San Francisco. Give her the gun, Captain. Open your eyes now. <laughs> she held her breath and gritted her teeth and kept her eyes shut all during the takeoff. Well, a girl never knows what might happen to her up in an airplane. Hey, y'all, look at down there. There goes Shipwreck Island. Oh, it wasn't such a bad place. Not bad at all. It's just that men can't keep from killing each other when a girl's around. <laughs> what happened to the girl on Shipwreck Island. From Australia, Captain Friday and Skip returned to San Francisco, and when you next hear from them, they will undoubtedly be up to their necks in high adventure, intrigue, and more blood and thunder. You have been listening to Adventures by Morse. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. Frank Sinatra, transcribed as Rocky Fortune. Friends ask me, Rocky, why can't you hold a job? That's a good question. And I don't know the answer. Maybe I just get restless or something. Anyway, whatever it is, me and steady employment don't get along. Now, you take the last job I had, steward on a big luxury liner from Bermuda to New York. I figured I'd like to see the ocean, you know? And a couple of guys were trying to help me, too. Only they wanted me to see it the hard way, from the bottom. Pardon me, Miss Nightingale. This is sick bay, isn't it? Yes. Something wrong? My heart is going pitter pat. I beg your pardon. Nothing, blue eyes. I'm the steward from A deck. I came for the pills. Pills? The Germamine for Lady Joop Snoot. You know, the Duchess in A7. Oh, you mean Lady Harkness. Yeah. Anything you say. Oh, you'll have to wait a moment for Dr. Harper. He'll be back. Mm, that's too bad. Is something wrong, Mr. Uh... Fortune. Rocky Fortune. No, why? Oh, uh... You keep staring and winking. Oh, I, uh, I've got something in my eye. I'm just trying to wink it out. Well, you better let me take a look. Yeah. Oh, just sit down there in the light. How's this? And now, uh, lean closer. Hmm, like this? A little closer. Does this make it? That's too close. Now, which eye is bothering you? Right now, both. Try the left one. Open wide. Ah. Your eyes, I mean. Oh. Ah. Don't be fresh. Don't be so beautiful. 
I don't see a thing. I do. Please, Mr. Fortune, you're not cooperating. I don't even know your name. My name is Helen Travers, R.N. For real nice? For registered nurse. Yeah. Now, about the eye, do you mind if I wash it out? Honey, you can do anything you want. Would you like to take out my tonsils or saw me in half? Anything, just name it. <laughs> you're impossible. Hold still. There. Ow! That's for being so fresh. Something wrong, Miss Travis? Oh, hello, Doctor. Uh, the steward would like some Dramamine. Oh, seasick? You don't look well. Hmm. I haven't looked well since I was nine. It's for a passenger in A7. A7? That's Lady Harkness, isn't it? That's right. I'm afraid I can't give you any more. Well, what's wrong, Doc? The chief steward was up less than an hour ago to get some Dramamine for Lady Harkness. Stuff isn't candy, you know. The chief? He just sent me up. There must be some confusion here. I think you'd better check. All right, Doc. Sorry. Not at all. It was a pleasure. I hope your eye improves. Yeah, the wash seemed to help it a little bit. Say, maybe I could come back later on for another eyeful. Hmm? I'm afraid my boyfriend wouldn't approve. Anybody I know? Yes. Yes, the chief steward. Goodbye, Mr. Fortune. <laughs> I walk out on deck, still thinking about Helen Travis R.N., which stands for registered knockout, and leg it down to A deck. I get my hand on the doorknob of A7 when I hear something which ain't exactly music. <laughs> Lady Harkness! Lady Harkness! Open up! Open up! When nothing happens, I put my shoulder against the door and heave. When nothing happens, I try the knob. And it opens. I practically fall into the cabin, which is dark in the inside of a coal miner's boot. The reason I fall is quite simple. Lady Harkness is stretched out on the broad loom like a dead lizard. I take one look and reach for the phone. Give me the ship's doctor, honey. Hurry. Hello, Doc. This is Rocky Fortune. I'm in cabin A7, and the place looks like Act 2 of Arsenic and Old Lace. You better get down here before... Oop. has been hiding behind the door when I come in. I never know what hits me. The top of my head exploded and the floor kept coming up to meet me. Only it took a long time to fall and I must have had some crazy dreams on the way down. Rocky! Huh? What? Up here, on this cloud. Well, Helen, how'd you get away up there? I flew. Come on up. F how? Fly. Are you kidding? Try it. You can fly. Spread your wings. Holy mackerel, I got wings. Flap harder. I can't make it. Maybe I've been grounded. Try again. That's it. Flap harder. I'm off the ground. Hey. Hey, I'm falling. Helen. Helen, I'm falling. Helen. I'm falling. Helen. Take it easy, Rocky. My wing, I can't fly. Well, who can? Come on, snap out of it. I... Hey, where am I? In sick bay. What happened? My arm... Your arm is in a cast. How come? You must have fallen and sprained it. Dr. Harper told me to put a temporary cast on it, just in case it's badly hurt. Gee, it feels like lead. What hit me? I don't know. We found you stretched out on the floor of Lady Harkness' cabin. Well, how's the patient? I'll say, you look awful. We've been through that already. Oh. Uh, how do you feel? Uh, arm hurt. Not bad. Yeah, let's have a look, huh? Well, it's a nice job, Miss Travis. Thank you, Doctor. Oh, Fortune, if you can make it, the captain would like to see you. What's on his mind? Well, I don't know for sure, Mr. Fortune, but I guess it's the $50,000 worth of jewelry that was stolen from Lady Harkness. I staggered down to the old man's cabin, feeling like somebody left me in one of those fancy washing machines with the dial set on rinse dry. When I get there, the reception committee included Lady Harkness, who is about 60, wears a tweed suit, and talks like an English Tallulah. The chief steward, who looks like a clothing dummy, and the old man. 350 pounds of human meanness. Close the door, steward. Aye. I believe you know Lady Harkness. Aye, aye. And the chief steward. We've had the pleasure. Sit down. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you? Um, is this the man you saw, Lady Harkness? Young man, 
Would you mind bending over? Me? You! Hop to it! Okay, but what for? Well, you see, it was dark and I'd been asleep. When I opened my eyes, I only saw this strange man leaning over me. I screamed and he put a pillow or something over my face before I could get a good look at him. Is this the man? Well, it might be, Captain. All right, Fulton. Straighten up. Do you mind if I sit down, Captain? I've had a hard tap on the skull. You will remain standing in the presence of a ship's officer. Thanks. No insolence. Excuse it. Now, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Fortune, there is $50,000 worth of jewelry missing from this cabin. I don't suppose you'd like to confess. Confess? Sure. I've been waiting all night to confess. You see, it was like this. Get this, Mr. Waters. Yes, sir. I crept in through the porthole, see? And Lady Harkness here was asleep. I scragged the ice. I beg your pardon. Heisted the jewels. She started to wake up, so I smothered her with kisses. <gasps> then she screamed. I saw I couldn't escape, so I called the doc on the phone. Then I carefully swallowed the jewels, hit myself on the head with a piece of stale salami, broke my own arm, and passed out. And I'd be very happy to sign a statement. That's screamingly funny, old boy. How'd you like a punch in the jaw? Just try it, Hercules. That's enough from both of you. Mr. Waters. Sir. I want Mr. Fortune's belongings searched. If you don't turn up those jewels, you have my permission to comb the entire ship from stem to stern. Yes, sir. Mr. Fortune, you may consider yourself discharged. You are confined to cruise quarters. Just a minute, Captain Bly. Uh, well? Don't you think this amateur gumshoe work ought to be left to the law? Mr. Fortune, in case you are not familiar with the maritime code, on this vessel, I am the law. <laughs> execute a very unflattering salute with my good wing and stagger back to my bunk where I fall into the sack like a dead man. Only trouble is I can't sleep. My head aches, my arm aches, and my heart aches. And about 1 a.m. after three hours of whirling like a drunken dervish, I climb out of the hammock and head for sick bay, figuring I can pick up some sleeping pills. I get to the sick bay door just in time to hear voices inside. Don't try to give me that. I tell you, it's true. Mary. I'll tell you you're a liar. Mary, please. Nobody's going to double cross me, Helen, particularly not my own girl. Mary, you've got to believe me. I'll give you one more chance to tell me the truth. But I told All you. All right, baby. You want to play rough? Larry. No? Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Am I interrupting something? Fortune, get out of here. You know, Emily Post says it ain't polite to hit a young lady unless she belts you first. Get out. You all right, Miss Travers? Yes. Please, Rocky, do as he says. Sure. Anything you say. Only before I go, Chief. Yes. Here. Rocky. Yeah, I suppose they'll hang me for mutiny now. Oh, well, it was worth it. <laughs> to my pad and spend a few more restless hours trying to figure out what goes between Larry the steward and Helen Travis. In the morning, I wake up and head back to sick bay for a checkup on the arm. Ah, how's it feel? Hurts. I think I'd better x-ray in case it's a green twig fracture instead of a sprain. Does that mean you take the cast off? No, no. We can x-ray right through the cast. I'd hate to spoil Miss Travis' beautiful work. Her beautiful work weighs about a ton. How long do I wear it, Doc? Uh, I'll let you know after the x-rays. Just step over here, please, now, place your arm right here. That's fine. You just hold that, huh? Now. Just hold steady. Ah, good, that's fine. Now, you wait here. I'll go into the dark room and develop it. Huh? Say, uh, Doc, is Miss Travers in this morning? No, no. She said she didn't feel well. Had a bad night, I expect. I expect she did. This will only take a minute or two. Just make yourself comfortable, huh? I sit down and slop my way through a couple of issues of National Geographic while the doc steps into the dark room. After a little while, I have a visitor. Ah, oh, it's you. Come on in, Chief. Looking for a little medical aid? I'm looking for Helen. Oh, that's a lovely mouse you got under your eye. Did you bump into a door? Very funny. Have a seat. The doc's in the closet developing some x-rays. Is she here? Haven't seen her. Say, they find the missing jewels yet? You know darn well they haven't found them. Did you look in the captain's cabin? 
You know, I don't trust him. He's a sneaky character. Fortune, when we get into New York tomorrow, the police are going to have a little talk with you. And frankly, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Chief, I'm going to level with you. If you were in my shoes, I'd throw him away. <laughs> What's that? It came from the dark room. Try that door there. Uh, locked. There's another door that leads to the office. <laughs> Come on. Here. <laughs> Helen. Smokes. Is he... Stone dead. Dr. Harper. Take it easy, baby. You can't do him any good now. What happened? I don't know. I came in late. I wasn't feeling too good. I remember that he wanted me to change the developing solution because... because he was going to x-ray Rocky's arm. So I went right into the dark room. First I thought I was alone. It was so dark. And then I saw him. I saw him on the floor with his scissors, and he's back. Larry, Larry, he's been murdered. Now, take it easy, honey. Come on, Chief, you better notify the skipper. We also better radio the New York Harbor Police to meet us. While the Chief Steward goes over to phone the old man, it suddenly occurs to me that I'd better have a couple of ready answers. So I go back in the little dark room to take another look at Dr. Harper and snoop a little. Just when I think I've struck oil, the skipper barges in. Fortune! Yeah? I don't want anything touched. Just window shopping, skipper. You are under arrest. What's the charge? Or don't you need one? The charge is murder. Now look, Captain. You will be placed under guard in the forward lazarette until the police board ship. Just what makes you think I slipped it to Dr. Harper? You were alone with him when the chief steward arrived. He was in the dark room. You had plenty of time to kill him and go back to the examining room. And you'll have plenty of time to pay for it, too. The rest of your life, I predict, Mr. Fortune. I got news for you, Skipper. As a fortune teller, you got a crack in your crystal ball. Lazarette is a small iron box down in the hold of the ship, just big enough for me, a couple of mice, and a few hundred feet of anchor chain. A couple of deckhands take turns guarding me, which consists of sleeping on a little cot just outside the bulkhead door. I get three square glasses of water a day and all the bread that me and the mice can eat. I am not happy. On your feet, Mr. Fortune. Well, well. And to what do I owe this pleasure? To the fact that I want to talk to you. Is that gun just a conversation piece, or do you always carry The it? captain authorized your guard to carry sidearms. I'm your guard for the next watch. Just the two of us? Just the two of us. How cozy. Get back against the wall and keep those hands above your head. Anything you say, Larry. I'm interested in what you say, Mr. Fortune. Concerning what? Concerning what happened to those jewels. How should I know? I say you've got them. You've been smoking Dramamine. I'll give you one more chance to start talking. And if I don't? I empty this gun at you. Wait a minute, Buster. That's homicide, remember? I can always say you tried to jump me. I don't get this. Is there a reward, or are you interested in those jewels for personal reasons? Just start talking. Okay, I'll talk. And make it good. I'll make it as good as I can. Is this good enough? <laughs> I had my hands up in the air, and I brought the arm with the cast down on the top of his skull as hard as I could. He went out like a wet candle, and I cracked the plaster cast right down the middle. I was still trying to figure out my next move when I discovered we were not alone. Put up your hand. Sure, it's getting to be a permanent position. Hand me that gun. Help yourself. Robbery, murder, assaulting a ship's officer. You know, Fortune, we can make trouble for you. I suspected as much. You could save yourself some heartache by confessing where you hid the jewels. Why don't you ask the guy who heisted them? I suppose you can identify him. Your chief steward, sir. <laughs> That's an interesting bit of information. Can you prove it? No. All right, Mr. Fortune. Back in the lazarette. Will you listen to what I have to say, at least? Save it for the homicide, boys. They'll be coming aboard when we reach quarantine in the morning. <laughs> So I am back in the Bastille with my rodent companions. I spend the rest of the night trying to imagine what it's going to feel like when they sit me down in a Sing Sing Chippendale with wiring by Con Edison. Trouble? You'll excuse the cliche, but it shouldn't happen to two dogs because one dog couldn't handle it all. 
Along about daybreak, I'm nervously peeling pieces of plaster off my arm when I get the shock of my life. But before I can recover, somebody arrives. All right, Fortune. On your feet. I've been on them all night. Let's go. The police cutter should be here in 15 minutes. Now, look, Captain, before the gendarmes start working me over, I think I can crack this case. Uh-huh. I'm serious. I can stop the doc's murder in just 10 minutes. Will you listen to me? No. Well, can I at least get some medical attention? What for? This cast is falling off. And I'd hate to appear in the police lineup with a crummy cast. Might look like you twisted my arm. Uh, I'm not an unduly cruel man, Fortune. Will you let the nurse take a look at him? a boy, Captain. I knew that underneath that rough exterior that beats a heart of solid stone. Ten minutes later, I am in the sick bay, feeling like an oyster which has just escaped from six months in an undersized shell and is about to be eaten alive. Rocky, I was so worried about you. Hi, baby. When the captain told me you'd broken the cast on Larry's head, I... How is he? He's sleeping it off in the captain's cabin. Let's get that new cast on your arm. How about a new arm while you're at it? Let's get the old one off. The arm or the cast? <laughs> hey, take it easy. This won't hurt. Here, I'll just tap it a few times with this mallet. Uh-huh. And there. What's the matter, honey? Matter? Oh, nothing. Don't kid me, baby. You look like you just shot six holes in a high 80s. There's nothing wrong. Suppose I tell you what's wrong. All right. The jewels are missing. What jewels? The Lady Harkness loot. The jewels you mixed into the plaster for this cast in my arm. You're crazy. I'm crazy like King Solomon. You and Larry boy heisted those jewels. Larry did the muscle work and conked me when I came into the cabin at the wrong moment. Then he got scared and passed the jewels to you. But... You knew that they'd search the ship, so you put them into that plaster cast on my arm, figuring you'd get them back after the ship made port and we were all ashore. I... That's why you were so nice and sweet to me. I was worth plenty to you. You've got it all figured out, haven't you? All figured out. I even figured out why you knocked off the good doctor. Tell me. I'd be interested to know. You didn't plan on us taking any x-rays of my arm in the cast. And you knew the x-rays would show those jewels and they would fix your cute little wagon, but good. So you knocked him off and ruined the plates. I noticed the ruined plates in the dark room. Finished? I ran out of gas. You can save your breath and just put up your hands. <laughs> you too? I'm going to need a special game warden if this keeps up. Get over there against the wall. My favorite position. All right. Where are they? Where are which? The jewels you took out of the plaster cast. That's an interesting question. I'll give you just five seconds to provide an interesting answer. I don't hear you, baby. One, I can always say you tried to escape. Such a pretty girl, too. Two, I'm ready to pull this trigger, Rocky. Young and tender. Three, I mean it. Too young to have to die. Four. In the electric chair. All right, five. Hold it. Grab her. Go. Quiet down, miss. You okay, Fortune? Okay, Skipper. Except for a slight heart attack. You heard what she said? I was listening through the portal. So what kept you? Well, I just wanted to give her enough rope to hang herself. You nearly gave her enough to include me. Oh, sorry. You know, I, I must apologize, Fortune. Mm. Until you showed me how the jewels had been hidden in your cast, I really didn't believe a word you said. Eh, forget it. I got a dishonest face. Well, naturally, if there's anything I can do to make up for it now... Just one thing, Skipper. About my job. You remember how you threatened to fire me? Yes. Well, fire one ready, Gridley, because if you don't, I quit. Tonight, NBC Radio has presented transcribed Frank Sinatra as that footloose and fancy-free young man known as Rocky Fortune. Others in the cast included Tony Barrett, Lynn Allen, Marvin Miller, Norma Varden, and Shep Mencken. Tonight's script was written by George Lefferts and Andrew C. Love directed. Eddie King speaking. Now to tell you about next week's adventure, here's Frank Sinatra as Rocky Fortune. Sometimes I don't know what this younger generation is coming to. Did I ever tell you about the 10-year-old cowboy who held up the stagecoach with a water pistol and got away with 50 grand? Of course, I thought the kid was only kidding. But as the man in the hot seat said, 
Brother, was I in for a shock. I'll tell you about it next week. See you around. Next week, then, tune in again when Frank Sinatra returns as Rocky Fortune. One of the finest things anyone can say about you is that you're a good neighbor. That spirit has been a tradition in American life all through the years. Today, in hundreds of cities, this spirit of goodwill is expressed in a different way. It's expressed in our support of the local community chest or united fund. This support is the modern way of being a good neighbor. Through your community campaign, you can make just one yearly contribution that takes care of many needs. You know that your money is collected and administered honestly and efficiently. So make sure that your campaign pledge is large enough to cover these needed services for an entire year. This is your chance to be a good neighbor. So give to your community chest or your local United Fund. Enjoy Fibber McGee and Molly tonight on the NBC Radio Network. Now, Frank Sinatra, transcribed as Rocky Fortune. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. Living Fiction. Northwestern University, in cooperation with the National Broadcasting Company, brings you a radio dramatization of a timeless story, The Man Without a Country, by Edward Everett Hale. Another in a series of living fiction. Breathe there the man with soul so dead, who never to himself hath said, This is my own, my native land, whose heart hath ne'er within him burned as home, his footsteps he hath turned. <laughs> There were few who noticed a brief announcement in the New York Herald in the summer of 1863. For one thing, there was other news. News of General Grant's victorious siege at Vicksburg. News that the armies of the North and South were marching over the dusty Pennsylvania roads leading to Gettysburg. Besides, it was an announcement of only a few lines which said, Nolan died on board the U.S. Corvette Levant. Latitude 2 degrees, 11 minutes south. Longitude 131 degrees west on the 11th of May. Philip Nolan. But I noticed the announcement that Philip Nolan was dead, that he died at sea on a ship of his nation's navy. I, Fred Ingham, noticed, because I'd served in the navy. And I'd met Philip Nolan now and again over the years, and I'd heard talk of him ever since I boarded my first ship. Sure, I remember Nolan. The Iron Mask, we used to call him. Old Plain Buttons. He was aboard my first ship. That's more than 30 years ago. 30 years? He's been at sea half a century, they tell me. He looks it all right. He's 80 years old if he's a day, I guess. Philip Nolan was 80 years old and more when he died. And he had been at sea for more than half a century. In all those lonely years, he never once stepped foot on his homeland, nor sighted her shores, nor heard her name spoken. Now at last, this strange voyage was over. This strange lifetime was ended, leaving only a ripple in the calm waters where he was buried, and leaving only his story to be told. They called him the Iron Mask because of his expressionless face. They called him Old Plain Buttons because of the uniform stripped of insignia. And they called him the man without a country because... Does Lieutenant Nolan care to make any statement regarding his loyalty to the United States? Oh, damn the United States. I wish I may never hear of the United States again.
Back in the early years of the New Republic, in the early 1800s, when young Philip Nolan rode southward from his father's Kentucky plantation in search of adventure and a career. Well, he found adventure along the Natchez Trace that followed the Mississippi River to the southwest frontier. And he found a career in the United States Army, a dashing young lieutenant who cut a handsome figure on horseback and in the ballroom. He was in New Orleans, the gay city of sunshine and laughter, when a shadow fell across the Mississippi, the shadow of Aaron Burr, who dreamed of an empire of his own. Young Philip Nolan felt honored to be asked to a party given by the very best people, and was thrilled when Aaron Burr himself took an interest in him, led him away from the others so that they might talk in private. They tell me, Lieutenant Nolan, sir, that you're one of the most brilliant officers in the West. Well, that's very kind, Mr. Burr. From what I've heard of your ability, I'm surprised to find that it's still Lieutenant Nolan. <laughs> well, you know how the Army is, sir. Advancements are slow in coming. Yes, even to the most worthy. <laughs> and back in Washington, I dare say they don't even know you exist out here. Indeed. They scarcely know this region exists for all they do about it. In fact, I sometimes wonder if these people here in the Mississippi Valley don't deserve a government of their own, a government more responsible to the people. Well, I've never thought about it, sir. Of course, there's always talk. But I've never been interested in uh, politics. If I should find my services useful in helping these good people to secure their rights, I should need the help of men as intelligent and daring as yourself. Well, I, uh, I hardly know what to say. There's no need to say anything. Only remember... There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at its flood, leads on to fortune. We must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. My friends will be in touch with you, young man. Oh, Lieutenant, wasn't it thrilling meeting Mary and Burr? I think he's just about the most distinguished man I've ever seen. He has ideas. He seems like a man who wouldn't be afraid of action. <laughs> You'd like that about him, wouldn't you? <laughs> I told him you were, <laughs> well, a little impulsive. <laughs> impulsive? You mean just because I asked you to show me the rose garden? But you asked before our introduction was even completed. Well, you accepted the suggestion, didn't you? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> Um, Mr. Burr said he liked a man who wasn't afraid to take chances. I agree with him. Besides, my father asked me to be nice to you. Your father? The governor? <laughs> I didn't think he knew I existed. After all, he's a governor of the territory, and I'm only an ordinary army lieutenant. Perhaps there are those who can judge ability and not just rank. You see, he too was interested in Aaron Burr's ideas to help the region. Just what are those ideas, I wonder? <laughs> I'm sure I wouldn't know. But Father said I might ask you to call sometime. He'd like to talk with you. Say, maybe I could explain some of my ideas about the conduct of the army here. Perhaps so. I wouldn't be surprised if General Wilkinson were there, too. The general? Is he interested in Burr's plan? Oh, everyone's interested in Aaron Burr. They say he's the kind of man who rewards those who help him. Say, you're getting mighty high, mighty lieutenant. What's all this talk about your seeing General Wilkinson? I think that may be my affair. Oh, just wondered. General sending for lieutenants? Doesn't seem much like this man's army. <laughs> Well, maybe there are going to be some changes made in this man's yeah, army. Yeah, I've heard about those changes. And not just in the army, either. Well, then maybe you know more than I do. Ah, oh, come off of it, Nolan. Everybody knows this talk. But, of course, I don't have any influential friends to give me the straight information. Oh, well, maybe that's too bad. Or maybe you like the idea of being a lieutenant all your life. Well, maybe I do. At least better than some other ideas. Well, maybe I don't. I didn't join up to sit around the barracks year in and year out. Nothing ever happens here. The government doesn't even know we exist. Well, maybe they'll find out someday. Learn to pay a little more attention to us. Well, son, when you get things reorganized, remember I knew you when you were a lieutenant just like myself. <laughs> well, you'll see when the time comes. But the time never came. For Aaron Burr was seized and accused of treason, of plotting to establish a government of his own in the Mississippi Valley. 
However, there were only rumors, whispers, and suspicions. Those in high places were slowly exonerated. But Philip Nolan was so unimportant that his trial was long postponed. When the court finally came to his case, he was treated with almost contemptuous kindness. Since there was no actual evidence, his trial might have been a mere formality, except... It seems to me that the defendant knew so little about what was going on that his testimony has scant interest. Unfortunately, perhaps, there is no law against being stupid, foolish, and impressionable. However, the defendant was also a soldier. Do you think you wore that uniform with honor, sir, the uniform of the United States? Colonel Morgan, you can look up my record as a soldier. I used to be told that it was a brilliant one. Hmm... As far as I can see, it shows that you cut a handsome figure on a horse supplied by the United States and that you look deuced attractive dancing the quadrille in a uniform supplied by the United States. I tried to do my duty, sir. Sometimes I wondered if our time wasn't being wasted. Do you feel that at all times you did fulfill your duty as a soldier and a citizen of the United States? Oh, I... I thought so. It's hard to tell now. I don't... Do you think you disgraced the uniform of the United States. At the time, I may not have been aware. I may have misunderstood. As an officer of the Army of the United States, do you care to make any statement regarding your loyalty to the United States? Oh, damn the United States. I wish I may never hear of the United States again. What did he say? What was that? He said, damn the United States. I wish I may never hear of the United States again. The traitor. Treason. Order, order, order. I declare this court temporarily adjourned. Prisoner, hear the sentence of the court. The court decides, subject to the approval of the president, that you shall have your wish fulfilled, that you shall never hear the name of the United States again. Philip Nolan, former lieutenant in the United States Army, was stripped of the insignia on his uniform and placed aboard a ship, for it was decided that his wish and his sentence might be best fulfilled at sea. The captain of the ship received instructions from the office of the Secretary of Navy, which he passed on to his officer. You will take the prisoner aboard your ship. He is to be exposed to no indignity of any kind, but under no circumstances is he ever to hear of his country or to see any information regarding it. You will especially caution all the officers under your command to take care that in the various indulgences which may be granted, this rule in which his punishment is involved shall not be broken. And so Philip Nolan stepped on shipboard for the first time. It was in 1807. He was still less than 30 years old. A tall, erect figure dressed in a regulation army uniform from which all insignia had been stripped. Now, he was present, pleasant, and friendly enough, taking his strange sentence lightly, and he got along well with the men. They were cautioned not to speak of the United States in his presence, and the books, magazines, and newspapers which he read had all references to his native country cut from their pages before they were passed into his hands. It was a long, tiresome voyage with little to do, and sometimes the men off duty gathered to take turns reading aloud from whatever books were available. At the Cape of Good Hope, someone had the good fortune to borrow a number of new English books, one of them The Lay of the Last Minstrel by Sir Walter Scott. Now, Philip Nolan, who read aloud very well, took his turn at reading one day, and those stirring rhymes of the Scotch border held us all spellbound. Say, that's not bad for poetry. That's as good as a story any day. Go ahead, Nolan. Give us some more. Well, just as soon as I wet my tongue, gentlemen. There. All right. Let's see. This is the way it goes on. Breathes there the man with soul so dead, never to himself hath said, This is my own, my native land. My own. My native land. Whose heart hath ne'er within him burned. As home his footsteps he hath turned from wandering on a foreign strand. If such there breathe, go mark him well. 
For him, no minstrel raptures well. Aye, <coughs> though his titles, proud his name. Despite these titles, power and pelf, the wretch, concentred all in... I... Here, someone else take this book. I... Well, then the devil take it. For the sea. There. I... Excuse me, gentlemen. Good day. Philip Nolan disappeared into his stateroom. And we didn't see him again for two months, for no one was allowed to visit his quarters. When we saw him again, he was older, expressionless, and kept more to himself. But even he couldn't escape the excitement on shipboard when we found we were heading for home. Matey, it'll be good to see the farm again. When I was a lad, I never thought I'd be a coaxing to bring in firewood. But I'll chop down the whole woodlot for some fried chicken and an apple pie. The wood will just be turning red and yellow when I get home. There'll be frost in the mornings. Just right for squirrel hunting. A fellow don't think of it very often. But the more you see of the world, the better you like those good old United States. Quiet. Here comes Nolan. Yeah, bite right down on the talk of home. Why can't he stay in his stateroom where he belongs? Whenever Philip Nolan appeared, conversation ceased, for all talk was about the land of which he was not to hear. More lonely than ever, he stood on deck often in the night, staring at the dark horizon beyond which lay all the things the men talked about. Beyond the horizon, smoke curled upward from the piles of burning leaves along the streets of the little New England towns. The red barns of Pennsylvania seemed almost to bulge outward as the harvest was stored. Hunters rode after the foxes along the ridges of Virginia. The rows of corn shocks stood sentinel over the golden pumpkins in the fields along the Wabash, and the baying of the hounds filled the moonlit night with music over the Kentucky hills. Even the wind seemed a whisper of home as we drew nearer. And though he walked alone, Philip Nolan stood at the rail, hour after hour, listening to the wind. But then, whatever thoughts he had behind that expressionless face were interrupted by the captain's orders. Mr. Nolan, you'll gather your belongings and personal effects and prepare to quit this ship. Tomorrow we'll meet and you'll board another vessel, an outbound vessel which you will join in her cruise. That's all, except to thank you for your conduct while you were with us. So the wind changed for Philip Nolan, became again only salt spray, bitter to the taste. Before we came within sight of shore, he watched us sail off homeward, while once again he was outward bound. Twenty times or more they transferred Nolan from one ship to another. His stateroom changed, but one day was like another, one deck like another, one sea like another. But he did remember the blue Mediterranean and the Bay of Naples, for a strange thing happened there. A dance was being held on board his ship with a company of lovely ladies and the friends of local government officials and English and American visitors. Even Nolan was invited to attend. Scarcely was the dancing become when his shipmates were startled to see him approach the most beautiful lady at the ball and to see her smile as he spoke. Laura? Laura? I mean, I mean, Miss Rutledge. Is it really you? Of course, Mr. Nolan. I haven't changed so much as to frighten you, have I? No, no, I haven't changed. I haven't changed at all. It seems I must be dreaming to meet you here. <laughs> We've been traveling this winter and we're visiting Naples at present. Oh. They told me you'd be here. I, I wondered if you'd still recognize me. Seems like a miracle. May I have the honor of a dance, Miss Rutledge? Of course, Mr. Nolan. 
It's not Miss Rutledge now, Philip. It's Mrs. Gray. Oh, I didn't know. Of course, I... Yes. It's been some years now since I've married. It wasn't long after... It seems forever, doesn't it? Yes, forever. But you're just the same. The music. So much the same. I didn't know whether I should come here or not. Whether I should see you. I'm glad you did. I can't tell you how glad, even though things have changed so much. But how is everything? Tell me everything about home. Home? Home, Mr. Norman? I thought you were the man who never wanted to hear of home again. The plantation houses of the South, the Delta Moon, and the happy laughter of the long ago faded away. There was only a ship in a strange port, a pause in a voyage to nowhere, an empty stateroom looking over waters that reflected no friendly light, and the whisper of the winds that could not be stilled. Damn the United States. I wish I may never hear of the United States again. Philip Nolan seemed even older after that. But once, when a ship on which he was sailing, one more of the many ships, ran into a fight with a foreign vessel, he suddenly appeared with a shoulder straight, his voice firm and a different look in his eyes. It was after a round shot had struck the gun crew station, killing the officers and wounding the men. Then there was a ramrod in his hand. Come on, lads. Look alive now. Hold your post. Yes, sir. Let the surgeon's men clear away the wounded. We've got the men in this gun. You hear me? Yes, sir. You there. You badly hurt. I, I don't think so, sir. Well, lend a hand with loading, then. All right, I've got her aim. Now, set her off. That's it, lads. Step lively now. We'll fire her till she melts. What's going on here? They told me this gun was out of action. Aye, sir, that's right, Captain. Well, the gun's been firing, hasn't it? Where's Mr. Harlow? He's below, sir. Been badly wounded. Then who's been firing this gun? You, Nolan. What are you doing here? Just showing them how we used to handle cannon and the artillery, sir. All ready there? Touch her off. That was a hit, Nolan. Let the artillery proceed. say the captain recommended that Nolan be pardoned because of his heroic action that day. Well, perhaps he did. But by this time, the man without a country had been forgotten. Those who had ordered his punishment were either dead or had retired from public life. And those who came into authority simply carried out the orders that had been given. The men who sailed with Nolan in later years scarcely knew his story. He became a legend and a myth rather than a living man. This tall, spare, white-haired figure, weathered by the winds of the seven seas, by the suns of every clime. His eyes had the far-off look of one who gazed at many a distant horizon, the look, the sad look of one who never glimpsed what his eyes sought for. There were those who came to know him and to love him well though there was always a barrier between them. It was just one of those, an old shipmate of mine by the name of Danforth, who wrote me when at last Philip Nolan's long voyage to nowhere drew to a close. It was written from the U.S. Corvette Levant. I tried to find the heart to tell you that it's all over with poor old Nolan. The other day the doctor called me to his stateroom, and I entered with him. This was the first time, as far as I knew, that anyone had ever been there. Nolan was lying in his bunk, and the doctor's glance confirmed what I could see. The end was not far off. Hello. Hello there. Glad you could come. You're tired. Perhaps you should rest and I'll come back. I haven't had much company here. See, you're surprised to see my cabin. Yes. I had no idea. Why? Why, it's like a shrine. The flag on the wall, 
the stars and stripes, a picture of George Washington, and a map of the United States. Yes, I drew it myself. Drew it from memory. You see, here I have a country. A country of my own. A country few have loved, perhaps, as much as I. For I've had time to think of what it means. I'm sure if they'd known, Mr. Nolan. If they'd only realized... You'd have gone free long uh, ago. No, that's not important now. Indeed, it never was. My punishment was just enough. It was only to have my wish fulfilled. But loving her so, you might have served your country better, been so much more useful. Uh, perhaps I have served her well. Better than if I had been easily pardoned. If because of me... Others realize what it means to be without a country. There's no bitterness in my heart. Each year has taught me to love my country all the more. Oh, tell me. Tell me what's happened to her. Surely there's no harm in telling me now. No. There's no harm now. Your map's a little out of date, Mr. Nolan. And there are new stars in the flag with more to come. New stars, new states. Will you, will you draw them in my map for me? Very well, Mr. Nolan, as best I can. The settlers pushed on westward, found homesteads on the prairies and the plains. They told him of the riverboats linking the New England city, of the Overland Trail and the Pony Express, of the gleaming rails burrowing through mountains and leaping across canyons to span a continent. They told him of the mines following the seams of coal deep underground, of the smoke of the iron forges promising great cities, of the cattle herds roaming the grasslands of the West, of the 49ers rushing to the gold fields of California and of immigrants from every land finding new homes and new hope in America. They told him of the strife between the North and the South, of the war between brothers, of a man named Grant who promised victory to the Union, and of Abraham Lincoln, who longed to bind the nation's wounds with charity for all and malice towards none. Look. Look in the book for me. You mean this one? That's right. The book of prayer? Read where it's marked. For ourselves and our country. For ourselves and our country. Oh, gracious God, we thank thee. Oh, gracious God, we thank thee. That notwithstanding our manifold transgressions of thy holy laws. That notwithstanding... Of manifold transgressions of thy holy laws, thou hast continued to use thy marvelous kindness. Doctor. I guess there's no need to go on. At last, he had found a home and a country. They took his Bible, and they found a slip of paper. A slip of paper on which he had written, Bury me in the sea. It has been my home, and I love it. But will not someone set up a stone for my memory, that my disgrace may not be more than I ought to bear? Say on it, in memory of Philip Nolan, lieutenant in the Army of the United States, he loved his country as no other man has loved her. But no man deserved less at her hands. So lived and died Philip Nolan, the man without a country. There is no stone for his memorial, only his story, a memorial more lasting than a monument. Whenever it is heard, let each of us remember that any man is without a country who, by his sneers or by looking backward, 
or by revealing his country's secrets to her enemy, checks for one hour the movements which lead to peace among the nations of the world, or weakens the arm of that nation in her determination to secure justice between man and man, and in general to secure the larger life of her people. The Man Without a Country by Edward Everett Hale is another in a series of living fiction presented each week by Northwestern University in cooperation with the National Broadcasting Company. The Man Without a Country was adapted for radio by Jack C. Wilson. The cast and directors were students of Northwestern University. Philip Nolan was played by Bob Reitz, Aaron Burr by Richard Swift, and Danforth by Norman Larson. Others were Al Cohn, Faith Kellogg, Ike Lacefield, Claire Nelson, Earl Bark, Robert Pitt. A narration by Lowell Harris. The assistant director was Bob Feller and the director, Stuart Mackey. The entire production was under the supervision of John Cowan. This is Hugh Downs speaking. This is the NBC Radio Network. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at ChestertonRadio.com. This is Don Hollenbeck for CBS News in Washington. It will soon be dawn this morning of March 9th, 1862, off the Atlantic coast of Hampton Roads, Virginia, 150 miles southeast of the capital. The next few moments we'll see the return of daylight to that pivotal point in the North's naval blockade of the South. And according to all experienced federal observers here in Washington, the coming moments may also see the return to Hampton Roads of the Confederate ironclad Merrimack. If the Merrimack can break out into the open sea, round Old Point at the southernmost tip of Maryland, proceed northward to attack the northern ports on the Atlantic seaboard, the most modern the most modern the most modern the most modern the most the most modern the most modern the day that will see the decisive naval battle between the North and the South, between the Federals and the Confederates. CBS takes you back 86 years to the surprise engagement that ushered in a new era of sea warfare. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there, you are there. You are there, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now, CBS News in Washington and John Hollenbeck. So heavy with foreboding and impending calamity. Here in Washington, there are grim faces at the White House, tight-lipped comment from officers at the Northern Department of the Navy. When reports first reached the Navy Department stating that the Merrimack was venturing forth out of Norfolk to challenge the Federal fleet, there were expressions of amusement and cynicism. Northern Navy officers laughingly imagined the ironclad as a humpbacked turtle grotesquely waddling her ineffective way through the rough waters. But then the Merrimack struck. Within a matter of hours, the northern sloop Cumberland was rammed and sunk. The 50-gun sailing frigate Congress was abandoned and on fire and the 40-gun steam auxiliary frigate Minnesota was aground and helpless. At twilight, the Confederate ironclad retired toward Norfolk, leaving behind the question, what can be done to prevent the Merrimack from returning and destroying the entire northern fleet? That's the situation as we see it here in Washington this morning. However, CBS correspondent John Daly is now at Hampton Roads, aboard the frigate Roanoke, the flagship of the Northern Naval Squadron, So for a report from the actual scene of the expected naval battle, we switch you to John Daly aboard the Roanoke. The Merrimack has not been sighted as yet. And here aboard the Roanoke, daylight daylight rather is beginning to streak the eastern sky, but the sea is still shrouded in a heavy, swirling mist. Somewhere out in that mist, about a mile to my right on the riprap, Federal tugs are desperately trying to release the battered Minnesota from the shoals on which she grounded yesterday. Perhaps you can hear the tug whistles in the distance. Also to my right, hidden by the mists and the angry water of the roads, lie the hulks of the Federal warships Congress and Cumberland, both of them sunk in yesterday's action. Right now, here on the Roanoke, every man jack is 
searching the curtain of mist that hangs over the sea, waiting and watching for the first sight of the Confederacy's juggernaut of destruction. The air is tense. The men seem calm and determined. There's no false optimism. The nearness of new fighting has produced a, a solemn, a quiet, well, almost a prayerful attitude among the officers and the crew. With me at our CBS microphone is Commander Prescott Singleton, one of the senior officers of the Roanoke. Commander Singleton, do you think that the Merrimack is on her way to attack the fleet again, sir? Foregone conclusion. Well, what did you think of yesterday's engagement? Well fought, I should say. Well fought indeed. Well, do you happen to know who is in command of the Merrimack, sir? Yes. Uh, Captain is Franklin Buchanan. I'm told he holds the rank of Commodore in the Southern Navy. Oh. A good man. Knew him before the war. Knew him well. Uh, shipped together, the two of us. I see, sir. I, uh, I'm rather disappointed in him, I might say. Disappointed? In what way, sir? Well, it's, it's difficult to put into words, but in the Navy, we had traditions. Very high and proud traditions, I might say. I just cannot conceive of a good Navy man scouting behind iron plates. But don't you consider the Merrimack to be a very ingenious ship of war, sir? Well, yes, but uh, it's, uh, it's not the way to fight upon the sea. It, uh, it, it's unethical. Well, might I ask um, what you would think if you were given command of an ironclad? Oh, I'd resign my commission first. Well, then you feel, Commander Singleton, that the Merrimack is not a legitimate weapon of naval warfare? Absolutely not. The introduction of new and novel methods of warfare I must treat with repugnance. Men have been fighting on the high seas for centuries, according to certain basic laws of strategy. Uh, Nelson, John Paul Jones, Drake. Uh, in short, sir, the sea is no place for experimentation. But, sir, can anything prevent the Merrimack from further ravaging the northern fleet? We will stand against her. We will fight her bravely and gallantly. Count on that. Our hopes, sir, shall rest upon the good lord, good marksmanship, and good, solid New England oak. Thank you, Commander Singleton. The mist is still very heavy hanging over the water here, and there's still no sign of the Merrimack. So this is John Daly aboard the Roanoke. Now back to CBS Washington. This is Don Hollenbeck. A moment ago, you heard Commander Singleton, one of the senior officers aboard the northern flagship Roanoke, say that he knew the name of the Confederate captain of the Merrimack, and that raises an interesting question. How much advance information did the northern department of the Navy have on the Merrimack? Quincy Howe has just come from the Department of the Navy where he talked with northern officers. Quincy, was the North aware of the fact that the South was building an ironclad? Uh, yes, Don, they were. Uh, the Navy Department in Washington, through various secret agents, has known all along that the Merrimack, uh, the South now calls her the Virginia, was being rebuilt uh, as an ironclad. You say rebuilt. The Merrimack then isn't an original construction. No, it seems not, Don. The Merrimack uh, was a wooden ship in the American Navy undergoing repairs at Norfolk Harbor uh, when the fighting began. Uh, because the federal forces couldn't uh, tow her off anywhere to safety, they scuttled her before they evacuated uh, the city of Roanoke. Then southern engineers came along, uh, raised up the burnt-out hulk, and converted uh, what used to be a graceful frigate into this present ugly, iron coated monster of, of destruction. Well, then the North knew about the Merrimack in advance and didn't do anything to counter her because they discounted her power. Is that it? Yeah, that, that's about the size of it, uh, Don. Uh, now, now, in the considered opinion of every northern naval officer whom I've talked to, there's only just one thing that can stop the Merrimack, and well, that's a miracle. There's no defense against the ironclad. The way she could withstand the concentrated fire of even the most powerful batteries that the North has to offer on land or sea, well, that's, that's shown that she can defy every weapon that the federal forces now have at their command. Uh, then the Merrimack's iron plating permits her to get close enough to any opposing ship to drive home that ram of hers with deadly effect. Well, then, as it looks now, Quincy, nothing can stop the Merrimack. What then? Uh, the answer now just seems all too clear. Uh, the Confederacy will simply have broken the northern blockade. And just think what that means. Uh, up to now, the northern blockade of the southern ports, well, that's been the Union's most effective economic weapon against the Confederacy. The Merrimack, though, now threatens to destroy that weapon, and the result will be that cotton, cotton, the money crop of the South, will again start flowing across the sea, and in exchange, of course, the South will get cargo upon cargo of badly needed guns, ammunition, food, all the essentials of war. A victory by the Merrimack uh, would be likely to increase the war-making power of the Confederacy, oh, I guess maybe ten times over. Then there's this angle. England may decide to recognize the Confederate States of America as a sovereign nation and therefore entitled to all the international privileges of a belligerent. 
Another point, Quincy. What do you think this effect will be, the effect of the Merrimack? Now, what will it have on naval strategy in this country and around the world? Well, all I can say, Don, is everywhere I went, I heard people saying things like this. The era of the wooden ship is over. Every wooden war vessel now afloat, all the way from England's great ships of the line to the lowliest little corvette of the smallest nation. They've all become obsolete. Just in one day, we've witnessed a complete revolution in maritime warfare. And no one Excuse is me, Quincy, I'm okay. sorry. A message, uh, we've just got a message from Douglas Edwards at Fortress Monroe overlooking Hampton Roads. He has with him the wife of a federal officer who's just come through the southern lines. So we take you now to Fortress Monroe and Douglas Edwards. I'm in the correspondence room at Fortress Monroe. The young woman with me is Mrs. Lucy Creighton. Where is your home, Mrs. Creighton? Providence. Uh, will you speak a little louder, please? Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, Mrs. Creighton, I know you must be very tired. You've had a long and hard journey, haven't you? Yes, I have. I've just come through the lines on a safe conduct path. I understand. But will you tell us, please, what you were doing in the South? My husband was wounded and taken prisoner at Fort Donaldson in February. It was only a month after we were married. They arranged to let me go see him. Mrs. Creighton, you were in Norfolk, Virginia last night. Uh, that's southern territory. Can you tell us, please, how the people there received the news of the Merrimack's victory yesterday? Well, they were very happy. They were shouting, dancing in the streets. They had a torchlight parade. I guess it must have been like that in every city of the South. Now, Mrs. Creighton, would you say, then, that the people of the South feel that the Merrimack is going to bring them victory in the war? Oh, yes. They were all saying that after the Merrimack thinks our fleet is going to go north and bombard Philadelphia and New York. They were sure it would do that. And they were yelling and shouting that the war would soon be over. Go on, please. When the Confederate officer who accompanied me last night took me back to the northern line... It was like riding through a carnival. When I reached the exchange point, the seven officer tipped his hat. He was very kind to me all the time, very nice. He tipped his hat and said that he was so glad the war would be over soon and we would be at peace again. There is no doubt, then, that the morale of the people of the Confederacy has been lifted tremendously by the events of the last 24 hours. Oh, I would say so, yes. All the time I was traveling in the South, I never saw anyone laugh or act like they were happy until last night in Norfolk when the news of the Merrimack came. This is Don Hollenbeck at CBS Washington. We've interrupted Doug Edwards at Fortress Monroe because the Merrimack has been sighted. The immediate target seems to be the frigate Minnesota. Ken Roberts is aboard that ship, so now to the Minnesota and Ken Roberts. The Merrimack is in sight. We can see the Merrimack. Just a few moments ago, the sun began to break through the overcast, and like a curtain rising on a stage, the mist lifted to reveal the squat and ugly form of the Merrimack, not more than a mile or two away, breasting the foam-capped water. She looks like a slanting black roof afloat in a flood. The officers here aboard the Minnesota estimate the top speed of the Merrimack to be only five knots, so it will be some time yet before the Confederate ironclad comes into cannon range. I've also learned that the Merrimack carries four guns on each planting side and one pivot gun fore and another aft, making a total of ten guns in all. The sides are sheathed in four inches of iron plate. All the Minnesota guns here are primed. The crew has been supplemented by many survivors of the Cumberland and the Congress, and directly above us we can see the big land-based guns of Fortress Monroe, also waiting for the Merrimack to come into range. The uh, tugs are still pulling at the Minnesota, trying to get her free, the officers of the Minnesota and the tugs calling to one another as they cast line, tighten and pull, then recast, tighten and pull again. Up on the bridge of the Minnesota, I can see the officers clustered together, watching the approach of the Merrimack. They're a grim, silent group. Now, as I look across the water, I can see Old Glory flying from the protruding mast of the Cumberland. Standing beside me is one of the survivors of that ill-fated ship. A young seaman taken aboard during the night after spending 14 hours clinging to a piece of wreckage. The Minnesota's commanding officer has given us permission to talk to him. What's your name, sailor? Charles Horman, seaman second class. What was it like yesterday, Charles? 
What was the feeling aboard the Cumberland when the Merrimack came up for the attack? Well, first off, we didn't think it was going to attack. We had our wash out on deck, and some of the boys were swabbing deck like as if nothing were going to happen. We didn't know. When, when did you clear for action? Well, it wasn't until almost she got into rain. Then what happened, Charles? Well, first, I don't know, but first I think the Congress started firing, and, and then we saw she was coming our way, so we began. Who was coming our way? The Merrimack. So we began firing. Did the Merrimack answer with her gun? No, sir, she didn't. It, it was the craziest thing. Listen, it was crazy. She, she didn't fire, not until she was so close we could almost reach out and touch her. That's how close I think. And, and then she let go with her bow gun. The shot went right through us, right this fore and aft. Killed some of the boys, and those who were hurt started yelling and cussing. What happened then, Charles? Well, we fired everything we had at her then. Everything, all the guns we had. And we could see our shells bouncing off the side, bouncing into the water. It was crazy, honest. And the Merrimack kept right on, coming closer and closer, and we couldn't even figure out what was happening. She just kept coming at it. And then it was like somebody or something had, had got under our ship and heaved us into the air. Into the air? Yeah. You couldn't see nothing, only hear wood breaking, and, and the other guys yelling, and we filled it over until the decks were awash. Go on, Charles. Well, when we righted, the Cumberland began to lift fast because our whole underbelly had been ripped by the ram of the Merrimack. Just a, a chunk chewed out, and the water poured in. So that was on the starboard side below deck. After that, there wasn't anything to do but jump, so I jumped. Believe me, I, I didn't even think about it. When Lieutenant Morris, who was, who was deck officer, yelled for us to jump, I just jumped and prayed. When I got in the water, there was a bunch of spar floating nearby, and I got a hold of it, and that was how I managed to save my life. Well, it wasn't the gun to the Merrimack that did the big damage then. It was the ram. It was ram. It, it was the ram. Thank you for talking with us, Charles Harmon. Now, here's another sailor from the Cumberland, but one whose experience is even more incredible, more dramatic. Your name, sailor? Cavanaugh, Jimmy Cavanaugh, desperate man. Well, every man who witnessed yesterday's engagement, Jimmy, is talking about your heroic effort to board the Merrimack. Tell us about it. Well, look, I don't know. It wasn't anything. You were aboard the Cumberland. Uh, yes, sir. Both of things. That's right. Go ahead, Jimmy. Well, uh... After we caught the broadside of the Merrimack, she came in so close that an officer on the Merrimack opened a porthole and yelled out, Surrender, Morris, or I'll sink you. That's Lieutenant Morris, deck officer of the Cumberland. Uh, yes, sir, that's right. And, and you know something? Here's something awful funny. It turns out that the officer on the Merrimack was a Lieutenant Jones who went to Annapolis without a Lieutenant Morris. Is that so? Yes, sir. Well, what did your Lieutenant Morris reply? Morris? <laughs> Morris yells back, Never, never, I'll sink first. By this time, the Merrimack was under our deck. Actually, under the deck. So I jumped on it. I had two pistols stuck in my belt, and I jumped on it. They killed so many of us, you see. My boys, they were. A hundred were dead, you see, and the others screaming and yelling. Well, I, I guess I lost my head, I guess. All I could think was that I wanted to get to that Merrimack and get even, see? For my boys to get even. Yes, go on, Jimmy. So I didn't even think, I don't know... It happened like that, see? I don't know. I jumped over on the Merrimack and tried to climb her side. Get to the gun port. Uh, somewhere where I could see inside and let him have it with my gun. That's what I wanted to do, but it was so slippery. Like our grease floor. The iron was so slippery I couldn't get a foothold or nothing. Every time I climbed up a little, I'd fall back in the water. Then I'd try again and fall back again. And all the time, the guns over my head were shooting and the bang was making me dead, so... So I, I saw it was no use, see? And then... Well, by then, the Cumberland was rammed and sinking, so I dived back in the water and held on to some wreckage, and later they picked me up. That was a very brave thing you did, Jimmy. A hundred of my kids they killed. I, I, I wanted to do something. That's all I wanted to do, you see? I know your action will be well rewarded. If I could have gotten a tow hole, you see... It was like grease. The, the sides were so slippery. I see. Thank you, Boston Bay, Jimmy Cavanaugh. And now I have another sailor, a man who was aboard the Congress, who can give us a first-hand account of what happened there. His name is Pete Finley from New York City. Yeah, I sure wish I was there again. What's your rating, Pete? Ah, rating? Me? Uh, no rating for me. I'm just a member of the Naval Brigade. Well, that's kind of like the militia, isn't it? Not regular Navy. Yeah, not regular Navy, that's right. Well, what were you doing aboard the Congress? You better ask that of Father Abraham. You mean President Lincoln? That's what I mean. It was him who put us aboard that leaky old tub. Were there many Naval Brigade men aboard your ship? Three companies. What about the regular crew? They been discharged four or five days ago. They're enlistment was up. We were put aboard to make it look like the ship was manned, I suppose. There wasn't even a single train car aboard. Can you imagine that? 
So when a man match, she lets go at us, and we see the compliment go on, so we run up the white flag. And you couldn't you... expect any different, now could you? I know. We've not been trained for fighting, if you know what I mean. Well, when it comes time, the white flag has gone up the mast, and I says to myself, I says, Petey boy, send the tank for you, and over the side I go. Over the side? Yeah, you couldn't expect no different, now could you expect different? Well, tell me, Pete, do you know when you'll get another ship? Me? Another ship? With that thing, that, that island boiler out there still wide and wild? Oh, no, sir. No part of the water for me, not for Petey Finley. The land for me, and I'll kiss it, so help me if I ever get these big feet to feel the land again, I'll... I'm yes, I'm sure you will, and thanks, Pete. Yeah, I'm glad you're sure, mister. Wish I was. Now, looking out to sea again, the Merrimack looms near us, smoke belching from her chimney, an ugly... Misshapen monster. The car is facing the face of the river. The command has just given a clear ship for action. Better hurry to get to this gun. Sorry, you have to go back. What can we say here? Oh, get the law. Yes, sir. This is Ken Roberts. I return you now to CBS Washington. This is CBS Washington. We take you now to Jackson Beck, somewhere in Hampton Roads. Come in, Jackson Beck. the young commander of this unique naval vessel, Lieutenant John L. Worden. Lieutenant Worden, suppose you answer that question for us. Just what is the monitor? Well, sir, we hope the monitor is the answer to the Northern prayers. The craft of unique design, the idea of John Erickson, the famous Swedish-American inventor. It's iron hulled, surmounted by an armored circular turret, nine feet high, 20 feet diameter, covered with eight folded layers of one-inch iron. Turret and a little pilot house that lays forward are the only deck structures, except for smokestacks and exhaust grates, which we remove before going into action. I see. Uh, what about your armament, Lieutenant Worden, or is that restricted information? No, sir, it's no secret. We carry two 11 inch carbines. Well, the reports we have of the Merrimack say she carries 10 guns. Oh, yeah, that's true, but her guns are smaller and stationary. I see. Ours are fitted into a revolving turret. We can shoot in any direction without having to maneuver into a firing position. Well, then you think the monitor is an even match for the Merrimack, Lieutenant Worden? Well, I think we're more than an even match, and we stand ready to prove it. Uh, can you tell us just how the monitor came to be here in Hampton Roads right at this crucial moment? <laughs> I guess, guess a good part of that is luck. Uh -huh. uh, we set out from Brooklyn three days ago. Our orders were for us to head for Hampton Roads at full steam. Last night, we anchored in the darkness off the Roanoke, and one of our officers my second in command, Lieutenant Sam Green, went aboard the Roanoke for orders. No one knew him, and he received his orders from the Admiral in secret. Now, these orders were clear and simple. We were to take up a position near the Minnesota and defend her from attack by the Merrimack. Well, we anchored in close under the Minnesota's lee side so that we were hidden from sight. Now that the Merrimack is coming in range, we're sailing out to carry out our orders to defend the Minnesota. And we're going to do just that. How many men? <laughs> What's that? Merrimack has opened fire. Here, miss. Merrimack right, sir. Take over the firing turret, Green. I'm going forward to the pilot house. The Merrimack has opened fire. The first salvo missed us by some 20 yards, but the concussion of the shell is tossing the monitor around like a cork. Here in the turret, the gun crew is stripped to the waist. There isn't enough room for a man to stretch out his arms. It's hot in here, and it's going to get right hotter. The crew is getting ready to fire. I can see the Merrimack now through a tiny slit in the metal turret. It is about 1,000 yards away. The snouts of her cannon are smoking from that first broadside, and the second one should be coming in. The, the monitor has opened fire. We have opened fire. Fast is deafening. The heat. I can't think of it. We are being hit. No doubt you can hear that. But the shells of the Merrimack are bouncing hard. No more this is CBS in Washington. 
The noise of the firing aboard the monitor makes it impossible to hear Jackson Beck, but John Daly aboard the northern flagship Roanoke has an excellent view of the action in Hampton Roads, so we switch now to him. Come in, John Daly, aboard the flagship Roanoke. The battle between the monitor and the Merrimack has begun. The Merrimack towering high above the water, and the tiny monitor, David and Goliath, the two ironclads, are not more than a few hundred yards apart now, flinging tons of iron at each other's side. It's a fantastic sight to those of us who covered other naval engagements. Both fitted spars, no ripped wooden hulls. The Merrimack guns are firing at will, and they keep up a steady hammering barrage. The monitor fires one gun at a time at intervals. The very first blow that the Federal Monitor struck sent the Merrimack reeling backwards, but just for a moment. She came right back in again, and now she's letting go with every piece that she has, and incredibly, that shot is just glancing off the rounded turret of the Monitor without doing any perceptible damage, not a bit of it as far as we can see from here. The gallant little ship takes the full force of the shot without a tremor, without a sign of distress, and then she returns Every salvo with a blast of her own. A turret spins around as soon as one of her cannon is fired, and the second cannon is all loaded and ready to go. Right now, this fight has gotten so hot, the smoke is so thick, it's kind of hard to make out exactly what is going on, except that the two of them, the, the Monitor and the Merrimack, are actually standing toe to toe and slugging it out just like two bare-handed prisoners in the middle of a ring. Big blast of sound. They're just firing their guns as fast as they can load them. The Merrimack has just pulled out from the cloud of smoke, and she's leaving the monitor. The Confederate ironclad is evidently going to try something. Then she's, she's going to try to attack the Minnesota, one of the hit federal ships. And here comes the monitor. The federal ironclad is sweeping in between the two of them, intercepting. She's forcing her ironclad in between the Confederate Merrimack and that wooden Minnesota. She's challenging the Merrimack. She's challenging her to come back and get combat once again. The Merrimack has lost a turn. She's lost a turn and is turning on the monitor, making full steam. The Confederate Merrimack looks like she's going to try to ram the Northern champion if she can. The two of them are almost deck to deck. But the monitor is sweeping aside. She's turning out of the path of the Merrimack. She's avoiding that ram, and as she turns, she keeps blasting away at the Southern Ironclad. That monitor is still in that fight. She's still in between the Merrimack and that federal wooden ship to Minnesota. Once more, though, that Confederate ironclad has been turned away from her objective. She's been turned away from the wooden sides of the Minnesota. And this time, the little old monitor seems determined to fight it out to the very finish. It's a terrific struggle, a battle of iron and steel. They're just blazing away. And the Merrimack is swinging around. Oh, she's slow and she's clumsy, but there's no question about it. She's turning. She seems to be heading back towards Norfolk. And there goes the monitor after her, just like a puppy chasing after a BLRA, barking frantically. Yes, the engagement is all but over. The battle is over, and the northern fleet here in Hampton Roads is saved. The blockade of the south remains intact. There goes the Roanoke stand, and just listen to that band. It's playing the grand view of Battle of the Republic, written only a month ago. And to be fair, neither the Merrimack nor the Federal Monitor was defeated. And neither one of them can really claim a clear victory. This great naval battle, which has just been fought so gallantly by the North and the South, is a draw. However, it's an unhappy day for the South, for as long as the Monitor stands here in Hampton Roads, Southern hopes of breaking the Federal blockade with the Merrimack are doomed. And the Monitor is going to stay here. This day, the door... Right, is 9, 1862. The monitor stops the Merrimack, and the Union fleet is saved. You have been listening to The Monitor and the Merrimack, another broadcast in the series, You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Sheon. The Monitor and the Merrimack was written by Irv Tunick and Mr. Sheon. The cast included Anthony Kemble Cooper, Cliff Carpenter, Joseph Boland, Bill Quinn, Patsy Campbell, Court Benson, Jim Davidson, Bert Cowlin, and others. Next week... July 21st, 1881, the surrender of Sitting Bull. You are there.
CBS Christmas Weekend draws to its end tonight with two fine comedy shows. One of them drawing laughs from a schoolroom and the other from a general store. At 9.30 Eastern Standard Time, our Miss Brooks finds Eve Arden starring as America's most unusual, at least unusually madcap, schoolmistress. And at 10, it's no secret, Lum and Abner, those famous storekeepers, relax with you in the laughter that comes from their famous store, the Jotham Down store, located out in Pine Ridge, Arkansas. Climax your Christmas holiday with comedy in Our Miss Brooks and Lum and Abner tonight over most of these same CBS network stations. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. Less than 3% of the population were in towns of more than 10,000. Most immigrants lived on the land, but cities were beginning to flourish. Revolutionary Philadelphia, with its 40,000 inhabitants, was the first colonial city in size. New York was second with 25,000. Boston, with 16,000, third. Charleston, the largest city of the South, numbered 12,000. America was growing. And in spite of all adversity, America was destined to continue its growth. Why? Possibly because America was a dream for freedom-loving people then as it is today. This is ChestertonRadio.com. And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. She is an incredibly imposing figure, Queen Liliolani, last of a pure line of Polynesian royalty, save for the handsome son she faces, nearly eye level to eye level, although Danny Makihini is well over six feet. Always a woman of Amazonian proportions, middle age has blown her to gargantuan size and girth. And her anger and emotion is as monumental as the rest of her. Marry a howly? I'd as soon see you dead. Oh, come on, Mother. It's the 20th century, and Hawaii is a state, not a monarchy. The Polynesian and the American Indian are two of a kind. Two civilizations pirated. Their lands raped and stolen, their countries plundered, and their people sold into virtual slavery. You should be running for the Senate. I should be making powder and cleaning my gun. For of all the Haolis on this island, the most repressive, imperialist, surrogate king is Carter Bradley. And my son will marry his daughter only over my dead body. Mother, I've never seen you like this. You're always so reasonable. You are betrothed to Taormina. We haven't really seen each other for over seven years. She's more like a little sister to me. I know more than you do, my son. For all your doctor's knowledge, I beg you not to tempt fate. The gods have been angry enough for years, and my inner senses tell me what you plan will bring a great Auai down upon us. I see a raging disaster already set in being that no human being can stop. Our mystery drama, Wave of Terror, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Paul Hecht and Carmen Matthews. When she mentioned disaster... Queen Liliolani could not have sensed the extent of the Holocaust, which was to change so many lives. For at the moment she spoke, out of some alluvial fault in the great Alaskan ridge, the earth boiled from its guts like a volcano, throwing up great mountains of lava, displacing trillions of tons of water that formed a great tidal wave traveling unnoticed beneath the surface, rushing southward at a speed of up to 500 miles an hour towards the first landmass in its way, 
the islands of Hawaii. Two days earlier, Danny Makahini and Liz Bradley had gotten off the plane from the States at Hilo Airport. Danny, tall, nut brown. Liz, a blue-eyed, sun-bronzed, typical California girl. God and goddess with a special shine. The shine of love. But despite the message of their eyes and their faith and assurance, their homeland has brought them a cloud of uncertainty. I'll manage somehow, Danny. Dad's tough, but I can usually break him down. Yeah, so is Mother. I wish I felt as sure of her. She has a genius for getting her own way. <laughs> it's a habit of royalty, and we're both children of royalty. Only yours is for real. So is yours. Mine is just tradition, but yours is force majeure. Mother is a queen by birth. Your father wears his crown by owning half of Hawaii. What makes me unhappy is that I can't bring you the kind of world you're used to, which is only one of the strikes against me as far as your father is concerned. Now, don't start that bit again. So you're a Kanaka. I'm a Haole. So what in this day and age? It's nothing stateside. Here in Hawaii... What's the difference? We're the ones getting married. Supposing they don't give us their blessing. It's up to you and me, isn't it? Oh, honey, of course, except... Uh, maybe I'm still part heathen after all. Without my mother and your father's blessing, I have a... <laughs> now, for all my liberal arts education and medical school, I still can't explain it with anything but a Hawaiian-Polynesian word. I have a... a mea mea. That's just plain superstition. No, it's, it's an uneasy feeling. But if it has an explanation, it goes away. Big difference. <laughs> Welcome home. Darling, we're borrowing trouble. Let's just go home and face up to our parents, and maybe there won't be anything. I only want to make it as easy for them as it is for us. I love you. And I love you. It's as simple as that. So just kiss me a short goodbye, you big worry word. <laughs> when did I have to be asked? Mm. What is it? First rift in the lute. Your ex-rival, Dr. Peter Hughes, is heading straight for us. How'd he get through customs? The Bradley name. The key that opens all doors. Funny Dad isn't with him. He's probably too busy reigning. What? Isn't that what a king does all day? Aloha, Elizabeth. Danny. Aloha, Pete. What's the matter with Dad? Uh, not a thing. Then why isn't he here to meet me? Uh, he got tied up in some business. <laughs> Am I such a bad substitute? Of course not. I had a feeling I was something of a letdown. By the way, Danny, Queen Liliolani and that exquisite intended of yours, Taormina, are waiting for you outside. Oh, I'd uh, better make tracks. Mother doesn't like to be kept waiting. And I'd better get Elizabeth into the helicopter. Mr. Bradley is a little impatient himself. Uh, will I be hearing from you tomorrow, Liz? I hope tonight. I didn't particularly know you knew Danny Makahini. Only since I went to college on the mainland. You seem to have made up for lost time. What does that mean? I'm not blind. I saw that. <laughs> I was going to say farewell kiss, but I don't think that quite characterizes it. However... Pete, I don't want to talk about Danny right now. I want to talk about what you're avoiding. What is it about Dan? You're quite right. It's a subject I wish I could avoid. He's sick. What's the matter? Is it his heart? No, it isn't anything necessarily fatal for a long time, but... But what? Well, I would give anything not to be a doctor. Or have been one these past few months. Because I have known that that magnificent body was letting him down. It's only a shell now. What do you mean? Don't let him know I told you, but it can't be hidden much longer. Your father has Parkinson's disease. Oh, my God. Does that mean he's going to die? With care. What medication we know has some results. Under normal conditions, no. But there are plenty of symptoms, none of which your father is going to be able to bear. What symptoms? In your father's case, mostly muscular. Trembling of the hands, dropping things unconsciously. A rigidity which will inevitably cut down on his normally superactive lifestyle... A marked decrease in his muscular control. Oh, no. 
Oh, that can't happen to Dad. What can we do to help? Some drugs. A fortunate remission in the disease sometimes. Most of all, trying to avoid emotional excitement and fatigue. Welcome home. I had to tell you. Especially since... Why stop now? I love you, Elizabeth. I'm too old for you, but just the same. I know you're in love with Danny Makahini. That you want to tell your father so. I'm trying very hard to be as objective as a doctor ought to be. I don't know what any of our futures are destined to be, but I do know that your father's life, not necessarily death, but his life, is probably in your hands at this moment and from here on in. What's the matter? You don't like me anymore? I love you, Tal. As a little sister. I always have, and I always will. But you know meaning of blue out tonight. Yes, Taormina, and I am ashamed. Please. I know you you want to marry a holy girl. I I can't help myself, little sister. I love her. The queen will never allow you. I need Carter Bradley's consent more than I do my own mother's. And if you do not get it? And to hell with the past. We will buy our own future. And nothing and no one can stop us. Elizabeth! Daddy! (laughs) You can't know how good it is to see you. By damn, you're more beautiful than ever. And you look just like your mother. (gasps) Dad, what are you doing? I'm stealing a page from Pete's book, but I think I deserve it because you look so like Beth did when I married her. I'm going to carry you over the threshold back home again. Dad, you shouldn't. Why not? Well, I'm not such a little girl anymore. Oh, nonsense. Light as a feather, which is just what you are. The proudest feather I wear in my cap. Damn, I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Did I spill? No, Dad. I, uh, I came a cropper off a new story and I've been breaking in. My arm's a bit stiff. You all right? Oh, now you're home. <laughs> oh, I have a few bruises here and there, but I can shake them off the moment I see you and Pete happily married. Now you're graduated. Let's make it soon. Oh, now give the girl a chance to catch her breath, C.B. Well, if I were you, I wouldn't grab her while you can. Only when Liz wants me. Now don't tell me I said something out of line. Typical of me trying to rush things. I'm... This damn hand is bothering me tonight. We can talk it all out tomorrow. Oh, I can't tell you how good it is to have you home in Wailua again, sweetheart. I've been waiting to get back myself. It's a cold old house without your mother. You're my one hope for Wailua's future and her boys. A lot of responsibility to put on a daughter's shoulders. But since I have no son left, I know you won't fail me. So this is where you've been hiding out, young lovers. <laughs> Danny, you should not have stolen Taormina away from the feast. I was the one to need to speak to Danny alone. Uh, thanks, Tal, but I can speak for myself. There are too many words in the world. Let us just thank the gods for what little we have. We are a dying race, my son, but still a proud one. You and Tal can keep us alive. And I thank all of and Tane and Taora, that the moment is almost here. Almost here? You are a doctor now. Now, the wedding ceremony need wait no longer. I have set it for the full moon, the night after tomorrow. Uh, mother, I... Mother, Taormina and I will not be wed. Tao, is this your wish? I... No, but I... Don't stammer, girl. Answer me. I will answer you, Mother. I love Tao as a little sister. But I will marry Elizabeth Bradley. The daughter of Carter Bradley, the Howley? Yes, Mother. Never. I'm sorry, I must. We are in love. He won't let you. How can he stop us? Then I will. 
if I have to call on all the ancient gods. Oh, please, Mother. I no longer believe in magic, alui, or any superstitious curse that could harm me or Liz. No curse or any magic to harm the girl. I have no power for that or second sight. But I tell you this. If you marry this holy girl, if you tie your life to Carter Bradley's daughter, you end my life. My death will be on your head and hers. I can smell it in the wind. If you insist, in the words of the missionary, you will reap the whirlwind. Queen Liliolani could have had no specific foreknowledge of the Holocaust in store. Carter Bradley, absolute monarch, whose magnificent physique is betraying him and whose weakness will lead him back to old sins. None of our characters can yet know the cataclysm of nature which is to affect their lives. I shall return shortly with Act Two. The great shelf of sub-ocean land that lies off the Aleutian chain of islands is still intact. It is some 48 hours still before the titanic undersea explosion will rend it asunder and create a wave that will rise towering to 90 feet, 20 to 30 feet above the great mansion at Wailua, which spreads along the coral cliffs looking northward to the vast Pacific and the coming terror. On the lanai, facing away from the ocean, Carter is just finishing breakfast as Liz joins him. Well, now it seems more like home again. Morning, Elizabeth, dear. Morning, Dad. You know, I've been sitting here snorting as impatient as the old war horse I am. But I couldn't wait. I've finished breakfast. Mm -hmm. I'll ring for yours. No, no, Dad, please. Well, what's the matter, Princess? You don't feel well? <laughs> I wish you wouldn't call me that. What? Princess. Well, it's my old name for you, and I always called you. Uh, you, you don't feel well. I'm tired, Dad. Long trip, change in time. Well, you should have slept longer. How about some coffee? No, no thanks. Juice? Nothing for the moment. We, we have things to talk about. Well, of course we have, but I sort of thought we'd keep that for lunch, huh? I mean, Pete will be here, and don't you think he ought to be part of it? No, Dad, I don't. Oh, I don't think that's so fair, Princess. All right, if you prefer it, Lisbeth. So why I can't use the old name? It doesn't I... fit me, Dad. It's not what I am. <laughs> On these islands, and particularly this one, it's what you are, at the very least. If we were to ride to Mauna Kea, way up to the top, you could turn and look north, east, west, and south, and every bit of land you saw would be yours. Or will be someday. Are you so sure, Dad? I own it. It's mine. Along with a few other things. When I'm gone, whose else would it be except yours and uh, Pete's? I don't really know. I'm not sure it's that important to me. What would happen if I didn't marry Pete? Didn't? What are you talking about? Would the Bradley Ranch still be mine? And all that goes with it if I didn't? I... Who, who, who else would you marry? I didn't expect you up so early, my son. After the long trip... And the lua. And it was a perfect morning for surfing. When the sun rose, I saw those easy rolling four-footers, and I grabbed my board and took off. <laughs> Happy to be home again, in your own land. Yes, in a sense. Cutting across those waves out there gave me back not only my sense of balance, but you know, just my own plain good sense. I'm happy to hear that. Then today, we don't quarrel. <laughs> That's up to you. My doubts are all gone. I would hope that you tell me you are talking about Taormina. Yes, in part. Yes, you will marry her. Mother, listen to me. I know your pride in race, in bloodline, your, your struggle to make sure that it won't die. 
But when I left Hawaii to go to UCLA, I was 18. I was 10, 11 years old. We made the promises, we took the vows, but Tao was too young to know what was involved. I believed then, as you do still, that our heritage and our race must be preserved, but I don't any longer. You are a Polynesian prince. No, I am a citizen of the world, Mother. A doctor. Race, creed, color, nationalism. Nothing matters to me but that the human body is one and the same thing. The body made strong or weak by exercise and usage. The brain the same, by education or lack of it. So you will not marry Tower Mima? No. You think Carter Bradley will share your views, accept you as his son-in-law? I don't know. I'll find that out today. But if he doesn't? We are both of age, Mother. He can't stop us. I wouldn't be too sure of that. And what about me? I want you to meet Liz, Mother. I think you'll change your mind. I will meet her. But I shall not change my mind. And what will you do then? Meet her first before we come to that decision. When? Look, I'll take the jeep into town and call her. Then I'll drive to Waialua, get her, and bring her back. You're wasting your time. I hope not. Because I love you. And I want you to love her, too. I'll be back by mid-afternoon. Great Tommy, help me. Help me make my son see that our race, shamed and despoiled and dying out, must have new life bred into it. Only Makahini and Taormina can do it. She is a princess in her own right. Help me, Tommy, help me. Or the smell of doom that comes to me on the wind from the north will come to pass. Table King here and rub him down good. I rode him hard this morning. Ah, hey, Pete. Morning, CB. I'm hungry as a bull. Is lunch ready? <laughs> yes. There's a nice breeze off the water, so Chung Lee set the two of us up on the front lanai. Two of us? Ah, is Elizabeth still sick? Well, come, let's go through the house. I have to wash up anyway. Where is she? Upstairs? No, she, uh, she left quite a bit before I got here. What do you mean, sick? Oh, she was feeling a little off her feet at breakfast. Left to go where? Oh, Danny Makahini came by and picked her up. Liz said she'd be back in the late afternoon. Danny Makahini? Queen Liliolani, son? Yes. Oh, I thought he was at medical school on the mainland. He was. He's graduated. He came back on the same plane with Liz yesterday. Didn't even know she knew him. But I, uh, I don't like this about Elizabeth. Is it serious? In its own way, I was going to let her tell you herself. But maybe as your doctor, it's better if I do it instead. Now, come on, man. Come on, come on. Get it out. What is it? Well, let's sit down for a minute. I want to remind you of your condition and that flying off the handle and losing your temper is the worst thing you can do. Oh, you pill peddlers, you're all prophets of doom. Well, if you take the pills I provide, you might put yours off a good deal all longer. Right, now, sit down. All right, but don't try to change the subject. I want to know why Elizabeth went chasing off with Makahini. Did they go surfing? Not exactly. Damn my eyebrows, you're a calm enough lover, Pete. Your fiancé goes herring off with another man her first day back home, even if he is just a Kanaka beach boy, and you just let her go. First, she left before I got here. Second, he is not a Kanaka beach boy. He's a colleague of mine, a doctor of medicine. And lastly, Elizabeth is not my fiancé anymore. What? How do you know? Where did you find that out? Yesterday, when I brought her home. You you turned my daughter down? No. I should have, really, in the first place. I'm far too old for her. Oh, rubbish. Well, I'm not marrying her, C.B. And you're not fooling me one bit, Pete. You're still as much in love with Elizabeth as you've always been. I smell a rat, and I'll bet it's Makahini. Is that it? Is that it? Where did they go? To see the queen. I imagine to ask her blessing. To get married? My daughter and a beach boy? Now, stop talking about Danny like that. And don't get all worked up. It's bad for you. Oh, I won't get worked up. First of all, because it's just not going to happen. 
There'll be no marriage between them, because if she doesn't stop it, I will. By God, if he has much as dares. It's it's all right, C.B. Now now just take it easy. It's it's only a temporary attack, C.B. But this time you are going to take one of my pills. I'm sorry, my dear. You're a lovely girl. And I can hardly blame Danny. But marriage between you is quite impossible. Mother, I... I haven't finished. There are reasons beyond reasons why it can never be. Your blood is not our blood. Danny is already betrothed to Princess Tower Mina. The gods are already angered and cannot be angered anymore. For God's sakes, Mother, it's the 20th century. And you are as intelligent and well-read and educated as any woman I know. Stop acting like some old ignorant witch. I am acting as I must. Because within me are ancient chords which sing of death and certain doom for two people. Queen Liliolani, I respect your point of view. Do you respect your father's? Yes. But I will give you the same answer as I would give him. I love Danny. I'm over 20. Danny is 25. There is no way either of you can stop us. I'd rather it wouldn't be like that. But Danny and I have agreed. She's quite right, Mother. We'd give anything to have both you and Mr. Bradley with us, but if you're not... I cannot give my consent. I can only warn you, if you persist, it will end in death and disaster. I have nothing more to say. I am going to pray for all of us. Well, Liz, we're almost all the way home and we still haven't decided just how we're going to go about it. I know, Danny. It's just... I don't think we can rush it. Not right now, because of Dad. If you want to back out, I'm not holding you to anything. Oh, darling. Darling, don't do that. Honey, I hate to get long-winded or go chucking my medical knowledge around, but Parkinson's, I mean, it can and almost always is a long, long process. He's going to need me. I mean, really need me for the first time in his life. It's a life that could last another 20 years. Are you asking me to wait that long? No. No. Because there are other... Oh, Danny, I'm so tired, and I just can't think, and we're home. Give me till tomorrow, at least. Sure, sure, of course, darling. It's only, well, I'm under some pressures of my own, and if I can't have you, well, I won't break my mother's heart or Tao's, and tomorrow night is their night. I'll talk to Dad tonight. If I can't convince him... We'll be on our own. Why not let me do it? I'm the one <laughs> seeking your hand, if not your fortune. I mean, it's up to me. All right, if you... What is it? Pete. He looks as if... Hello, Danny. Elizabeth. Hi. Where's Dad? Inside. But Danny, Liz, if either of you want to talk to him about... about you, as a doctor, I'd say now isn't the time. What happened? I made a judgment... I thought maybe I'd better tell him about you, too. Did Liz tell you about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did anything serious happen? No, Danny. M.D. to M.D., you know how it can go. Yeah. He got a bit emotional and suffered some speech impairment. Uh He's all right now, but I wouldn't advise any further. Yeah, yeah, quite right. I'd better duck out fast before he sees me. I'll be in touch tomorrow morning, Liz. Keep your chin up, eh? Mm -hmm. No real worries about your dad. Right, doctor? Right. Just us. This, too, shall pass. (laughs) I love you. Till tomorrow. Me too. And forever. Back to Aloha. You sure Dad's all right? If we can keep off a certain subject, sure. I don't want... I can't do any more talking about... Oh, oh pee on me quick. What is it? Just something that nobody but me knows about. Yes. I wonder if anyone else will. Ever.
What new factor could enter a hoped-for marriage which already appears to have everything against it? And what is the meaning of Liz's cryptic statement expressing a knowledge that only she has and no one else may ever know? Is it the same knowledge that Queen Liliuokalani talks of as buried in the past? And if she too knows that ancient gods are to extract penance for buried sins, who are the two that are doomed? Or are more to die in the dreadful natural phenomenon that is at last about to be unleashed 3,000 miles away? I'll return shortly with Act Three. At exactly 8.42 the following morning on the island of Hawaii, two final ultimatums were issued by two irate parents. One of them by Queen Liliolani to her son. The gods have been angry enough for years. My inner voices tell me what you plan will bring a great awe upon us. I see a raging disaster will be set in being that no human being can stop. And Carter Bradley to his daughter the next morning, completely recovered through rest and medication for the moment. Let's get one thing straight, princess, and don't interrupt me. I use the old name deliberately. On this island, you, we, are the royalty. And I'm warning you one thing right now. Go near that Makahini Kanaka again, or let him come near you and I'll shut him down like a dog. I mean that, princess, as God is my witness. No one or nothing can stop me from doing as I want on this island. Whether it was sheer coincidence or whether gods, ancient or contemporary, took offense, this was the moment the titanic explosion occurred, hurling trillions upon trillions of tons of water at breakneck speed above the ocean bed. Within six hours, it would hit the north shore of the island of Hawaii head on. Whether guided by sheer accident or supernatural design, the devastation it would leave in its wake would be, to say the least, supernatural. Dad, you can't be serious. Oh, but I am. You couldn't do this to I'm me. I'm doing it for you. But I love Danny. Childish romance. If you don't marry Pete, I'll leave everything to him. I don't need anything. Danny can support me. I can work. You'll never marry him. Why are you so set against him? It should be obvious enough. Nobody could be that prejudiced, that bigoted. And to make sure if he comes near here or you again, I will shoot him on sight. <laughs> Dr. Hughes? Pete, it's Dad. He's had some sort of attack or something, I guess. All right, Liz, just slow down. Now tell me what happened. And don't worry, there's no danger. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be incoherent, but it was just awful to see him and listen to him just spluttering and talking all sorts of nonsense. I gave him some medication. Did he take it? Yes. He's gone upstairs to take it. What is it, Pete? It's part of his illness. The speech impairment is one of the symptoms. Excitement aggravates them. I'll be right out. And let's see if we can figure what to do. I've given him a sedative that'll keep him quiet for a couple of hours. Problem one out of the way, temporarily. Now for problem two. You. There isn't any problem about me. I've got to tell Danny we're through. I can't marry Danny. And what about the child? John, you know. Yes. But how? When I'm not even sure myself. When I gave you the sedative yesterday, I took some blood. There's no doubt about it, Liz. You're pregnant. Oh, Lord. Now what am I going to do? You're going to get in the car with me and drive to Tupapahu. If anything can change Queen Liliolani's mind, it's the child. <laughs> So you are already carrying Danny's child, and you think that will alter things? I'm the one who hoped it would. 
I won't give up Danny's baby. That's one part of it no one can take from me. You have courage, little Laoli. More courage than I had. I wouldn't say that. You know what a difference there is. Danny would want his child. Call him. Get him here and ask him. I can't. Why not? He left an hour ago for Waialua. I'm surprised you didn't pass him. He must have taken the jeep over the back road. That's too rough for a car. For Waialua? Pete, we've got to stop him somehow. Catch up with him. It's too late for that. But if he's gone to Waialua and if father sees him, he'll kill him. What is all this? My father, Queen Liliolani. He's promised to shoot Danny on sight. Oh, please, please, can't you help us somehow? Why should I? It could be your son's life. And now, I am made responsible again for another life, another son. (laughs) How history repeats itself. But it won't again. It's past time for retribution, and the gods are coming to claim it. What do you mean? The Meha Meha is upon us. I can feel the ripples of it in my soul, the lift of it like a wave. I will call Brad. Brad? Your father. Once, he meant everything to me that Danny means to you. At the moment the queen lifted the phone, a tanker plowing across the North Pacific lifted ever so slightly on a five-inch surface swell. That was the only sign of the gargantuan tsunami, the dreadful tidal wave which swept by at the speed of sound, hurtling toward the north shore of Hawaii. There, its monstrous energy would pile up the waters to a height of over 80 feet, driving inland till its force was spent to be sucked back with such diabolic speed that it would carry away everything in its path. Yes? Brad. It's Lil. Lil? For Pete's sake. How many years? Twelve, thirteen. You sound just the same. Uh, I don't look it. How are you, Bran? Oh, I don't know, little. I'm not the man I once was. <laughs> You'll never change. Certainly not for me. I, uh... I want to ask you one favor. A little, I... If it's about our children, Brad, I... have I ever asked one from you before? Oh, Lord knows you haven't. It's a matter of life or death. Will you meet me at the grotto? If you ask me... How can I refuse? If we both leave this minute, we should arrive in about an hour and a half. All right, there. It... It'll be good to see you again. If you shut your eyes to what I have become, at least it's dark. I'll see you at the grotto. After your mother died, Elizabeth, we were lovers. Your father and I. I carried a child of his in my womb. But we were ridden with pride of race, each for his own, and it drove us apart. We could never be married. And the child? Well, I thought it was not meant for me to bear a child of mixed race. I said goodbye to your father, and there, in that grotto, in our temple of love, I aborted and destroyed our child. I offended the gods. Listen to me, little Aoli princess. You will have your father's blessing as you have mine. Remember that. Love my boy. Take care of him. Bear his child. Then Ta Aurora will be with us again. Say goodbye to Danny for me. I cannot urge any longer, Brad. I thought if I at last was willing to accept commingled blood in a child of our families... I... I can't help myself, Lou. I am as I am. I cannot accept any child of my daughter's with mixed blood. And so you want to kill my boy? Not if he stays away from Elizabeth. And the child? 
Well, that can be taken care of. He will stop the children. Make history repeat a terrible mistake. Us all over again. Lil, I cannot change. You are changed already. Look at your hands. Shaking now like leaves in the wind. Ah, that's a different matter. I have Parkinson's disease. I told you you'd find a different man. Not the difference I would have wanted. Wait a minute. Shh, quiet. Come out, Lil, quick. What, what is it, Brad? Find. My God, look at it. It's a half a mile below normal. The fish left gasping on the rocks. A tidal bore is on the way, and a big one. I know. Ta Aurora has been telling me all morning. I could smell the anger of the gods. It's why I called you here. To die? Dead. We cannot stay in the children's way. Well, there's still king. And the horse we both might... Yes. Gross old woman. Even at your best, you couldn't hoist me on his back. Even with you alone on his back, it's too late. But I have no right. No, try, Brad. Try, if you can. Home, King. Home. <laughs> Run out the wind, boy. You're staying. <laughs> We've both been legends in our time, Lou. We wouldn't want to outlive our glory. I shouldn't have done this to you. No. I'm burned out, Lil. Thanks for making me realize that I hadn't much further to go. I only wish I'd been able to tell Princess, I mean, Elizabeth, but at the last she had my blessing and my love. She knows she has both. Well, my love, yes, but the other, how can she ever know? I told her so before I left her. How could you? Because I knew what I was going to do. And I know you, Brad. Oh, I know you. If ever any woman knew a man. Oh, Lil, what a fool I was. We both were. <laughs> but how good to have you back at last. Tsunami, it's coming at last. Are you afraid, Lil? No. I'm going home. Back to where my roots are. In the sea. To the south. Taro. The sea god will guide me safe. And you. I go with you as I should have all those years ago. But you. You're shaking. That's what the wave will free me from. The shame of being less than a man. It's all right, you. It's as it should be. We couldn't have each other in life. We'll stand together forever in death. The inexorable incoming march of the water did little damage compared to the outgoing surge which sucked everything into and away with it, like some colossal, unimaginable vacuum cleaner. It left the beach and the inlet stripped clean and swept Wailua away like so many matchsticks. As far as the eye could see across that northern shore of Hawaii where the wave struck, and as far as the wave penetrated, not a living thing was left. I'll be back shortly. Danny and Liz were married very quietly. There was no formal funeral either for Queen Liliolani or Carter Bradley. Only a memorial service. Two dynasties were finished, ended, and melded in the two young people who never took their loving eyes from each other during the simple wedding service. The close was an exchange between bride and groom in Hawaiian. Aloha. Aloha means hello. Aloha means goodbye. But most of all, it means I love you. For this, after all the terror and holocaust, turns out to be just that. A love story. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Carmen Matthews, Suzanne Grossman, Gordon Gould, Ian Martin. 
The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>